If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 51 Chapter 51 A few more days passed by as Fona became increasingly busy with meetings and paperwork. Something he didn't plan to happen. However, with his new laws and plans to change the hidden mist, he would have a lot of work ahead of him. Although Fona had been busy with his duties as the Mizu Cage, he had still found time to spend with Kimimaro and Haku, making sure to fit some training in for the pair. They had also told Fona all about the training exercise that their new sensei had put them through. Of course, Fona already knew all about it as he had sent a clone to watch the entire thing. A few days ago, Haku, Kimimaro, and Koihoki had left the academy so that they could meet with their new sensei as instructed. Both Haku and Kimimaro had only just met Koihoki today, knowing nothing else about her other than she was now on their team. Their new sensei had instructed them to meet at one of the training fields so that he could meet them and see what they had. I wonder what our new sensei is like. Koihoki said. She was certainly not shy and said what was on her mind. Haku also seemed filled with excitement. I wonder what kind of test he will have in store for us. Haku said. Kimimaro stayed quiet as he was a little more reserved, although he still had a smile on his face. Not long passed, and the three of them soon found themselves at the training field. It was a simple place with a large open grassy plain, a few training posts scattered around, and as always in Kirigakur, covered in a faint mist. I think we're early, Koihoki said as she took a good look around, seeing no sign of their sensei. Haku was also carefree as he too took a good look around. Well, I'm sure they won't be long. He said. Kimimaro however, had a bad feeling as he scouted the area. Be on guard. He said as he suddenly took a fighting stance. Koihoki had a questing look on her face as he did, but Haku suddenly also took a fighting stance as he drew a handful of Senbon needles. I feel it too. He said taking a stance. Suddenly three shadows appeared out of the mist, donned in all black clothing with their face covered by a bandana. Kimimaro, Haku and Koihoki all noticed the shadows and got ready as they too took a fighting stance. What's going on? Are they here for us? Koihoki asked. I don't know, but be prepared to fight, Haku said. The three shinobi suddenly charged in towards the three genin as they each picked their opponents. Kimimaro charged dead ahead and jumped into the air spinning in a circle as he fired two bone blades at the two other shinobi before he clashed with his chosen target. Haku took full advantage of the opportunity Kimimaro had given him and without hesitation jumped into battle. The shinobi on Haku's side was able to avoid the bone blade Kimimaro had fired at him. However, he had been forced to alter his path and Haku took full advantage of this. Throwing a volley of Senbon needles, each with pinpoint accuracy heading towards a Vita pressure point. The enemy suddenly pulled out a sword and blocked the needles before looking for Haku. Where the hell did he go? He said, before looking up. Haku had jumped high into the air, using the cover of the Senbon needles in an attempt to land a surprise attack. Now, ice style. Haku started as he formed the hand signs. The enemy shinobi looked on from the ground as he could see what Haku was doing. Not bad kid. He thought before he started to form his own hand signs. Kimimaro was currently looked in a battle with his opponent. Dancing around with such grace as bones sprouted from his body at all angles. The enemy shinobi was using his sword with amazing skill as he continued to deflect each of Kimimaro's attacks, maintaining his footing and preventing Kimimaro from pushing him back on the defensive. This guy is highly skilled. Kimimaro thought as he flipped over his head with his back to the enemy. Suddenly a huge amount of razor-sharp bone spikes shot out from Kimimaro's back crushing the shinobi before Kimimaro landed back onto his feet gracefully. A substitution, Kimimaro said before he turned around and blocked a downward slash from the enemy's sword. Not bad kid. But let's see how you handle this. The enemy then said as he kicked Kimimaro back so he had room to form some hand signs. Koyoki had watched how Haku and Kimimaro had leapt into action with hesitation. She had to say, she was impressed but at the same time felt this was the perfect time to show them what she had to offer to the team. Her opponent had appeared behind her and attempted to grab her in a chokehold. However, Koyoki quickly dropped to the ground and kicked her foot back, hitting the enemy's knee. I don't think so. Fire style, fireball jutsu. She shouted as she rolled and formed the hand signs, before launching the intense fire style jutsu at the shinobi. He was certainly surprised as he jumped back quickly, using his sword to slash and deflect the fire before he flipped backwards and landed like a cat. I'm not done just yet. Koyoki said, 
as she flipped up to her feet and took a handful of shuriken and threw them towards the enemy. She wasn't finished there though, as she started to form more hand signs. Wind style. Air bullets. She shouted as she fired a handful of wind style bullets. She then quickly threw a load more shuriken, and the enemy shinobi watched as he jumped out of the way of the first round of shuriken. Too easy kid, he said as he flipped in the air. To his surprise, the wind bullets she had fired hit the ground before the first round of shuriken, bursting and propelling the shuriken into the air where they collided with the second round of shuriken. The second round of shuriken then deflected off the first and changed their direction, traveling even faster than before, right towards the enemy shinobi. What? How did she? He thought as he was forced to deflect the projectiles with his swords before landing on the ground. How did she do that with such precision? He thought before he turned around to see Koyoki above him with a kunao in each hand. Take this. She shouted as she swiped down at the shinobi's face. Meanwhile, Haku was free falling in the air as he formed hand signs at an impressive rate. Ice style. He started. Not bad kid, but not fast enough. Water style. Water bullets. The enemy shouted as he fired a rapid fire shot of water bullets from his mouth. Haku was forced to stop his jutsu and quickly react to the water bullets that were heading right towards him, intent on ripping him in half. Haku was a quick thinker and able to stay calm in difficult situations. Instead of abandoning his jutsu, he simply changed a few hand signs and altered it to use a wind style that allowed him to move midair and avoid the water bullets. That kid just changed his jutsu last minute and avoided my attack. The enemy thought as he watched what just happened. Time to finish this, please forgive me. Haku's voice suddenly said from behind the enemy shinobi as he appeared from nowhere, forming hand signs with just one hand. How did he? Haku gripped the enemy's wrist with impressive force and suddenly it froze. What in the hell? The shinobi shouted as he tried to pull free from Haku's grip. It's no use, Haku said. Suddenly two senbon needles hit the shinobi in his neck, each striking a perfect point that took all sense of movement away from him. This way you won't feel any pain as you die. Haku said as the ice suddenly started to spread up his arm, freezing everything that Haku touched. Kimimaro flipped back from the kick his opponent had given him. Landing on the ground he slid back and looked up as his opponent was forming his hand signs, and from the look of them, it was going to be a large jutsu. I need to stop him, Kimimaro said as he allowed the bones in his fingertips to push out a little. Take this. He shouted as he fired a volley of bone bullets. He didn't stop there as he continued to jump and dance launching barrage after barrage of bone bullets, in an attempt to stop the enemy's hand signs. However, Kaimimaro's efforts had been in vain as his opponent jumped out of the way and avoided each volley while still making his hand signs. It's not enough. Kimimaro said as he suddenly burst forwards at great speed in an attempt to get close to his opponent before he finished his hand signs. This kid is fast, but not fast enough. He thought as he finished his hand sign. You're done for. Water style. He started. However, at the last second, the real Kimimaro burst from the ground stabbing a bone blade into the opponent's throat stopping him from enacting the jutsu. To Kimimaro's, Haku's, and Koyoki's surprise, each of their opponents burst into a puff of white smoke as they all delivered the finishing blow at the same time. Each of them looked around and looked to each other as they quickly regrouped, expecting a counterattack to come their way. Looks like they were shadow clones, Kimimaro said, doing his best to scout the area. Haku can you find the real one? He asked. Haku shook his. I can't sense anything. He said, staying alert like the others. What the hell is going on here? Koyoki said, relaxing a little. All right you guys, that's enough. A voice in the distance said. All three of them looked towards it, each ready to defend themselves. However, once they saw who walked out of the mist they seemed to release a little. Man. Lord Mizu Cage wasn't kidding about you three. The man said with a smile on his face. It was Kaga. One of Funa's trusted teammates, and one of his generals in the battle against the fourth Mizu Cage. Kaga was a tall good looking man with long blonde hair who wore the standard Mist Jonin attire. I'm sorry if I startled the three of you, but I thought you would fight a little harder if you thought your life was on the line, Kaga said rubbing the back of his head. Koyoki blushed a little as she got a good look at him, seeing how handsome he was. While Haku and Kimimaro both relaxed, realizing that this had been a test. So you are our new sensei. Haku said. Kage nodded. That's right, as ordered by Lord Mizu Cage. He said. 
I just wanted to see what each of you were made of. So I decided to send a couple of shadow clones after you. I'm pleased to tell you that you all passed with flying colors. He then said giving them a thumbs up. Now how about you all tell me a little about yourselves? He then said. With that, the four of them all sat down against some of the training posts and Kaga proceeded to introduce himself properly. My name is Kaga. I'm a Jonin and was asked by Lord Fifth to take on you three forming this squad. He said, introducing himself. Now how about each of you tells me a little about yourself, maybe even what you dream of doing. He said. Koyoki didn't waste any time as she spoke up first. My name is Koyoki Karatachi. I'm ten years old and the only daughter of the Yanda Maimizu cage. My dream is to become a powerful Kunoichi and clear my father's name. She said, confident and bold. Kage nodded as he crossed his arms. An impressive goal, Koyoki. Haku went next, wearing a gentle smile on his face as always. My name is Haku Yuki. I am eight years old and my dream is to be useful to my master, making him proud of me. He said softly. Kage nodded in understanding as he had already been briefed on Haku and Kimimaro by Fona. Kage then looked to Kimimaro, who also had a peaceful look on his face. And what about you? Kage asked. Kimimaro smiled. I too want to become a strong ninja and make my master proud of me. I will do anything to be useful towards his goals. Kimimaro said. Kage nodded. All right then. Pleased to meet all of you. He said as he stood to his feet. Now, I want you all to get some rest. I will summon you for our first mission in a few days, all right. Kaga said. The three of them Al nodded and Kaga bid them farewell as he suddenly vanished, leaving the three of them alone. Kaga had then reported to Funa who had been watching the whole thing from the shadows, keeping an eye on their progress. Lord Mizu Cage, Kaga said as he bowed his head to Funa. Funa nodded in response. He was leaning against a tree with his arms crossed and pushed off it to stand up straight. So. He then asked. Kaga smiled. You weren't kidding. Those kids pack a punch. Kaga said with a smile. Each of them passed my test without any issue, all of them were able to defeat one of my shadow clones, Kaga said. Fona nodded. Very good. He said seeming pleased with their abilities. Let them rest for a few days now. I'll prepare a mission that will suit their abilities soon, come and see me then. Fona said. Kage nodded and bowed before Fona disappeared. Fona was now sat in his office as he finished remembered the events that had happened. He was flicking through paperwork and files that mission slips had been put into. Unlike before they had not been given a class system and only the Mizu cage deemed how difficult the mission was, giving it to whoever he wanted. Fona had put a stop to that. Now each mission would be judged on its difficulty and given a rank from D to S, just like the hidden leaf. This way he could prevent Jenin from being used as cannon fodder in more difficult missions that they weren't ready for, and assign missions to people whose strength suited the task. Thanks to him lowering the price of the mist's cost for missions, they had received a large influx of mission lately and the village had become busy in providing shinobi to deal with the sudden increase of work. Fona had found the perfect mission for his students and had deemed that it should be safe enough for them to complete without anything bad happening. It was a C-rank mission. One of the nobles of the land of hot water had reported bandits had been raiding his lands and had requested the hidden mist to deal with it, seeing at how low their costs had become. The bandits had been reported to be no stronger than Chunin level ninja and Fona thought it would be a perfect test for them before he pushed them any further. All right, Team Eleven. Come in. He then said, summoning them inside. The doors to his office opened and Kaga walked in with Kimimaro, Haku, and Koyoki. Haku and Kimimaro were also dressed in the new gear that Fona had gotten them as a reward for passing out of the academy and becoming a genin, showing them how proud of them he was. Haku wore the standard Kirigakur pinstriped outfit which stopped at his knees. Over this, he wore a green Hayori with white trimmings, and around his waist a brown sash with a fringed trail wrapped around his waist twice. He also wore light brown platoon sandals with straps in the same color as his kimono. It was ironic that he now wore the same outfit he had worn in the anime and manga. Kimimaro now wore a pair of black trousers and a long-sleeved black shirt. It was very similar to what Fona used to wear when he was that age, just without the mist flak jacket. The idea was that he could easily remove the top and use his jutsu without the clothing getting in the way. Both Kimimaro and Haku also wore their hidden mist headbands around their head with pride. Koyoki wore a blue robe that was loose around her shoulders, she had a black sleeveless undertop, that also covered half of her neck. 
she additionally had a black corset wrapped around her waist which also displayed her forehead protector. She had black tights on and the standard black shinobi boots on along with black fingerless gloves that ran up to her bicep. Each of them bowed as they stopped before Fona. Greeting with respect. It was the first time Koihoki had met Fona after what had happened with her father, although she had been told the story, leaving out a few details, of course. All right, you three. Are you ready for your first mission? He said as he interlocked his fingers, a smile appearing on his face. The three of them nodded in confidence as they looked into Fona's eyes. Yes Lord Mizu Cage. They each replied. All right then, Fona said as he leaned back in his chair. I'm giving you a mission to head to the land of hot water and dispose of a group of bandits who have been raiding a noble's lands. The bandits have been reported to be Chunin level. Think you can handle it? Fona said, waiting to see how they each reacted. Koyoki stepped forwards first. We can handle it no problem. She said looking Fona in the eye with fierce determination. Kimimaro and Haku also stepped forwards both nodding in agreement. All right then, Fona said as he tossed the scroll to Kaga. You'd best be off then. He said, feeling like a proud father at seeing how far they had already come. Okay going to end it there. Hope you enjoyed this chapter and as always thank you for the support. Chapter 52 Chapter 52 Fona watched as Kimimaro, Haku, and Koihoki left for their first mission with Kaga. He couldn't help feel like a proud father, and part of him wished it was him taking them on their first mission. But he knew that the needs of the village outweighed his own. He could think of no one else better suited to become their Jonin captain. If Hatsu were still alive, he would have been his first choice, but his death had come all too soon. Fona shook the thought away, knowing that his friend would not want him to be sad not after everything they had achieved together thanks to his sacrifice. He knew that he must cast his view onto the future and prosperity of the village. Knowing that looking to the past would only bring sorrow and doubt. With that, he stepped away from the large window in his office and sat back at his chair to finish up some remaining paperwork before the plans he had made with Swiren, turns out she had some big news she needed to tell him about. All right. Our first mission. Koyoki shouted as the four of them reached the village gates. Haku was also excited, and Kimimaro as usual contained his emotion behind a simple smile. Right, you three let's head out to the land of hot water, Kaga said, smiling at them. The three of them nodded to their sensei and followed him, setting off along the path that leads out of the village. Their first destination would be to one of the ports west of the village, it wasn't far, and once there, they would board a ferry that would transport them across the sea onto the border of the land of fire and the land of hot water. It would only be a few hours' journey from there to their next destination, being the noble's estate. The whole journey would take a day, as the ferry was the longest part of the trip. Koyoki was a chatterbox most of the time, seeming to be the complete opposite of her father in that department. Haku seemed to enjoy listening to her, although Kaga thought he was just too nice to say anything else. Kimimaro, on the other hand, remained quiet. He liked to watch and observe from a distance. Kaga could tell the boy was a genius in his own right and not just in combat, as he had already excelled in his ability to observe. Remember to be on guard once we arrived in the land of fire. The roads are filled with danger. Kaga said, giving his students a warning. The three of them nodded, taking their sensei's words in without question. Yes sensei. The three of them said. With that, the four of them made the most of their time until the boat arrived at the land of fire. Haku and Kimimaro were amazed at the sight. After all, they had never been outside of the land of water before. All right you three, let's move out, Kaga said as he started walking down the ramp that had been placed so that the passengers could walk off the boat and onto the shore. The three of them followed him, making sure to keep up, not getting too sidetracked from the small port town they found themselves in. Okay, Haku. Why don't you take this map here and lead us to our destination? Kaga said, handing the boy the map. Haku nodded as he took the map. During their time in the academy, the three of them had been taught map reading, along with many other things necessary of a shinobi. Haku took a good look at the map before he gained his bearing. All set. Kaga asked. Haku nodded. Very well Haku, lead the way, Kaga said. Haku did just that and set off as the others followed him. Walking to the edge of town they headed to the edge of the land of fire before entering the land of hot water. Once there Haku brought them to a road that would lead straight to the noble's estate. Good job Haku. Kaga said as he lead them to the noble's estate without any trouble. Kaga walked up to the large front door and knocked, 
taking a step back as he waited for someone to answer. It wasn't long until an elder man dressed as a butler opened the door, treating the four of them. I take it you are here to see the master. He stated, before opening the door fully for them to enter. Yes. Team Kaga, reporting from the village hidden in the mist. Kaga said, greeting the old butler. Please come in. The butler said, allowing them inside. Kaga and the others entered the large house, the butler then showed them to a large waiting room and offered them a seat. Please, wait here while I fetch the master. He said, excusing himself from the room. Kaga nodded as he and the others took a seat. Wow, this room is so big. Koyoki said as she jumped onto one of the large armchairs in the room. Haku and Kimimaro agreed as they too were impressed. After a moment the doors opened again and this time they were greeted by the master of the house, the noble who had requested the mission himself. Greetings Miss Chinobi, greetings. The man shouted as he entered the room. I do hope I didn't keep you waiting long. He then said as he took a good look at the ninja standing before him. Oh my, what lovely children you have brought along. He then said, looking at Kaga. Kaga smiled. Children yes. But they are also shinobi of the mist and are more than skilled. You have my word. The noble was a strange man, dressed almost like a clown in makeup, complete with long green hair and a top hat. Very well, allow me to introduce myself. I am Hume Van Benkrier. At your service. He said giving a bow. Kaga and the others returned his greeting. I am Kaga of the Mist. This here is Koyuki, Haku and Kimimaro. He said introducing his team. My, how splendid. You may call me Van. The noble said as he sat down, his butler instantly pouring him a cup of tea and placing it on the table next to him. How rude of me, Van said, realizing he had not offered them something to drink. Van then snapped his fingers and his butler started to pour each of them a drink. Thank you, Lord Van, Kaga said, accepting the tea, as was the polite thing to do. Very well, to business then. Van said after taking a sip of his drink. As I requested in my letter to your village. I seem to be having a tad bit of trouble with a gang of rogue shinobi. He said, taking another sip of his tea. Kaga nodded as he listened. They just won't leave my men alone and have already attacked my trade product three times, Van said, crossing his legs. That is where you come in. He then said, looking at Haku with interest. If the bandits attack, I would like you to kill them. All of them. He then said with an intense look in his eye. Kaga and the others didn't bat an eyelid at his request. After all, they were Miss Chinobi. That won't be a problem, will it? Van asked. Not at all, sir, Kaga said. That is why you hired us, is it not? Kaga said as he sipped his tea. Van smiled and gave a cheerful laugh. Just as I would expect from you Miss Chinobi. Very well, I shall make the arrangements. Please make yourselves at home until then. He said, standing to his feet. Kaga nodded as he stood to his feet to thank him and bid him farewell. Thank you for your hospitality. We will not disappoint. Thank you. I hope not. Van said before exiting the room. Kaga and the others watched as he exited the room and the doors shut behind him, leaving them and the butler alone. Allow me to show you to your room. The old man then said. Kaga nodded and the four of them followed the old man upstairs where he showed them to their rooms. I hope you find everything to your liking. You shall be notified of the details once the plans have been made, until then if there is anything you need, please see me. He said giving a small bow before he left them alone. Wow. Look at the size of these beds. Haku said taking in all the details of the room. Kimimaro also had the same look on his face as everything inside the room looked expensive. Okay you three, get some rest. And don't go wandering off anywhere you shouldn't, understood. Kaga said the three of them. Haku, Kimimaro and Koyoki all nodded. What about you, sensei? Kimimaro asked, being observant as always. Kaga couldn't help but laugh. Doesn't miss a thing this kid. He thought. I'm going out to scout the surrounding area. Don't worry about me and get some rest, okay? He said giving them a smile. Kimimaro nodded. Don't worry about us sensei, I'll keep an eye on these two. Koyoki said, putting her hands on her hips. All right, Koyoki, I leave you in charge. He then said before he vanished, leaving the three of them alone. Kagari appeared atop of the house 
mounting the roof so he had a good vantage point to look across the land. There was only one road leading in and out of the estate, with the surrounding land being fields and forest. Kaga could see that there were other living quarters a little away from the house, he guessed they were where the staff lived. He could also see a large barn and warehouse, with the stables next to it. All in all, Lord Hume Van Benkrier seemed to be pretty well off, Kaga thought as he scoped the entire estate. The bandits and rogue shinobi have been estimated to be Chunin level. Hopefully, that intel is correct. He thought as he looked towards the sunset. I guess tomorrow, we will find out. He then said as he vanished from the roof. Meanwhile back in the village hidden in the mist. Fona had finished his last duties for the day and decided to head home. After all, he was meeting Swiran and she had already told him she had some big news to tell him. Fona walked through the streets, greeting everyone with a smile. The entire village was pleased to see him and greeted him with the most respect, bowing to him in thanks for all he had done for them so far. Fona finally reached his home and opened the door. Hello. I'm home. He shouted, getting no response. That's strange, I thought Swiran would be home now. He said as he walked into the kitchen. Fona noticed a note on the table and picked it up so he could read it. Just popped out to grab something for dinner, won't be long. Swiran. Fona chuckled and headed to the fridge as he took a drink out. It sure is quiet without the boys here. He said, as he opened his pop and took a drink, sitting down after wiping his mouth. Soon after the door opened and Fona could hear Swiran's voice as she walked into the kitchen with a shopping bag in hand. Oh, you're home. She said a little surprised. Fona laughed. Isn't that why you left me the note? He said. Swiran looked at the note and then laughed. Oh that's right, I'm such a scatterbrain sometimes. She said, seeming a little nervous. Fona couldn't help pick up on it, but decided to leave it be. What did you get for dinner then? He said as he stood up giving her a kiss on the cheek. Swiran put the bag down onto the kitchen table and started pulling the bits out of it she had bought. I thought I could make us something special tonight. She said as she pulled free of his hug as she started to get everything she would need to make the food. Fona was certainly surprised now and couldn't hold back the question anymore. Swiran, is everything all right? He asked, his voice a little more serious than he intended it to be. Swiran stopped what she was doing at his question not turning around to look at him. Fona could tell she was almost scared and it made him sad to think that it could be him she was frightened of. It's okay Swiran, you can tell me if something is bothering you, Fona said as he placed his hands on her shoulders. Swiran slowly turned around and looked him in the eyes. She had a strange expression on her face, a mix of joyfulness and worry all at the same. What is it Swiran? Fona asked starting to worry himself. Swiran smiled but then it faded as she placed one hand in the other. It's about what I need to tell you Fona. It's. It's. It's okay, Swiran. Wherever it is. It's okay. Fona said as he looked into her eyes. Fona. She said, looking down before finding her resolve. I'm. I'm pregnant. She said, looking into his eyes. Chapter 53, Chapter 53 Pregnant. Fona said, his face filled with surprise. Swiran nodded as she held her hands close to her chest. I know it's a shock. I didn't plan this either. She said almost seeming sad. Fona quickly wrapped his arms around her as he held her in his embrace. Please don't be sad Swiran. This isn't a bad thing. He said smiling at her. But May. She said looking into his eyes. May is already pregnant with your child. Swiran started. Fona wasn't sure where she was going with this and just held her. I want you to be in both of these children's lives. They should both grow up with their father. She said with a determined look on her face. They will, Fona said with a smile. I'm not planning on going anywhere. He said. Swiran shook her head. I don't mean that. I mean they should both grow up with their father in the same house. She said. Fona nodded his head slowly trying to understand where she was going with this. T that's why I have decided. I've decided to invite May to live with us. She said adamantly. Wait what? Fona said, now even more shocked. That's right. I've asked May to come and live with us. That way you can have both of us and be a part of both your children's lives. She said looking a little embarrassed. Wait, have both of you? What are you saying? He said. I'm saying that from this day onwards, 
both me and Mei will be here, for you. You are the Mizu Cage after all, and it would be only right that you have more than one lover. She said going a little red in the face. Ah! Uh. Fona shouted in shock at Swiran's words. Meanwhile, morning came quickly for Team Kaga as they were all up at the crack of dawn. It was drilled into them from their time at the academy and besides, Kaga had summoned them for breakfast. He wanted the three of them to get an early start on the day, he also wanted to keep out of the way until the time of the mission. The four of them sat and quality ate their breakfast. It wasn't anything fancy, but it would give them plenty of energy to help start the day. Not long after that, Kaga had them scout out the area so that they could become familiar with the lay of the land, in case of an attack. Once Van was up and about it wasn't long until he summoned them to give word that he had put the plans into motion. I've made a quick change of plans. He said as he sipped his tea. The cargo will be transported in one hour to the closest town. I will be relying on the four of you to escort it there safe and sound. He said, seeming very cheerful. Of course, Kaga said nodding his head. Yeah, leave it to us. Koyoki then shouted as she punched the air. Van couldn't help but smile at her enthusiasm and placed his teacup back down. Excellent. I look forward to hearing your report once the cargo is transported safely and the bandits are dead. He said, standing up once he had finished talking. Kaga nodded to him and watched as he walked out of the room. All right you three, prepare your gear. We move out soon. He said, getting a nod from Haku, Kimimaro, and Koyoki, who cheered. All right. I can't wait. She said in excitement. Kaga laughed. I wouldn't get too excited if I were you. Most likely once the bandits see us, they will think twice about attacking. Kaga said as he crossed his arms. Ah. I was looking forwards to kicking some butt. Koyoki said as she punched her hand. Haku simple smiled. Don't worry Koyoki, I'm sure we will still have fun. He said. Kimimaro didn't say anything as usual and remained quiet. Okay, dismissed, Kaga said, allowing them to go and tend to their equipment. The three of them did as Kaga instructed and left the room to go and prepare for the mission, while Kaga remained. Time will tell what lies in store for us. He said as he pulled a scroll from his tool bag, checking it over as he had a small flashback. Back in the Mizu Cage's office. Zabuza? Really my lord? Kaga said as Fona had just explained the real purpose of the mission to him. That's right, Fona said as he leaned forwards on his desk. Our spies have picked up a trail and new intel has come in saying he could be somewhere in the land of hot water. Kaga nodded. If that is indeed true, I don't think my squad is qualified to handle such a mission. Kaga said. I understand that, Fona said as he picked a scroll up and placed it on the desk in front of Kaga. I can't afford to send a tracker squad. If Zabuza gets even a slight whiff that they are tracking him, he will disappear. Fona said crossing his arms. I don't like it, but I'm using your squad as bait, Fona said. But what about my squad? Would you really risk their lives? Kaga asked. Fona kept a blank expression on his face. You are not to engage. If you come into contact with Zabuza I want you to activate that scroll. Is that understood? Fona said. Kaga nodded, realizing it was a reverse summoning scroll that would summon Fona to its location. Very well Lord Mizu Cage, I understand. Kaga's flashback ended, and he put the scroll back into his weapons pouch. Not long passed and Kaga regrouped with his students outside by the barn. The cargo had been loaded onto two separate horses and carts. Exotic spices and salts were the cargo, meaning it was worth stealing. Kaga had a chat with both drivers so he could find out any details he might need to know in case of an attack. After that, he headed over to the others so that he could give them a quick brief before they set off. All right listen up. Koyoki, I want you to ride in the first carriage. He said, getting a nod from her. Kimimaro you will be walking on the right of the convoy, while Haku takes the left side. He said. I'll stay at the back so I can keep an eye on things. He then said. Understood. Yes sensei. The three of them said. Good, let's move out. Kaga then said as he headed to the back to take his position. With that all done the convoy headed off as the two drivers gave the horses a nudge, signaling them to start walking. The others had taken their positions and now all that remained was to stay alert in case of an attack. The driver that Koyoki sat next to looked her up and down surprised at how young she was. Are you really a ninja? He asked. Koyoki smirked as she looked at him. 
he seemed to be a young man maybe twenty years old. I am, want me to kill you to prove it. She said with a terrifying expression on her face. The driver could feel her killer instinct and backed off. Okay, point proven. He said as he quickly turned his eyes back to the road. Kimimaro and Haku took the flanks, walking at a steady pace to match the slow-moving convoy. Haku had his hands crossed behind his back as he looked around at the pretty flowers growing by the side of the road, humming a little tune in his head seeming to be in a world of his own. Kaga paid close attention to his team of genin as he sat in the horse and cart at the back. He was sure that Haku and Kimimaro were already at Chunin level and both possessed amazing abilities. Well of course they are gifted. Lord Mizu Cage wouldn't just train any random kids he finds on the street. Kaga thought. And besides. They each possessed one of the same Kekiai Genkai that he did. And if Kaga knew Fona, he would have already taught them things that other genin couldn't even imagine yet. More time passed and not a lot was going on. Koyoki couldn't help but yawn as she quickly grew bored. Kimimaro on the other hand never let his guard down, even though he seemed perfectly at ease as he walked with a blank expression. Kaga could tell that he was on guard. A small hint of movement in the distance caught Kaga's gaze, as he turned his head to look. He scoped out the surrounding area in a matter of seconds, not seeing any other movement. Hmm. He thought as he passed it off for an animal or something. Haku had also noticed movement as a bush in the surrounding woods rattled ever so slightly. Haku took a closer look, getting ready to reach for one of his senbon needles. Not a moment later, a small bunny jumped out of the bush staring at Haku for a moment. Ah, a bunny. He said looking at the cute little animal. He walked over to the rabbit to stroke it and quickly noticed the explosive tag that was wrapped around its underbelly. Kaga noticed what was going on too late and tried to shout out. Haku look out! He shouted. The rabbit suddenly exploded, creating a black cloud of fire and smoke that swallowed Haku from sight. Attack! A voice shouted, coming from the woods, signaling the start of an ambush. Oh shit, it's the bandits! The driver next to Koyuki shouted as he looked at her with fear in his eyes. Koyoki had seen what happened to Haku and quickly jumped up to her feet. You bastards will pay for that. She shouted. There were seven bandits in total. Two rushed at Kimimaro, two towards Koyoki and another two towards Kaga. Quickly singling out the shinobi and targeting them first. Only the leader remained as he stayed back, watching his men go to work from the distance. Kimimaro quickly jumped into the air dodging a slash from one of the bandits. Kimimaro flipped in the air and pushed his foot off the man's shoulder using it as a turning point to gain momentum from, as he kicked the other bandit in the face, breaking his neck dropping him to the floor. Why you? The other one shouted in rage as he raised his sword, swinging it down with all his might. Kimimaro landed on the ground and spun around with lighting relaxes. To the man's surprise, his sword snapped in half as he felt it collide with something stronger than steel. What in the? The man asked as he stared at Kimimaro who had cut his sword in half with a bone blade. Time to die. Kimimaro said as he quickly dashed in, to faster the man to see. Kimimaro stabbed his bone blade through the man's heart faster than he could even blink. Coughing up blood he fell to his knees as Kimimaro had his back to him, only turning around when he dropped to the ground. Koyoki quickly jumped into the air, pulling the driver of the cart off with her to avoid a shower of shuriken. Arg! The man screamed like a little girl and hid behind the cart as Koyoki dropped him. Koyoki pulled out a kunao and blocked a couple of slashes from her first opponent before becoming locked in a clash with him. The other quickly ran around her and was about to attack her from the side, when two senbon needles struck him in the neck, dropping him to the ground where he skidded to a halt. What in the hell? The other bandit said as he broke off the assault between him and Koyoki. Not so fast. She shouted as she started making hand signs. Fire style, fireball jutsu. She said in her head before taking a large breath of air and breathing it back out as fire. The bandit jumped high into the air doing his best to avoid the flames as he rejoined with his leader. Kaga had easily taken out both of the bandits that tried to launch their sorry excuse for an attack on him. Quickly immobilizing them with his superior hand-to-hand -hand combat, killing them both before they even knew what hit them. Kaga was also pleased to see Haku hanging from a tree back from his feet as he petted the rabbit in his arms. The kid is fast. He thought as he looked towards the leader. The bandit leader noticed the headbands they were wearing and bit his lip. Darn it, we are no match for Kiri Shinobi. He said under his breath. Retreat. He then said to his only surviving teammate. We will leave these to him. He said as he and the other bandit disappeared. 
Haku dropped back to the ground and put the rabbit on the ground, watching it run away safely back into the trees. Koyoki crossed her arms as he walked over to her. You didn't have to help me. I had a plan. She said. Haku simple smiled at her and then looked to Kaga who appeared next to them. Good work, both of you. He said. Kimimaro also joined them and Kaga gave him a nod. You too Kimimaro, sharp as a pin, aren't you? He said with a smile. So that's five dead, with two retreating. Kaga then said as he looked at the bodies. Actually sensei, Haku said. I didn't kill this one. He said pointing to the man with two needles in his neck. Kaga looked at the man surprised and checked his pulse. Wow, he really is alive. I could have sworn he was dead a moment ago. Kava thought as he pulled the senbon out, causing the man to gasp for air. Good work Haku. He said quickly grabbing the man by the throat, setting a new fear into his eyes. You had better tell me everything you know, Kaga said as he squeezed on the man's windpipe. The man gasped for air as Kaga squeezed harder, tapping his hands off the ground in pain. Oh okay. He managed to get out as he struggled to breathe. Kaga looked to the others. Go and check on the cargo and drivers. I'll question this one. He said, telling them, not asking. The three of them nodded and went off to do as they were instructed. Now, let's you and me have a little talk. Chapter 54, Chapter 54 Kaga stood over the bandit that Haku had knocked unconscious, ready to make him talk no matter what it took. You had better start speaking, Kaga said as he bent down to look the man in the eye as he spoke, placing a hand on his shoulder. The bandit was shaking a little as he felt Kaga's killer instinct wash over him. And no I won't talk. He said all of a sudden as he tried to bite his tongue. Kaga quickly grabbed his face, squeezing his jaw on the pressure points so that he couldn't clamp his teeth down. I don't think so, Kaga said with a small smile on his face. Now talk, Kaga said as his shadow loomed over him even more. Meanwhile, Haku, Kimimaro and Koyoki had gone back to check on the two drivers, making sure that they were unharmed. Are you okay? Haku asked one of them, as Koyoki placed her hands on her hips. Coast is clear, you can stop hiding now. She said. Both drivers slowly stood up and nodded, seeing that the coast was indeed clear. We should get out of here before they come back. The young driver who had been with Koyoki said in protest. Don't worry, they won't be coming back after a thrashing like that anytime soon. Koyoki said in confidence. However, the driver didn't seem convinced as he looked at the three children. Don't worry, you will be safe with us, Kimimaro said giving them a smile that put them a little more at ease. Kaga walked back over, having finished interrogating the remaining bandit. How is everything you three, all in order? He asked already knowing the answer to his question. Yes sensei, the drivers are fine and the cargo is all accounted for, Kimimaro said. Kaga nodded as he looked at Haku who smiled and Koyoki who turned her head to the side giving him a huff. Noise. All right, be on guard in case they decide to return. Our mission isn't over until this cargo reaches the next village. Kaga said. The three of them nodded and they took their positions, ready to make the remainder of the trip. The rest of the mission went a lot smoother as no other bandits showed up to try and steal the cargo, and soon enough they reached the next town over where they were to drop off the cargo. The town was of medium size and was quite busy with people going about their business. Okay, the warehouse is just a little further into town. The young driver said to Koyoki as he steered the carriage. Koyoki nodded as she stared at everything that was going on in the village. It was all new to her and something she wasn't used to seeing as children her age played freely on the streets. People were outside with seamlessly no worries on their minds other than what they wanted to buy for dinner. The market was busy with the hustle of trade and Koyoki could see an abundance of products laid out looking fresh. Kimimaro and Haku were also amazed as they too stared wide-eyed at everything that was going on. Kage noticed their reaction and almost felt bad for them as it was their first time out of the village after all. Poor kids. He thought before a smile came to his face. It won't be long before Lord Mizu Cage changes the mist for the better. He then thought as he paid his attention back to the convoy and the mission. The convoy soon turned into a small side street where they stopped outside of a warehouse that had others working inside of it. A few of them noticed the convoy approaching and hoped down from what they were doing, coming outside to take a look. All right, you made it. One of them shouted. And it looks like all the cargo is there this time. The boss is gonna be happy for sure this time. Another said as he crossed his arms, nodding his head in approval. 
Kaga hopped off his wagon and headed over to the men who had gathered around to see the convoy that had arrived. Who's in charge here? He asked. A man stepped forwards and raised his hand. I'm in charge. He said as he raised his hand, looking over to Kaga. Good, here is the convoy, delivered safe and sound, Kaga said as he handed over an inventory list. T thank you. He said as he took the sheet, trying not to stare at Kaga and the others. Did you get any trouble on the road? He asked trying to guess how old the three genins were. We did. But, I wouldn't worry about that. Kaga said as he turned his back. The cargo is safe inside the town limits, I doubt the bandits would risk trying to steal it in such a populated area, Kaga said, walking off to his students. All right, you three, that's the first part of our mission complete. He said, giving them a thumbs up. The three of them nodded looking pleased with themselves as Kaga complimented them. But don't let your guard down. We could still face an attack before we launch our own. He then said, giving them the warning to remain on guard. The three of them nodded and then Kaga turned back to the man in charge of the warehouse. We shall take our leave, as we still have other things to do before we return to your master, Kaga said, letting him know they would not be staying. The man nodded and thanked him for getting the cargo and his friends safely to town. Kaga nodded and took his leave, taking his students into the town center so they could look at the markets. All right, you three, get some food, take a look around town and then meet back here in an hour, after that, we move out, Kaga said as he handed each of them some money. All three of them looked very excited, although, Koyoki tried to hide it. Yes sensei. They each said as they walked off to go and explore, leaving Kaga to attend to some business he had here in town. Kaga vanished using the body flicker heading off to his own meeting point, remaining hidden from sight. Haku turned to the others with an excited look on his face. Let's go and check out the market. Kimimaro also smiled. Yes, but we should remain vigilant. He said. Koyoki nodded. That's right, there could be more bandits around here, so we shouldn't be running around acting like kids. Haku frowned a little as he looked down at the ground. You're right. He said. Kimimaro noticed the look on his face and smiled. We should have some fun and explore, as Kaga sensei said. Come on, let's go. He then said as he walked off, heading towards the market. Haku's smile returned as he grew more and more excited, running off with Kimimaro, leaving Koyoki behind. H hey, wait for me. Koyoki shouted as she watched both of them run off without her. Meanwhile, Kaga had headed to an abandoned building on the edge of town. He entered the building making sure he wasn't followed and headed upstairs. I see you made it, Kaga said as he looked at the two men stood in the darkness. Both of them stepped out of the shadows revealing their tracker masks and mist anvil clothing. Report. One of them said. Kaga nodded. So Lord Mizukage sent you to check up on me? He asked. One of them stepped forwards and handed a scroll over to Kaga. No. We have separate orders to take your lead and only respond if you make contact. Kaga nodded. Don't you worry. If we find that traitor Zabuza, then I'll make sure I kill him without needing your help. Both of the Anbu showed no sign of caring, however, one of them stepped forwards. Didn't Lord Mizukage say he wanted him alive? Kaga nodded. Yeah, I know. Both of the Anbu also nodded as they had finished reporting everything they had uncovered. We will be watching. They said as they stepped back into the shadows, vanishing from sight. Kaga smiled as he placed a hand on the back of his head. Yeah I know, I know. Wow, look at all of the food. Koyoki said as the three of them stood in the center of the market. Haku was also excited as his nose picked up all of the amazing smells floating in the air. Kimimaro was also excited and the three of them moved from stall to stall as they looked at everything there was to see. The time passed as they tried samples of food, enjoyed the shows and performances that were happening, and simply enjoyed the short time they had together as kids. The three of them had eventually sat on a quiet bench in a small park as they finished all of the food they had got. Haku was sat quietly with a smile on his face as he watched some other children play. Koyoki gave a loud moan in happiness as she finished the last sweat dumpling, wishing she had more. While Kimimaro sat swinging his legs as he looked at the blue sky. A small gust of wind blew their hair as it seemed to appear out of nowhere. Having fun are we? Kaga said as he walked over to them from behind. Each of them turned around to see their sensei stood with his hands on his hips. I hope you saved me some of that food. He then said smiling at them. No way sensei. 
you're late. Koyuki said as she turned her head away from him. Kaga laughed as he rubbed the back of his head. I guess I am a little. Are we heading out on our next mission? Kimimaro asked. Kaga nodded. That's right. They all kicked off the bench, standing to their feet as they placed the rubbish into one of the bins. All right, let's go. Kaga then said as he turned around. Haku nodded to Kimimaro and then to Koyuki as the three of them followed their sensei, heading outside of the town and back onto the road they had traveled on. Once they were out of sight, Kaga gave the order and the four of them disappeared into the trees moving like shadows in the setting sun. They now traveled through the forest, moving much faster as they jumped between the trees using their chakra to increase their speed. All right, you three, Kaga said, getting their attention. I hope you are ready for the main part of the mission. He said. We are Kaga sensei. Kimimaro said. Yeah bring it on. Koyoki said, starting to get excited. Very well, Kaga said. I was able to get the location of the bandits hideout from the one Haku took down. As requested, we are to head to their hideout and kill them. Kaga said being blunt. The others didn't say anything as they continued to follow Kaga, jumping through the trees making good timing. Although they are still young. They are Miss Chinobi and are trained to kill without feeling. Haku and Kimimaro have been personally trained by Lord Mizukage himself, already showing excellent potential. Koyoki is also the daughter of Lord Fourth and shares his blood. I expect nothing but success from each of them. Kaga thought to himself before they arrive at the edge of the forest at the base of a cliff. All right, the bandit's hideout is located at the top of this cliff inside a cave. Be on guard. Kaga said, letting them all know. Kaga accessed the area and could see no traps or lookouts giving the order to move as he deemed it safe to do so. Haku jumped onto the cliff, using his chakra to keep his feet stuck to it allowing him to run along the cliffside with ease. Kimimaro did the same along with Koyoki as they moved in a split formation to cover as much ground as possible between them. Kaga reached the top of the cliff first and flipped onto the ledge, only seeing one guard. Haku was already on it as he let loose two senbon needles that struck the man in the neck, killing him before he dropped. Kimimaro quickly caught him before he fell and gently placed him on the ground so to avoid any noise that could alert the others. Two more voices could be heard as shadows started making their way out of the cave up ahead. Haku quickly dashed to the side wall taking cover while Kimimaro used a transformation jutsu to copy the appearance of the one they had just killed, turning his back to them so they could not see his face. I can't believe they failed to take down three brats and steal that loot today. One of them said. I told him we should have taken the brothers, but knew. No. He said we could handle it alone. The other said. Both of them noticed Kimimaro, falling for his transformation as they approached him with caution. Hey Gamma, pass me your lighter will you? One of them said as he pulled out a cigarette. Kimimaro turned around, surprising them as they saw his face. However, he moved too fast for them and quickly stabbed each of them with a bone blade. Haku and Koyoki also appeared behind them, covering their mouths to silence them from screaming for help. Good work, Kaga said, impressed with their assassination abilities as they lowered the bodies to the ground. He then gave the hand signs for them to surround the cave entrance. Each of them headed over and took their position, getting ready for what came next. Kaga dropped to the ground and stood to his feet as he took a quick look inside of the cave, only seeing as far as the light would allow. Suddenly his eyes opened wide as he tried to retreat. However, it was no use as a huge water dragon hit him dead on taking him in its mouth before it crashed into the edge of the cliff. Kaga-sensei. Koyoki shouted as they watched their sensei get smashed by the water dragon and sent flying off the cliff back into the forest. Well, well. That's what you get for snooping. A gruff voice said as its owner walked out of the cave and into the light. The three of them all turned to see who the owner of the voice was as they took a ready stance, seeing that their sensei had been taken off guard. Haku's eyes opened wide as he took in the appearance of who stood before him freezing on the spot as he recognized who it was. Koyoki noticed Haku freeze and could also see Kimimaro become serious as he too took a ready stance before she looked over to the man who stood before them. Well, well. It's been a while kid. Zabuza said as he looked down at Haku. Chapter 55, Chapter 55 Haku stood face to face with Zabuza. The man who he had first thought would be his savior, his master, and his purpose. Zabuza was dressed in a sleeveless black shirt and matching pants, complete with Kirigakura's striped wrist and leg warmers, Zabuza also wore bandages that were wrapped around his face and neck along with his Kiri forehead protector, with two swords strapped to his back. 
Kimimaro recognized who he was, also having seen him in person, as well as reading a file on him as a missing nin in the bingo book. This isn't good. He thought to himself as he assessed the situation in an instant. Fire style, fireball jutsu. Koyoki shouted trying to launch a counterattack after seeing what he had done to their sensei. Zabuza simply gruffed as he didn't even move out of the way of the fire style, instead slicing it in half with a large sword he pulled from his back. Haku get away from him. Kimimaro shouted all of a sudden trying to warm his friend as Zabuza seemed to vanish. Zabuza was too fast though and struck Haku in the stomach with a kick while he was still a little confused. The force of the kick sent him flying before Kimimaro caught him in the air, halting his fall. Koyoki was shocked he had deflected her fire style so easily and watched as Zabuza kicked Haku before Kimimaro saved him. We can't beat him. Kimimaro shouted over to her, just as she was getting ready to launch another attack. Koyoki looked at Kimimaro and then back to Zabuza who was stood still with his sword resting over his shoulder. Zabuza smiled as he recognized who Koyoka was. So the daughter of the fourth, and the two adopted kin of the fifth. He said pointing his sword at them. What an interesting combination for a squad. Zabuza then said before he stabbed his sword into the ground. It's time to see how well Fona taught you, Zabuza said as he started to walk towards them. Haku had recovered now but was still a little shaken up from the attack. However, he didn't have time to rest as Kimimaro snapped him out of it. He's coming. Defensive positions. He shouted alerting Haku and Koyoki to Zabuza's sudden assault. Zabuza suddenly vanished and reappeared as he moved too fast for them to keep track of. Behind you. He then said before he kicked Koyoki with enough force to send her flying through the air and crashing into the cliffside. Kimimaro quickly jumped forwards attacking with everything he had, letting his bones fly as he danced and sliced using his body as a living weapon. Zabuza dodged his attacks and blocked others with a kunao he pulled from his hip to counter Kimimaro's razor-sharp bones. Not bad boy. He said as he blocked a spinning assault from Kimimaro who continued to jump and attack without stopping. Zabuza blocked an overhead lunge from Kimimaro who then used the force to flip into the air and drop down with all the weight he could muster into a spinning attack, moving as fast as he could allowing his bones to shoot out of his body like bullets that ripped into the ground. Zabuza jumped back into the air, blocking the assault of bone bullets that were gunning for him before he landed. Not bad. He thought before he quickly ducked as a handful of senbon flew over his head from Haku causing Zabuza to shift his attention to him for a moment. Haku launched in and attacked using his wind style to boost his speed. Something Zabuza noticed right away. Zabuza blocked a 1-2 and leaned back to avoid a jumping roundhouse kick, making it look like he was toying with the boy. Haku quickly landed and attacked with another flurry of punches and kicks that Zabuza swatted away with ease. Hmm, is that all he taught you? Zabuza said mockingly. Haku frowned as he grew serious now and dropped to the ground avoiding a slap from Zabuza. Haku quickly threw a handful of senbon needles to distract him which Zabuza deflected with his kunao. However, Haku had planned for that and finished his hand signs with one hand still free. So you can do that too. Zabuza said seeming impressed. Ice style, 1000 needles of death. Haku said as the moisture in the air froze and formed a large number of ice needles that surrounded Zabuza. Take this. Haku said as the ice needles crashed into Zabuza, impaling him. However, Zabuza's body turned to water and burst. A clone. Haku shouted in surprise. Perhaps I chose the wrong apprentice, Zabuza said seeming disappointed in his abilities as he appeared behind him. Haku's eyes suddenly opened wide in rage as his anger took over him. Zabuza could feel the temperature around him drop before an ice spike started to shoot from the ground. Zabuza jumped high into the air to avoid them almost seeming impressed. He didn't have time to take it easy though as Kimimaro appeared behind him midair, as he opened his arms wide, letting his ribcage shoot from his skin like a steel trap. Zabuza was hit by the jutsu and the boys watched with hopeful eyes as he hit the ground, becoming trapped by the bone cage. Their hope was quickly replaced with panic as Zabuza's body turned into water, showing it was another water clone. Kimimaro did his best to scan the area as his senses were all on high alert, knowing he could appear from anywhere. Now. He shouted as he leaned forwards and let the bones in his back shoot out, trying to impale Zabuza who he thought was behind him. To Kaimimaro's surprise, a hand suddenly gripped his head and slammed his face into the ground. You have some good reflexes kid, Zabuza said before letting go as he felt the boy stop moving. Kimimaro. Haku shouted as he watched from the sidelines, not being able to move fast enough to help his friend. 
Koyoki was back up now and also watched as Kimimaro was slammed face first into the ground. Her body was still hurting from Zabuza's kick but she knew she had to do something to try and stop that monster. Koyoki pulled two handfuls of kunao from her weapon pouch, holding them between each of her fingers as she crossed her arms over her face. This is the last thing my father taught me before he died. I'm not going to be left behind. She shouted as she tossed them all at the ground in front of her before forming hand signs. Her chakra started to flare as the wind picked up around her body before she finished her jutsu. Wind style, violent wind stream. She said as the wind style suddenly picked up all of the kunao and spiraled towards Zabuza, growing faster and faster. He noticed the jutsu coming towards him and smiled, knowing it wasn't a simple one this time. Not bad. He said as he was forced to draw his other sword from his back before the wind style reached him. I'm not done yet. Koyoki shouted as she jumped into the air and threw barrage after barrage of kunao into the wind style turning it into a tornado of razor sharp projectiles with Zabuza at the center. Zabuza deflected all of the kunao that came his way. However, as the number started to increase he was unable to keep up with so many and small cuts started to appear on his body. Zabuza noticed the cuts and clenched his teeth as he growled in anger. This is for Kaga-sensei. Koyoki then shouted as she formed the hand signs for her fireball jutsu, taking as large a breath as she could before unleashing it with a massive roar. The firing style and the wind style suddenly mixed and the tornado of kunao abruptly became engulfed in fire with the heat being so intense that it melted all of the kunao inside of it. Haku watched in amazement at Koyoki's combined jutsu. Not knowing she was so strong. He took his chance and quickly grabbed Kimimaro from the ground before regrouping with Koyoki as they watched her jutsu at work. Kimimaro came back around, thanks to his reinforced skull he had only been knocked out. Did we get him? He asked as he looked at the fire tornado. Suddenly the fire style burst open as if something inside of it had ripped it in half. The flames dispersed and the half-melted kunao fell to the ground before the three genin could see what had happened. Their eyes slowly opened wide in fear as they laid their gaze upon the one who was responsible. Zabuza's demonic aura had burst to life. Its will and force were so strong that it had even extinguished the flames from Koyoki's jutsu before it fixed its attention on all three of them. Zabuza took a step forwards as his demonic aura seemed to almost force the three of them to their knees, its weight being too strong to resist it. He was unharmed but his rage was certainly felt. Zabuza slowly stood up straight and let his demonic bloodlust calm down before he fixed his sight on the three of them. You brats made me get serious for a second there, Zabuza said as he raised his sword, letting it rest on his shoulder but I'm afraid playtime is over. He said growing serious once more. Haku, Koyoki, and Kimimaro all took a defensive stance as they got ready to at least try to defend themselves, not giving up. Zabuza felt the hair on the back of his neck stand up and suddenly turned around, quickly slicing his sword down as hard as he could at Kaga, who had tried to slice him in half with his own large blade. Their blades clashed in the air letting sparks fly before the two locked into a battle of strength, neither of them giving in. Kaga Sensei. All three of the genin shouted as they watched him exchange blows with Zabuza before they broke away and Kaga slid back towards his students. Sensei we thought you were dead. Koyoki said looking happy to see him. I'm sorry I took so long, are you three okay? He asked as he took a good look at them. Yes sensei we are fine, Haku said. Kaga could tell that the three of them had given it their best shot. But he knew how strong Zabuza was before he left the village and he knew the only reason they were still alive was that he was toying with them. It's okay now, leave it to me, Kaga said as he swung his sword and took an offensive stance. Zabuza slowly walked over to his other sword that was still stuck in the ground before he pulled it out. It's been a while, Kaga, Zabuza said as he gave his blades a twirl in his hands. I'm under orders from Lord Mizukage to take you and Zabuza. Dead or alive? He said giving him a warning. If you think I will answer to Funa, you are mistaken. And if you think you can take me alone you are a fool. Zabuza said as he pointed one of his swords at Kaga. Kaga smiled, showing his perfect white teeth. But I'm not alone. He said. Suddenly two Anbuya dressed in Kiri robes appeared and attacked Zabuza from either side with their swords. Zabuza was taken off guard for a second but blocked both of the attacks before the two of them tried to chain another combination attack at him. Not so easy. Zabuza said as he blocked one of their strikes and kicked him in the stomach sending him crashing into the ground. The second Anbu exchanged blows with Zabuza before he was forced to jump back to avoid a killing blow. Fools, Zabuza said as he smiled. If that's how you want to play it, then so be it. Zabuza placed his fingers in his mouth and whistled, 
giving a signal to the rest of his men who had remained hidden until now. Two shadows appeared from the darkness next to Zabuza before the pair threw away their cloak. You called? One of them asked. He had shoulder length, wild dark brown hair and dark eyes. He had a rebreather that covers the lower half of his face and a large, clawed, gauntlet on his left arm. He wore a camouflage suit with bandages around his waist, dark colored, knee-length sandals and several pouches around his waist and his forehead protector had two horns on it. The other also had shoulder length, wild dark brown hair and dark eyes. He to wore a rebreather that covers the lower half of his face and had a large clawed gauntlet on his right arm. He wore a camouflage suit with bandages around his waist, dark colored, knee-length sandals and a ragged black cape. His forehead protector had a single horn on it. Kaga stepped forward and clenched his teeth along with the Anbu who also took a defensive position. The Demon Brothers. Kaga spat, tightening his grip around the hilt of his blade. Look who it is Xu. The one with two horns on his head said. Long time no see, Kaga, Xu said as he flexed his clawed gauntlet. Miaizu, looks like we finally get to finish Kaga off for good this time, Xu said getting a smile from his brother. This isn't time for playing around you two. Zabuza said as he stepped forwards. We kill them all. Zabuza then said, getting serious. Kaga turned to his students and then looked at the two Anbu he was with. There is no way we can take them on without their help. He thought, not liking the idea. Kimimaro. Kaga then said in a serious tone. I am appointing you squad leader and giving you a new mission. He said, not taking his eyes off Zabuza. I and the two Anbu there will need everything we have to have a chance at taking Zabuza down. For us to do that I'm going to need you three to hold the Demon Brothers off, think you can handle that. He said. Kimimaro looked at the two brothers, weighing them in as he looked them up and down. They are both Chunin level Miss Chinobi who specialize in poisonous combination attacks. Do not take them lightly. Kaga said. Kimimaro and the others listened closely before they nodded. Yes sensei, leave it to us. Kimimaro said with both Haku and Koyoki nodding in agreement. Leave Zabuza to us. Kaga then said as he walked over to the Anbu, standing in front of them with his sword pointed at Zabuza. We are taking you down Zabuza. He's still got a big mouth, Miyazu said with a frown. Things won't be the same as last time, Kaga, Xu said getting angry. I want you two to kill the kids. Leave the other three to me. Zabuza said to both of them. The demon brothers didn't object and instead smiled. Leave it to us, Xu said as he looked at his brother. Let's do this, Miyazu said with a wild look in his eye. Now. Kaga and Zabuza shouted at the same time as both teams charged in for the attack. Chapter 56, Chapter 56 Kaga and the two Anbu trackers jumped into battle with Zabuza, who with both blades in his hands clashed against them in a furious whirlwind of steel. You're a traitor to the village, demon. One of the Anbu shouted as he attacked in a wild flurry of clean strikes. Zabuza blocked his attacks one after the other while also blocking Kagas and the other Anubus. Holding all of them back as he dashed backwards using his footwork to evade them. You'll have to do better than that. Zabuza shouted as he decided it was time to go on the counterattack. He quickly moved forward slamming a front kick into one of the Anbu's stomachs, sending him flying back. He then spun around and dropped to his knee as he slashed low with one blade and high with the other attacking both Kaga and the other Anbu at the same time. Kaga was able to block the attack. However, the Anbu was not as Zabuza's blade cut through his leg like a hot knife through butter. Arg! The Anbu howled as he dropped to the ground in pain. Zabuza smiled as he quickly twirled around again, this time ready to finish him. Kaga could see what he was trying to do and raised his large blade into the air before dropping it down next to the Anbu member using all of its weight to slam into the ground. His blade stopped Zabuza's attack and uprooted the ground from the force, knocking Zabuza back. The other Anbu had gotten back to his feet and ran over to his teammate to check his wound. It's bad, he nipped the artery. He said as he applied pressed. He's done for, Zabuza said as he stuck both swords into the ground. And so are you. Hidden Miss Jutsu. He suddenly shouted as he made the hand signs. Kaga clenched his teeth as the mist suddenly burst forth from Zabuza's body and surrounded them. Be on guard. He shouted. Kaga knew all too well that Zabuza was an expert in silent killing using the hidden mist jutsu. In fact, he was one of the best in the whole village at it, being praised and earning himself a serious reputation. This isn't good, Kaga said as he stepped back to back with the Anbu member. Where is he? 
The Anbu said quietly. Kaga tried to focus. But he couldn't see anything, don't make a sound. He then said trying to get the Anbu to be quiet. But it was too late. Zabuza had already located them and suddenly appeared out of the mist right next to them. You're both dead. He shouted as he slashed down with his swords. Meanwhile, Kimimaro and the others had come face to face with the demon brothers, Xu and Miizu. Look at these brats, barely old enough to have graduated the academy, Miizu said with a snarl. I bet you didn't even have to kill anyone to graduate. He then said laughing. Enough talking Miizu, let's kill them and be done with it, Xu said as he prepared his clawed gauntlet. Kimimaro took a defensive stance as he looked over at the demon brothers. He could see that Xu seemed more assertive and stronger, meaning that Miizu would be more arrogant and reckless, being more prone to making mistakes. All right, I'll take the one with the black cloak. You two team up on the other one. If we can keep them apart and stop them from working together we might stand a good chance. Kimimaro said to the others. Haku had already made the same assessment and agreed. Be careful you don't get hit by a poison attack. He then said. Koyoki also nodded. Be careful, these guys look strong. Kimimaro nodded before he bolted towards Xu, heading in for the attack. Well get a load of this runt, Miizu said laughing as he watched Kimimaro charge towards them. He's mine. Miizu shouted as he lowered into an attacking stance. However, a barrage of shuriken and senbon needles flew over Kimimaro's head right towards Miizu, causing him to jump into the air as he blocked a few more with his gauntlet. What they? He shouted as he looked over at Koyoki. Where did the other one go? Haku suddenly appeared behind him and attacked, slashing down with one of his senbon. Miizu turned midair and blocked his attack. I don't think so, kid. He shouted before he grabbed his arm and used his gauntlet to slash into his chest. Kimimaro crossed both hands over his face before jumping into the air and shooting a barrage of bone bullets at Xu. Xu could tell that the projectiles were dangerous and decided to evade them rather than block them. Kimimaro let his bones grow all around his body as he got closer running at a low angle before he curved around and attacked. Xu blocked Kimimaro's attack one after the other, finding that he was being pushed back by the boy's impressive Taijutsu. What is this kid? He thought as Kimimaro slashed and spun in an almost unblockable manner. Don't tell me he's one of those Kagaya freaks. Xu couldn't defend against it and was forced to jump into the air, flipping backwards to gain some well-needed distance after he had suffered a cut on his cheek. This kid is a monster. He said as he watched Kimimaro stand to his full height as he pulled a bone blade from his shoulder. Miizu slashed into Haku's body with the razor-sharp fingers of his steel gauntlet. However, Haku's body turned into ice at the last second. A clone. Miizu said as he landed on the ground, quickly raising his gauntlet to block a few senbon that was aimed for his eyes. You'll have to do better than that kid. He said laughing. Suddenly Koyoki appeared from behind him as she skidded along the floor. How about this? Fire style, fireball jutsu. She shouted as she blasted the jutsu at him. Miizu was about to move out of the way but found that his feet couldn't move. What they? He said as he looked down to see they had been frozen to the ground. Ice. He shouted before crossing his arms over his face to block the fire style. Koyoki watched as her fire style engulfed Miizu, seeming happy with her teamwork with Haku. But suddenly Miizu flew out of the flames heading right towards Koyoki with his gauntlet extended. Did you think you had me? He shouted about to grab her with his steel claws. Haku suddenly appeared next to her and pushed off the ground with his hands, using his legs to kick upward knocking Miizu's arm into the air. Miizu was shocked that Haku was fast enough to counter his attack, as the weight of the gauntlet on his arm pulled him off balance. Now! Haku shouted to Koyoki who quickly tossed a handful of shuriken from her weapon's pouch at him. Miizu tried to use his free hand to block them, but some still got through and stuck into his body causing some damage. Why you? He roared in anger as he reached into his own weapon's pouch. Looks like you leave me no choice. He said before he threw a handful of poison gas pellets onto the ground. Kimimaro was still fighting with Xu, who was using the chain from his gauntlet to keep him at bay, knowing he was a close quarters fighter as he tried to get a little distance from him. Kimimaro wasn't phased as the chain hit him, he had that many bones protruding out of his body that the chain hardly touches him. Kimimaro quickly grabbed it and slammed a bone blade into one of the links, wedging it to the ground, trapping Xu with it. What the? He said as he Kimimaro quickly rushed at him, ready to deliver a killing blow. 
Zhu was forced to release the chain from his gauntlet and quickly spun around, using the full weight of his gauntlet to slam into Kimimaro's body and send him flying back. Kimimaro had been able to block the attack with his bones, making sure to avoid the poisonous fingertips of his weapon. However, it had meant he was unable to land a killing blow. Guess I have no choice, I didn't think we would have to use this on a bunch of kids. He then said, looking over to Xu who he could see was thinking the same thing. Your luck has run out kid. He said as he reached into his weapons pouch and threw poison smoke bombs all over the place, letting them fill the air with a toxic odor. Kimimaro could see the thick purple smoke start to fill the air, and he retreated back, joining the others who had done the same. It's poison. Haku said, seeing it spread into the air. What if we use a wind style? Koyoki then said, having a great idea. That won't work. Xu and Miyazu both said at the same time as they raised their hands to form the signs. Secret technique, poison mist jutsu. They both said, using their chakra to mold the poison gas in the air into a fog that started to spread closer and closer toward them. Wind style, vacuum wave. Haku said as he quickly made the hand signs, unleashing a massive burst of wind from his mouth in an attempt to blow the poison fog away. However, it had no effect as the fog came right back, unaffected by his jutsu. It didn't work. He said as the three of them slowly backed into a corner as the fog grew closer and closer. Xu and Miyazu's voices echoed through the fog as it slowly crept closer to them as if death itself was creeping approaching them. There is nowhere to run now, children. Chapter 57, Chapter 57 You're both finished. Zabuza shouted as he appeared from the mist, raising both of his swords before slicing them down at Kaga and the Anbu. Kaga quickly spun around, getting his own sword there just in the nick of time. However, the Anbu was not as fast as he was, and was cut in half from the demon's strike. Shit! Kaga shouted as the weight of Zabuza's swing forced him back. He could see that the Anbu had been chopped in half, however, the mist soon enveloped his view again, leaving him without sight of anything. This isn't good. He thought as he tried to use all of his other senses to feel for anything. I don't even have my bearings of where the edge of the cliff is. He thought as he slowly backed up. It's no use. Kaga. Zabuza's voice echoed through the mist. You will die here today, along with your brats. He then said, his voice appearing behind Kaga again. Kaga quickly turned and ducked at the same time, slashing his own sword at Zabuza's legs. Zabuza quickly blocked his attack with one sword and slammed the butt of the other into the side of Kaga's head, knocking him to the ground. Fool, did you really think that would work? He said as he stood over him. Kaga could still feel his brain shaking from the blow, but did his best to try and form hand seals. I don't think do. Zabuza said as he kicked Kaga in the face, knocking a few teeth out as Kaga's head rocked back from the force. Blood splattered onto the ground from his mouth before he slowly rolled on his back with a slight groan. Zabuza wasn't done there though as he stabbed one of his swords into his hand, trapping it on the ground. That should stop you from trying to use any ninjutsu. He said as he crouched over one sword still resting on his shoulder. You were never a match for me. He then said, slowly standing back to his feet. Kaga started to laugh even though he looked as if he had been defeated. Zabuza didn't look impressed and pointed the tip of his blade at Kaga's throat. What's so funny? He asked with a serious look in his eye. This is. Kaga said as he showed Zabuza a scroll in his free hand. Zabuza looked a little confused but quickly slashed the scroll in half with his sword dropping it out of Kaga's hand. Just what did you expect to do with that? Zabuza said as he cocked an eyebrow at Kaga. Not what? Who? He said slowly. Getting a shocked reaction from Zabuza who suddenly became enraged. Why you? He said as he pulled his sword back, ready to deliver the final blow. Unexpectedly, ice shot from the ground, trying to encase Zabuza inside of it as it grew more and more. This is... Zabuza shouted as he jumped into the air, doing his best to cut the ice away with his sword before he landed clear of it on the ground. You. He growled as his eyes grew more intense. Meanwhile. Don't breath the fog in. Koyoki shouted as she tried her best to form hand signs. Haku we need to try and get rid of it. She shouted. Haku agreed and the two of them tried to use a combined wind style to blow the fog away. However, it was no use. The poison fog seemed to have a mind of its own and contained to spread no matter how much they pushed it back. It's no use. Kimimaro said as his back reached the cliff wall, knowing there was no escape now. 
Come on, we have to climb. Haku suddenly said, thinking it was their only way out. But the fog had other ideas as it seemed to respond to his words and cut them off from the top, circling them as it got closer and closer. I hope you're ready to die brats. Miyazu's voice echoed through the poison fog. This is the end of the line. Xue's voice also said, letting them know they were done for. The three of them all held onto each other as they pressed their backs against the wall, knowing that there was nothing else they could do now. Suddenly a huge shockwave of wind burst forth and completely blew the poison fog away, saving all three of them and leaving Xu and Miyazu stunned not believing their eyes. How? That can't be right. Miyazu said. There is no way you brats could use such a powerful wind style like that to get rid of our poison mist jutsu. Miyazu roared not understanding. It doesn't matter, let's finish them quickly. Xu shouted, quickly focusing back on his task. Both of the brothers extended their gauntlet arms and let the chain link between them before they rushed towards Kimimaro and the others. Look out! Kimimaro shouted as he took a step forwards and let his bones grow, getting ready to defend his teammates. The demon brothers charged with all their might, roaring as they jumped into the air about to attack. Die! They both shouted as they lifted their clawed gauntlets, dripping with poison. Kimimaro watched in shock as both of the brothers suddenly stopped on the spot, recoiling as if something had pulled them back for a second. What in the... Xu said as he looked down at his feet. Ice. But when did the kid... He thought before the hairs on his neck suddenly stood on end as he sensed a powerful presence come from behind. S. Sensei. Haku and Kimimaro suddenly shouted as their eyes opened wide. Sorry, I'm a little late. But it looks like I got here just in time. Fona said as his blue cloak blew in the wind. Xu and Miyazu both turned around in horror as they saw who it was that stood before them. F. Fona. Xu said not believing his eyes. Miyazu was also stunned for a moment before he growled. No way it's really him. Miyazu shouted as he smashed the ice around his feet and charged at him. No Miyazu don't. Xu tried to warn him. But it was too late. Miyazu charged in and raised his gauntlet, slashing it down at Fona with all his might. Fona frowned and simply raised his arm, letting a shield of bones form that blocked his attack with ease. Miyazu wasn't surprised and quickly spin around attacking again with another swipe. Die. He roared. Fona had grown bored now and decided that he had, had enough of playing around. Fona suddenly stepped to the side and grabbed the chain that was still connected to Miyazu's gauntlet. With a sudden tug of it, Miyazu was twisted into the air before he hit the ground hard, getting the wind knocked from him. Fona raised a single hand and ice suddenly burst around him, trapping him in a pillar that stopped just before his head. Fona looked over to Xu, telling him to surrender with his eyes. However, Xu quickly threw a handful of poison pellets onto the ground before he jumped back and made some hand signs. There is no way I can face him head on, I need to get the hell out of here. He thought before turning around. But to his horror, as he turned he came face to face with his own reflection, before slipping right into the ice mirror that had formed behind him. Xu slipped out and was gripped by Fona who slammed him into the ground with ease before he trapped him in a pillar of ice just like his brother. There. That should keep you from running. Fona said as he shook his head in disappointment at them both. Sensei. Kimimaro and Haku shouted as they suddenly jumped at him, hugging him tightly. Fona couldn't help but smile and hug them both back before putting them onto the ground. Now, now boys. What have I told you about acting professionally? Fona said with a serious face. Both of them looked down a little before getting serious again. Sorry Sensei. Both of them said. That's better. Fona said as he patted them on their heads. Lord Mizu Cage, Koihoki said, bowing her head as she approached him. You don't have to be so formal Koihoki, please Sensei is fine. He said smiling at her before he places a hand on her head. It must have been tough. You did well. He said smiling at her. Koihoki was shocked and couldn't help smile from his praise. I it was nothing, she said a little embarrassed. All right, you three do me a favor and stay here. I have something I need to finish. He suddenly said as he grew serious. The three of them nodded as they watched his body suddenly crumble as it turned to ice showing that he was only a clone. Zabuza growled as he looked at Fona head to toe, flicking his sword as he took a defensive stance. I didn't expect to see you so soon. He said. Fona sighed as he got a look at Kaga and the others. He could already tell that both the Anvia he had sent were dead and Kaga was in bad shape. It's over Zabuza. Surrender or I will be forced to restrain you. 
Zabuza snarled and let his chakra burst forth, allowing the mist to grow thicker and thicker. I would like to see you try. Zabuza said as he disappeared into the mist again, hiding his presence from Fona. Fona shook his head as he placed a hand on it. You really are an idiot. This jutsu won't work on me. He then said with a smile. Ice style. Frozen fog jutsu. He said as he formed a few hand signs and let his own chakra burst to life. Suddenly the mist started to grow cold and froze everything it touched. Zabuza didn't know he could do such a thing and quickly disappeared into the mist, jumping out of it to get away from the frozen death trap Fona had created. Water style, water dragon jutsu. Zabuza shouted as he drew water from a large pool that was set on top of one of the cliff sides. Fona watched as the water dragon roared to life and took aim at him, flying over towards him with tremendous weight and power. Hmm. He said as he extended just one hand. The water dragon crashed into Fona, however, to Zabuza's surprise. The water dragon simply split in half around him, freezing at a rapid rate before it crashed onto the ground harmlessly. You will have to do better than that, demon of the mist. He then said mockingly. Zabuza already knew that he was no match for Fona. From his vantage point, he could also see that Xu and Miizu had been defeated, knowing his only chance was to escape now. It's over Zabuza. Return to the village and I will forget all of this. Fona said offering him a chance. Zabuza cocked an eyebrow not looking impressed. And live under your rule. I don't think so. He said as he turned his back. Don't follow me. If you do, you'll have to kill me. He said, taking one last look at him over his shoulder before he disappeared. Fona sighed as he placed his hands on his hips, deciding not to give chase. After all, Kaga needed medical attention first. Another time then, Zabuza. He said under his breath as he turned around to help deal with the aftermath. Fona was quick to work and got Kaga back to the village hospital so he could be healed at once. He also turned Xu and Miizu into the trackers to have them put in person, where they would be felt with. Fona finally escorted Kimimaro and the others back to the mansion to report their mission complete to Lord Van, who was most pleased to meet the Mizu cage himself, and even more pleased to learn that all of the bandits were gone, meaning he could conduct trade freely again. All was well and the four of them returned to the village where Fona finished the paperwork and bid goodbye to Koyuki, who returned home by herself. Now only Fona, Haku, and Kimimaro were left alone as Fona finished the last thing he needed to do that day. Of course, A had told him off for leaving the village alone, but Fona laughed it off, saying he thought being Mizu Cage he could do whatever he wanted. Soon A took his leave and Fona decided it was time for the three of them to head home too. Ah, that's right. There is something I need to tell you, boys, before we head home. Just a little change is all. He said as he rubbed the back of his head. Kimimaro and Haku looked at him strangely as they waited for him to explain. We will be having someone else stay with us for quite a while, in fact maybe forever. He said. Haku and Kimimaro looked at each other and then back to their sensei. What is it sensei, is it bad? Haku asked. No. Haha, no it's not bad Haku, it's just. Well, let's just say there is going to be another woman living in the house with us from now on. He said as he rubbed the back of his head still not sure how to explain it to them. The boys looked at him confused and Fona just laughed. Don't worry, you will understand when you're a little older. He said. Both of them nodded and he created an ice mirror for them to walk through, taking them right back to their house. We're home. He shouted after a moment. Oh welcome home. A voice said coming from the kitchen. Swiren walked out from the kitchen to greet them and smiled at Fona and the boys. Oh, boys. How was your first mission? She said excitedly. Welcome home. Another voice said as footsteps could be heard coming from down the stairs. Both of the boys looked surprised to see Mei standing there with a large smile on her face as she greeted them. Hello again boys, do you remember me? She asked with a smile on her face. Kimimaro and Haku were shocked to see her but nodded as they smiled at her. Well how about we get dinner started? Both Swiren and Mei said together before they grabbed one of Fona's arms each. Fona simply smiled innocently as he looked at the boys. Now, now ladies, we don't want to give them the wrong impression. He said. Haku smiled and Kimimaro did also as both of them nodded their heads, already knowing what was going on. Yes please, they said excitedly, trying to save him. All right then, let's eat. Fona said as he slipped out of their grasp. W8 Fona. 
Both May and Swiran shouted as they chased after him. Quick boys, to the table. He said playing with them before all of them entered the kitchen laughing happily together as a family. Chapter 58, Naruto Chapter 58 Akatsuki theme song playing in the background. You're saying he knew your plan all along. Zetsu said, looking at Obito. I'm not sure. B he knows who I am. Obito replied as he sat atop the tallest tower in the hidden rain. What are we going to do about him? Zetsu asked. For now, nothing. Our goal to collect the Tails Beasts isn't ready yet. Besides, I'm not sure if I could beat him at the moment. Obito said as he placed a hand onto his mask. Zetsu gave him a strange look, realizing how strong he must be if Obito was saying that. We will follow along according to plan, once we are ready, he will be captured like the others, Obito said before he turned to look at Zetsu. Besides, there are others who are within our control. He said as his Sharingan glowed sinisterly amidst the lightning that crackled from the sky. Waaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
they would not be the only squad he would send to the leaf, but he was excited to see how far they would go in the exam, being sure they would do him proud. Fona had, however, started to notice that Kimimaro had been starting to lag behind in his training a little, and had developed a small cough. Kimimaro did his best to try not to let it bother him, but Fona knew better. He remembered that Kimimaro had become terminally ill in the manga and had even died from the unknown illness. With that knowledge, Fona had decided to have the chief medical ninja look at the boy to see if anything could be done. However, the doctor was shocked and admitted he had not seen anything like this before, saying it could be something to do with his abilities and unique physiology that was different to normal people. Of course, Fona had questioned it and even had the doctor examine him too, hoping that because they shared the same ability he would discover a cure. But the doctor had no luck saying he didn't think there would be anyone in the world who would be able to do anything about it. Fona asked him how long he had and the doctor gave him a grim look. With the rate his illness is spreading throughout his body, I would say he has two years at most before he will lose the ability to move. After that, death will follow. Fona slowed zoned back into reality as he stared at his reflection in his office window, remembering the words of the doctor. That had been four months ago, and only two months now remained until the Chunin exam. Kimimaro had become increasingly worse and had even started coughing up blood if he pushed his body too hard, causing Fona to stop his training altogether. Everyone was worried about him, yet the boy always had a smile on his face, accepting his fate and always saying that he was simply happy that he could be with Fona and his family. A few more days had passed and Fona had found the time to be set at home, relaxing with Mei and Swiren as they watched Kimimaro play with the babies. He was such a gentle child and had so much potential. The very thought that he would die from this illness made Fona's blood boil. Suddenly a knock came at the door and May got up to go AMD answer it. Who could that be at this time? She said as she answered the door. Kagetsu Hojiki bowed his head to May before he greeted her. I'm sorry to bother you Lady May, but I need to speak to Lord Mizu Cage. Kagetsu was Mangetsu's cousin and next in line to the Hojiki clan head, having served as one of Fona's personal anbu for two years now, showing great skill. What's the matter Kagetsu? Fona asked, sensing his urgency. Forgive my intrusion my lord, but we have located the three tails. He said bowing as he saw Fona. You found it. He said surprised. Ever since he had killed the fourth Mizu cage, the three-tailed beasts had not been seen. So it has finally resurrected, Fona said to himself as he crossed his arms. Where was it last seen? He then asked. It was spotted off the border to the land of lighting my lord. He said replying. Dispatch a squad to contain it at once, I will go myself. He announced. No. I don't think so. May suddenly said as she poked him in the chest. That's right Fona. It's daddy daughter day at work tomorrow and you promised to take a Sammy with you. Swiren also said. Kagetsu seemed a little surprised but doesn't dare say anything in case they turned on him too. I will lead this mission dear, you spend time with your daughter. May suddenly said as she stroked his chin. Fona didn't like the idea but knew he had no choice. After all, what the wives said usually went. All right, May, I'm counting on you to retrieve the three tails. He said. May smiled. Don't you worry about me. She said as she gave him a playful wink. Fona couldn't help but smile before Swiren also came over and linked her arm through Fona's. Are you sure May? She asked sounding worried. Yes besides it will be good to get back into the field. She then said smiling. All right. But I want you to take a, Kagetsu here and Ganri. Fona said. Understood, May said. Say goodbye to mummy, Swiren said as she picked Cho up off the floor, handing him to May. You be a good boy for your daddy and Swiren. She said as she squeezed his cheeks before blowing kisses on his tummy and handing him back to Fona. Be safe May, Fona said as he looked into her eyes. I will be. She said before she leaned in and kissed him on the lips. Swiren also nodded and wished May good luck. After all, the three of them had developed into a three-way relationship and all been married. Each of them caring about one another, something Fona had never thought possible. Let's go. May then said as she got serious. Kagetsu nodded and followed her as they took their leave. I hope everything goes all right, Swiren said as she watched them go. Me too. I have a bad feeling about this. Fona said as he held Chito in his arms. Kimimaro was sat on the floor still playing with Asami, but he could tell that Fona was worried and he looked at Haku. Haku could also feel the tension from where he was sat, and both of them looked at each other giving a nod. 
don't even think about it you two. Fona suddenly said as he turned to them. Both of the boys froze on the spot before slowly turning around to look at him. This isn't something you can handle. Who are to stay here in the village until I say so, you got that? He said giving them a stern look. Kimimaro and Haku nodded sheepishly. Yes sir. Good. He said before he put Chito on the floor, who crawled over to Kimimaro and punched him in the face with his chubby hands. That's my boy. He said before all of them laughed together. However, the laugh was soon brought to a halt as Kimimaro started to cough. He used his hand to cover his mouth and then looked to see it had more blood on it. Swiran had a worried look and rushed over to him to hug him tightly. It's okay Kimimaro. She said trying to comfort him. Fona grits his teeth before he took knelt down to the boy looking him in his eyes. I promise I won't let you die Kimimaro. He said before placing his hand on the boy's head. Kimimaro simply smiled as he always did. It's okay. I accept my fate. Kimimaro said without a hint of sadness. Don't say that, Swiran said as she looked at him with tears almost coming to her eyes. Haku was also sad as he looked down at the floor, feeling angry about the whole thing. After all, Kimimaro was like his brother and he too felt powerless that he couldn't help him. There is still one thing I need to try, Fona said quietly before he stood up, getting the other's attention. Something I didn't think would be possible until now. He then said. Swiran gave him a puzzled look before she too stood up. What are you talking about Fona? She asked. Give me a little time Swiran. I need to make sure it will work first. He then said. Swiran nodded as she watched Fona take Kimimaro by the shoulder. I hope the cold doesn't bother you too much Kimimaro. He then said as he smiled at him. Kimimaro gave him a questioning look. All right, we will be back soon, Fona said as he raised his hand to create an ice mirror. Where are you going? Swiran asked not sure what was going on. Don't worry, I just need to have one last person look at him. Well, I say person, but I mean Yeti. He then said with a smile. With that Fona took Kimimaro and stepped into the mirror before it melted to the floor leaving a small puddle of water that both Shito and Asami started to splash in. Oh no. I just bathed both of you. She shouted as she ran over to them to get them out of the water. Haku smiled as he watched them go and then looked at the babies. I hope he can save him. He muttered under his breath softly as he looked where the ice mirror had been. Chapter 59, Chapter 59 Kimimaro stepped out of the ice mirror with Fona, finding himself surrounded by snow and mountains. Where are we? He asked, not having a clue where they were. Fona smiled as he placed his hand on his shoulder. I want you to meet someone. He said, looking forwards towards a large temple that had two large horned yeti standing guard at its gate. Is that little Fona? M. Fubuki said as he grew excited spotting him in the distance. Well, well, long time no see. Kree also shouted with a smile. Fona smiled as he greeted the large yeti. It's good to see you both again, allow me to introduce Kimimaro here. He then said. Kimimaro bowed to the large yeti as they looked down at him. The boy had never seen anything like it and couldn't help feeling amazed at their size and strength. So he your apprentice or something. I didn't take you for the type to teach. Kree said. Fona laughed. A lot has happened since we last met. The Yeti also nodded. So what is it you want Fona, are you here to see the master? M. Fubuki said. Fona nodded. Yes, I'm afraid he might be the only one who can help me. He said, looking at Kimimaro with a worried glimmer. Kree could smell a sickness coming from the boy and understood the expression on his face. All right, I'm sure he will be happy to see you. The large Yeti then said as he turned to the gate, giving his brother a nod. You ready brother? Kree shouted. Always. M. Fubuki said as he cracked his knuckles. It's all right you two, I've got it this time, Fona said smiling, getting both of the Yeti to stand back from the large doors. Fona took a breath as he remained perfectly still, becoming one with nature and absorbing all of the natural energy around him. After only a moment, Fona placed his hand on the door, opening his eyes before he pushed the door open with ease. Show off. Kree said, knowing how heavy the door was. It opened with ease and Fona let the natural energy dissipate from his body, giving Kimimaro a nod to follow him inside. Kimimaro had to let his eyes adjust to the dark once they entered inside. However, after a moment the torches that surrounded the large hall ignited providing plenty of light. Is that you little Yuki? An old voice said, 
coming from the far end of the hall. Kimimaro looked over to see an old and small yeti sitting on a large throne, before he hopped down, using his walking stick to help him. Lord Hikitsu, it's been a while. Fona said smiling at the old yeti. Suddenly the yeti dropped his cane and charged at Fona, attacking him with a flurry of punches. Kimimaro was shocked and couldn't even react fast enough to do anything about it. However, Fona blocked them all without complaint and the old yeti flipped back into the air before landing on the ground with surprising dexterity. Hmm, I see you haven't gone soft then, Hikitsu said with a toothy grin. Fona also smiled. Same as always. He said remembering the first time he met the old geezer all those years ago. So are you just popping in for a visit, or have you a reason for coming to see me, little Yuki? Kimimaro was confused as to what was going on and was surprised to hear the old yeti call his master little Yuki. I have Lord Hikitsu. I need your advice. He then said. Hikitsu looked at Kimimaro, already having sensed the illness that lay inside of the boy. He's sick, Hikitsu said. Sick with the Kagaya curse. He then said as he tapped his walking stick on the floor, getting closer to him. Kimimaro was a little surprised as Hikitsu got closer to him, staring with his crystal blue eyes into his very soul. He doesn't have long. The old yeti then said as he turned to look at Fona. You have seen it before. Fona asked. Hikitsu sighed as he took a couple of steps over to Fona before climbing up onto his shoulder, resting on it. I'm afraid so little Yuki. He said. Is there anything we can do Lord Hikitsu? He asked. Hikitsu could tell that Fona cared for the child, sighing as he tried to think. The sickness is called a curse for a reason laddie. The Kagaya clan are direct descendants of Princess Kagaya herself, an evil tyrant and the mother of all chakra. He said. The Kagaya clan inherited only a fraction of her power in the form of a Kekiai Genkai. One of which you possess yourself. Hikitsu went on to explain. Although the Kekiai Genkai is only an incomplete version of what she could do, it is still a powerful and dangerous ability. One that comes with a price. Fona listened carefully. Remembering all too well that Kagaya's all-killing ash bone was insanely OP. Due to their ability that has been inherited from such a being, most that are born with it tend to die at an early age. Their body is simply not compatible with the Kekiai Genkai. Something I was worried might happen to you little Yuki. The old yeti said. What do you mean not compatible though Lord Hikitsu? A Kekiai Genkai is passed through blood and DNA only. Surely one's own ability can't make them sick. Fona asked a little confused. The human body is simply not capable of keeping up with such a high demanding ability like that. The constant use of it over time causes the cells in one's body to age faster, forcing one's own body to produce osteoblasts over and over again using an unnatural amount of chakra, causing the cells in the body to multiply faster. Hikitsu explained in surprising detail. Fona understood what he meant. Knowing that the more Kimimaro used his ability, the faster his body would die of old age from the inside out. But why haven't I been affected by this illness? Fona asked. Hikitsu shook his head. I asked myself that same question years ago. But I have come to believe that either you are a special case, or the chakra you have from the six tails is enough to ward off the illness, keeping your body from dying. He said. Fona thought about it, not remembering ever feeling ill from using his ability. He was also older than Kimimaro was now before Saiken was sealed inside of him and had never experienced anything like that. He also remembered Tachi, who had been another user of the Kekiai Genkai. He was well in his thirties and had shown no signs of any illness. Hikitsu sighed. In that case, it must mean that the boy's body is simply not compatible with the ability. Kimimaro didn't really understand the whole conversation. But he knew what the last part meant. Fona turned to look at Kimimaro, seeing that he still had a smile on his face despite everything. It's not over yet. I still have one last thing to try. Fona thought. Saiken, did you hear that? He said to the six tails. I did. But I'm not sure if what you're thinking would work. Saiken said. Although I am sealed inside of you and our chakra has become one, I never sensed that kind of sickness coming from your body. The six tails said. So you don't think that if I sealed the three tails inside of him, its chakra would help to stop the sickness and help heal him? Fona asked. It's not that I don't think. I don't know. However, Sealing such a huge mass of chakra into the boy's body could perhaps help prevent his cells from aging at such a rapid rate. But again I'm not entirely sure, Fona. 
It can take years for a tailed beast's chakra to mix with its Jinhura key as you know. Fona nodded. We have to try. I can't just let him die. Fona said, snapping back into the real world. All right, we don't have much time to lose then. He said, looking at Kimimaro. What are you scheming little Yuki? Hikitsu said with a grin, knowing his student all too well. It's not going to be easy. He said as he knelt down to look Kimimaro in the eyes. And it will bring a lot of hardship over the years, but if it saves your life, I am willing to try if you are. He said as he placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. You will become the next vessel for the three tails. He then said, getting a surprised look from the old yeti. So you intend to seal the tailed beast into the lat in hopes that its large chakra will help to negate the effects of the boy's keki i genkai. Hikitsu said with a grin. Fona nodded. This is your choice though Kimimaro if you don't want to, you don't have to. Kimimaro looked at the ground before looking back into Fona's eyes. I will do it, master. I won't fail you. He said with a burning determination that even Hikitsu admired. So be it, Fona said as he stood to his full height. We don't have any time to lose then. He said. Hikitsu hopped down from his shoulder back onto the ground. I wish you luck little Yuki, if the boy survives why not bring him back for some training. He then said with a glint in his eye. I can already see the potential in this one. He then said with a toothy smile. Fona also smirked. In due time Lord Hikitsu. There is also another I want you to meet, just as gifted as this one and more suited to the clan's ability. Hikitsu smiled. Is that so? How interesting. He said knowing Fona was talking about another Yuki clan member. When the time is right I will bring them to you, but until then, leave it to me, Fona said. Hikitsu nodded. Until then little Yuki. All right, it's time to get going. Fona then said as he created an ice mirror, looking to Kimimaro. Farewell Lord Hikitsu, be seeing you soon, Fona then said with a grin. Be seeing you, little Yuki. He said, watching as Fona and Kimimaro walked into the ice mirror, leaving the old yeti alone. Chapter 60, Naruto Chapter 60 Mei and her squad, consisting of herself, Ao, Ganri, Kagetsu and a handful of Anbu, headed out towards where the three tails had been sighted. The report had been given by scouts who were based in the Land of Frost, along the border of the Land of Lightning. They had seen the three tails and had sent word of its sighting at once. May was a little worried that the three tails was so close to the Land of Lightning, and could only hope that the wreckage would stay out of their way while they tried to recapture it. The group were traveling across the sea by boat in order to conserve their chakra in case the three tails put up a fight. Once they got close enough to the Land of Frost, the unit made the rest of the way on foot, running across the water at great speed. The scouts could see them approaching via the sea and lit a small signal flare, alerting them to their location. Over there, A said having been the first to see it. Let's move, May said, getting them to pick up the pace. May and her unit arrived at the Anbu scouts camp, seeing that there were only three of them. Report, May asked not even bothering to greet them. Of course. The three tails has been sighted off the coast, heading further and further towards the land of lightning. We have been doing our best to follow it. However, once submerged it is hard to keep track of. The Anbu member said. May nodded and turned to A. On it. He said as he activated his Buyuakugan. A scouted the area, looking around for miles and going as far underwater as he could to try and locate the beast. I've got it. It's about 20 miles northeast, currently submerged at least 100 meters underwater. He said. We will need some way to draw it out, May said trying to think. Kagetsu stepped forwards. I can swim down that far without an issue and perhaps draw it out. He said. The others looked at him and nodded, remembering that he was a Hazuki clan member and could merge himself with the water. Very well, but be careful and do not engage, May said. This could get a little tricky, Ganri said. How are we supposed to stop the thing from just diving back underwater? He asked. We can't. May said. All we can do is try to subdue the beast and seal it once we have the chance. She said. The others understood, nodding. Right, let's move out. She then said with a wave of her arm. Everyone quickly headed off towards the location, following A as he led the way. They did their best to remain on the coastline, now entering the land of lightning they could only hope that the rakage didn't get word of their presence. However. Inside the rakage's mansion. Lord rakage. 
a cloud shinobi shouted as he burst into his office and knelt down before him. The fourth Reikage, A, was sitting on his couch with his legs spread as he tried to relax, with both of his bodyguards on either side of him. He had dark skin with a large muscular build, white hair that was combed back and a small mustache and goatee on his face. What is it? He said, looking at the shinobi with a hard glare. My lord, the three-tailed beast has been sighted off of our coast. He said. The rakage raised an eyebrow at the information. The three tails? Doesn't that belong to the mist? One of the rakage's bodyguards, C said. And why is it swimming along our coastline? The other bodyguard, Darui, asked. A unit of mist shinobi have been reported to have entered our land in pursuit of it, my lord. The shinobi then added. What? The rakage shouted as he stood to his feet. So the new Mizu Cage thinks he can send people to my land without asking. He's been Mizu Cage for five minutes and he's all right pulling a stunt like this. He shouted in a rage. My lord, what should we do about this? His young and pretty advisor asked as she stepped forwards. We're going to show them what happens when you trespass on the land of lightning. Summon B at once. May and the others had been running for a while now, having finally caught up to the three tails who had seemed to stop moving for the time being. All right. We're close, A said still using his Buyuakugan. The others nodded as they continued to follow him. So far they had managed to stick to the coastline and now found themselves running along a large beach surrounded by cliff sides as it overlooked the sea. A stopped and pointed over to the water. It's 200 meters in that direction and is still 100 meters below the water. He said. All right Kagetsu, you're up, May said. Kagetsu nodded and started to walk forwards when A suddenly turned around. Look out! He shouted getting everyone's attention. Mei was quick to react and summoned a water wall to protect them all from a rain of shuriken and kunao. The metal projectiles bounced off the water wall and Mei released the jutsu once there was no longer a threat, looking up to where the attack had come from. Oh no! She said as she saw who was responsible. The rakage stoop atop the cliff, overlooking the beach as he stared daggers at Mei and the others. He was surrounded by a group of his own shinobi along with Killer B. C who was one of his high-ranking bodyguards and a younger shinobi, Darui. May and the others recognized Killer B and C as elite shinobi right away, and once she got a glimpse of the black tattoo on Darui's shoulder she knew he was no pushover, knowing that things were not looking good for them at all. That was your only warning Mist Ninja. Leave the land of lightning now or die. The rakage shouted. A could see that they were surrounded with his Buyuakugan. This isn't looking good. He said. May and the others could also feel the weight of the situation and didn't know what they could do. Lord Rakage, May said as she slowly stepped forwards. We are only here to reclaim what is ours, we have no quarrel with you. She said, trying to talk to him. Your Mizu Cage thinks he can just send troops into my nation to do whatever they please. I don't think so. He roared. Now leave. Before I change my mind. He said looking serious. We don't have a choice May. We don't stand a chance, A said. May grit her teeth knowing he was right, but at the same time knew she couldn't just give up on capturing the three tails. Lord Rakage, I besieged that you hear me out, perhaps we can come to an understanding, May said. The Rakage grit his teeth now, becoming angry. Hold your tongue. The time for negotiations is long gone. He shouted. If you are not prepared to leave, then we will make you. He shouted giving the signal to his men. A group of Cloud Anbu started to sail down the cliffside with C and Derui leading the charge, surrounded Mei and the others. The group's size seemed to be the same as the unit of Miss Shinobi, meaning they had just as many Anbu as Mei had. Ganri drew his sword along with Kagetsu. This isn't a bad way to die, at least I get to take some cloud scum with me, Ganri said somehow smiling at the situation before him. A didn't like the fact that both the Rakage and Killer B were simply standing at the top of the cliff just watching and it made him feel nervous feeling that the two leaders were very strong. Yo bro, why do we want the three tails anyway, oh hey? B asked as he rapped. A crossed his arms as he looked down at May and the others. If we add another tailed beast to our ranks, our military might will far outweigh that of the other villages, it's a perfect opportunity. He said, realizing someone was missing from his party. Where is Yujito? He then asked B. B nodded suddenly taking out a notepad and pencil as he started to write something down, making it look as if he was ignoring him. B. I told you to bring Yujito as well. The rakage shouted at him. B 
Bi suddenly flinched as his brother shouted at him. Calm down, ya fool, Yujito hasn't finished her training, ya see. She an it ready. He said rapping. A sighed and slapped his head at Bi's words before he turned back to the others. Attack. The rakage suddenly said as he waved his hand, giving his men permission to engage. Mei and the others quickly took a defensive stance, getting ready to defend themselves at all costs while the cloud drew their weapons, getting ready to attack. You know it would be far easier to just surrender and leave, Darui said as he slowly drew his sword. That's not going to happen, you will pay for disrespecting Lord Rakage. C then said, appearing to be the more serious one of the two. A had already assessed their battle strength and deemed that Darui was the stronger of the two, also noting his black lightning tattoo. Knowing that only the third Rakage could use that technique. Watch out, this one is strong. He said, letting the others know. A had already determined who would be better suited for a matchup, telling Kagetsu to stay clear of him due to his weakness to lightning release. Ganri and Kagetsu, you take the blonde one. May, you should take the black lightning kid while I provide support between the two. A said having already come up with a strategy. The others agreed and took their battle positions, getting ready to do battle. Attack. C suddenly shouted as he and his men launched in on the offensive. May and the others quickly went to work using A.S. strategy to try and gain an advantage as each of them attacked who they had planned to while the group of Anbu dealt with the other group of Anbu, clashing with their swords and unleashing Jutsu. Kagetsu and Ganri charged at C, who was lucky to be backed up by some Anbu as they clashed against them. C drew a small blade from his back and blocked Ganri's attack, the two of them exchanging a few blows before Ganri pushed him back, clearly being more skilled than him. C retreated by jumping and flipping in the air while Ganri gave chase, slashing and attacking him when he could. Kagetsu took on two Anbu-level shinobi, using his large sword to block one of their attacks while the other slashed their kunao into his body, thinking he had landed a killing blow. I don't think so. Kagetsu shouted as the attack passed right through his body as it turned to liquid, surprising the Anbu members. Kagetsu smashed a kick into the guy's stomach with enough force to send him flying while turning around to the other one and grabbing him by the throat. W what the hell? He said not knowing what had just happened. Kagetsu let water from his hand flow around the Anbu's head, trapping him in a water bubble so he couldn't breathe. You can stay in that for a while. He said with a smile on his face as he dropped him to the floor, letting him wriggle. Why you? Release him. Another Anbu shouted as he jumped back to attack Kagetsu. If Taijutsu won't work then try this, lightning style. He shouted as he threw a handful of lightning style enhanced shuriken at Kagetsu. Kagetsu was quick to dodge them and fired a high-pressure water bullet from the tip of his finger, taking the man by surprise. A was currently busy with battling against other cloud shinobi alongside his own tracker ninja. Using his Byuakugan he could see almost a full 360 degrees and was able to counter all incoming attacks, as well as coordinate his tracker ninja to attack and defend too. A turned around quickly and blocked a flurry of slashes from a cloud ninja, before he countered with his own slash cutting the man across his waist and dropping him to the floor. Again more and more Anbu Cloud Ninja headed his way, each attacking him trying to take him down. A was too skilled of a shinobi to be taken out by the lower level Cloud Ninja and was able to cut them down one after the other with the help of his own men, all of them fighting in a well-tuned system together. So are we really gonna do this? Darui asked, looking as if he couldn't be bothered. May smiled, placing her finger over her lip. Little boy you have no idea what you're getting into. She said. Darui couldn't help think she was probably right as he looked her over. Well, orders are orders. He said taking his sword before he ran at her. Such a shame to melt a handsome youth, but I already have my man. She said as she made a few hand signs. Lava style, melting apparition jutsu. She said before she spat out a wave of lava from her mouth. Darui was shocked as the lava came flying at him. Water style water wall. He said as he fired a blast of water from his mouth, protecting himself from the lava. May smiled though as the lava style cooled rapidly, turning into solid rock before it fell towards him. Earth style, spike pillar jutsu. She said as she formed more signs and hit her hands on the ground. Duryui could see the earth around him suddenly change and form a large spike that launched right at him. Quickly he jumped into the air to avoid being impaled by the earth style but now he had larger things to worry about as another wave of lava style hovered over him, threatening to engulf him. Shit. He said before the lava covered him and crashed to the ground. May wasn't stupid though as she quickly ducked, 
falling forwards into a handspring as she dodged his slash. She could tell it was a clone. He thought as he watched her flip across the sand before throwing a handful of shuriken at him as a distraction. Darui used his large sword to block the projectiles before he tossed it at her, using it as a distraction too while he made some quick hand signs. Gale style, laser circus. He said as a halo of light suddenly appeared around his hands, firing a large number of what looked like laser beams at Mei. Mei was confused and had never seen such a technique before, quickly throwing up an earth-style wall to protect herself. That won't work, Darui said as he suddenly altered the path of the beams, having them change course and move around the wall to attack Mei from all angles. The beams hit Mei but her body turned into a water clone before she reappeared behind Darui. Water style, water dragon jutsu. She shouted as she gathered a huge amount of water from the ocean behind her. The water dragon roared to life and charged at Derui as it opened its large jaws. Now lightning style, lightning dragon. She then said as she added a huge amount of lightning style chakra to her water dragon, enhancing it with deadly power. Derui was impressed and knew if that jutsu hit him, it was all over. Looks like I've got no choice. Lightning style black panther. He shouted as he made the hand signs. Suddenly a huge lighting storm erupted around him, taking the form of a huge black panther before it crashed into her water dragon. Two jutsu clashed in the air in a dramatic battle of titans. However, Mei's combined water and lightning style was no match for the must stronger black lightning and burst before his black lightning hit Mei directly. Ah! Uh -huh. Mei screamed as the black lightning zapped her before she fell to the ground. Darui knew it was a direct hit and not a clone, walking over to pick his sword up before heading over to Mei. Do you surrender now? He asked, placing his sword onto his shoulder. Mei was breathing heavily but pulled herself back onto her feet regardless of her injuries. It's not over yet. She said, causing Derui to sigh. Mei could see they were far enough away from the others now, meaning she could finally unleash her ultimate weapon. You're strong, I'll give you that, Mei said smiling. But I have one final trick up my sleeve. She said making the hand signs. Derui didn't know what she was planning, but he didn't like it and charged in to stop her. Vapor-style solid fog jutsu. Mei said as she unleashed her acid mist from her mouth. Derui was able to stop in time, using his sword to shield his body from the initial assault of the fog she had unleashed. To his shock, his sword had half melted and he could feel his skin start to burn too. What the hell is this? He asked, seeing that everything caught in the fog was starting to melt. Some kind of acid. He said knowing he didn't have long and had to escape if he wanted to survive. There is no escape from this jutsu, Mei said with a smile on her face. Derui could even feel it affect his lungs as he had breathed a little of it in, knowing that she was right. Oh crap, is this really the end? He thought as he dropped to his knee, feeling his skin start to melt. It's over. Mei said, watching as he was about to become toast. Suddenly a huge octopus tentacle wrapped around his waist and pulled him clear from the mist, leaving only Mei standing in it. Killer B had just saved Derui's life, pulling him to safety before letting go of him. Damn that board be hot, but that smoke be hotter. Ya yeah, fool. He said as he could see even his eight tail tentacle had been burnt. A, watched and noted that her jutsu was indeed impressive, realizing who she was now. B, Derui. Stay here, I will deal with her myself. The rakage said before he jumped from the cliff. Mei watched as the rakage landed in the sand with a large bang, superhero style. Standing to his feet slowly before he looked her in the eyes. That's some impressive jutsu you have. But will it be able to melt me fast enough before I kill you? He said, activating his lightning style cloak, causing Mei to question that herself. Meanwhile. Si was struggling in his battle with Ganri, and now that Kagetsu had joined in the battle, he didn't stand a chance. Ganri slashed down with his sword while Kagetsu slashed from the side, both of them attacking in combination. C couldn't defend against the attack and instead jumped into the air in an attempt to escape. I can't fight both of them at once. He said quickly forming hand signs as the two of them charged at him midair. Lightning style, lightning illusion flash of the lightning pillar. He shouted as his body suddenly became as bright as the sun, blinding Ganti and Kagetsu. Ah! Uh, my eyes! Kagetsu shouted as he dropped back to the ground. Ganri felt the same way as the intense light was too much for them. As their vision returned each of them could see C standing there as he prepared another jutsu. I don't think so. They both shouted as they charged in and went for the kill. 
C stood from the sidelines as he watched his Genjutsu's handiwork in action. Ganri and Kagetsu had in fact attacked each other, both thinking the other was C. Luckily, Ganri had been faster than Kagetsu and landed the first strike, casing Kagetsu's attack to miss by an inch. Kagetsu snapped out of it to see that Ganri's sword was stuck inside of him, thankfully his liquid body made sure his sword did not affect him. What the hell? He said in surprise. Ganri was also shocked to see that he had attacked Kagetsu, realizing it had been a genjutsu. You sneaky bastard, Ganri said as he pulled his sword out of Kagetsu, turning to look at C. C was shocked that his plan hadn't worked, not knowing that Kagetsu was immune to physical attacks. Not good. He thought as he took a defensive stance. Kagetsu stabbed his sword into the ground and started to form hand signs. This will teach you. Water style, water shockwave. He shouted as he suddenly started to spew a large amount of water from his mouth, creating a large wave that was heading right towards sea. Ganri jumped up and landed on the water, using his chakra to run along with without any problem. Water style, water dragon. He shouted as he formed his own hand signs. A large water dragon burst out of the mass of water Kagetsu had just created and hit C, who had jumped into the air to avoid the wave, dragging him under the water. C gasped as he was dragged under by the force of the attack, feeling helpless as he tried to swim to the surface. Kagetsu had other plans though as he suddenly appeared and grabbed C, pulling him back under. I don't think so. He said into C's ear, keeping him submerged. C could feel he was running out of breath and didn't have long left, wondering how he would survive this one. Suddenly eight swords covered in lightning style burst into the water and electrocuted both C and Kagetsu, causing the water bubble to burst and release them both. C dropped to the ground and took a huge gulp of air, although, in pain from the electricity, he was glad to be on dry land again. Kagetsu had suffered from the lightning style and was led on the floor trying to get his body working again, the lightning style still flowing through his body. Get a hold of yourself, Ganri said as he helped him up, seeing who had come to save his friend. Killer B walked over towards C, writing something in his notebook before he looked down at him and put it away. Yo yo, C. I see you needed some help, ya fool. He said in his rap style of talking. C looked at him and slowly gave him a thumbs up. Thank you Lord B. He said shaking a little. Ya fool. Killer B said as he slapped his head. Leave these losers to me. C nodded and slowly got up, trying to get out of his way. Ganri could see he was trying to flee and didn't like it. Where do you think you're going? He shouted as he suddenly burst forwards with his sword raised. C looked in horror as Ganner was about to cut him in half, but suddenly Killer B intercepted him and blocked his attack with two of his swords, pushing him back. You're fighting me. The Killer B, ya fool, ya fool. B said as he suddenly kicked up all eight of his blades, catching them between his limbs. Ganri was beyond shocked to see he was going to use eight blades at once and took a defensive stance. I'm going to need your help with this one, Kagetsu. He said. Kagetsu nodded as he had finally recovered and took a position next to him. Yet. Yeah. This isn't looking good. Chapter 61, Naruto Chapter 61 May could only watch as the rakage activated his lightning-style chakra cloak, letting his power explode in an instant. Not good. She said as she raised her hands in the air. Hidden mist jutsu. She said, letting her chakra burst into the air, creating a thick mist to hide her presence from the rakage. The rakage snarled a little as the mist and acid fog engulfed him, slowly burning his skin even through his lightning cloak. Hmm. The rakage said before he vanished, moving clear of the fog in the blink of an eye. He's so fast. May thought as she could sense his movement through her mist. If he finds me, it's over. She also thought, knowing she would have to employ a hit-and-run tactic if she wished to survive. You think that will be enough to stop me? The rakage shouted as he let his power explode into his fists before he struck the ground. His power exploded and caused the ground beneath him to erupt with lightning-style chakra, causing a shockwave large enough to expel the mist and fog from the air. He did all that with just raw power. May said as she did her best to shield herself from the shockwave. There you are. The rakage said locking onto Mei as he lifted his head from the ground. Mei didn't even blink before the rakage disappeared from her line of sight. Where did he? She said before his hand gripped her by the throat. Mei struggled but the rakage could see through her clone jutsu, crushing the clone's throat, letting it burst into a puddle of water. Smart, swapping out with a clone while I couldn't see you. The rakage said impressed by her ability. 
Acid Fog Jutsu. May said to herself, letting the acid mist appear from underground. She had taken advantage of the rakish's destruction of the ground, using her earth style to hide underneath, preparing a counterattack. The acid fog quickly spread, almost hitting the rakish dead on. However, he was just too quick, and easily dashed away to a safe distance. I'm growing tired of these games. He said, noting that the fog was still spreading. May was still hiding underground, knowing that if she came out, he would finish her before she could even react. Still, she knew that her current tactics would only get her so far, as she had greatly underestimated the rakish's true power and speed. The rakish stood with his arms by his side as he watched the acid fog continue to spread, becoming more enraged. I've had enough of this. He shouted as he suddenly took a karate horse stance, placing both of his large arms by his side. Arg! He roared as he started to unleash punch after punch. The force of his strikes was enough to send a shockwave through the air, expelling the fog after a few short blasts. Now! Liger kick! He shouted as he jumped into the air with an impressive flip, before crashing his heel into the ground, uprooting the earth from the force of his strike once more. His attack caused the sand to blast into the air and even affected the water, causing it to crash and part violently. May was flung out from under the sand, doing her best to form hand signs to ready her defense. Lava style. She shouted as she fired a full 360 wave of lava around her, knowing full well the rakage wouldn't be able to get to her without touching the lava first. But to her horror, the rakage burst through the sheet of lava, raising his fist at her. Did you think that would be enough to stop me? He said as his lightning-style chakra clock seemed to repel even the molten lava. May gasped, trying to form hand signs in response, but the rakage was simply too quick as he slammed a punch into her stomach sending her flying before she crashed into the sand hard. The rakage dropped back down to the ground and dusted himself off from the lava style, looking at Mei who was led in serious pain on the ground. You're lucky I only hit you with a fraction of my power. He said as he started walking over to her. But now it's time to finish you off. Mei couldn't believe how strong he was, not only could he avoid her acid fog, but he was also durable enough to withstand her lava style. There was only one way left that she could think of that might be able to take him down. Why you haven't won yet? May said quietly as she tried to pull herself up to her hands and knees. The rakage looked at her, impressed she could still move after his punch. I need to limit his movements and trap him, that way he won't be able to escape my acid mist. May thought as she quickly planned her attack. Earth style, four wall trap. She said as she quickly summoned a thick layer of earth walls all around the rakage sealing him fully inside a thick layer of four walls that formed a large dome. Now lava style, molten rock wave. She also said, quickly forming more hand signs as she covered the earth trap in a layer of lava to help strengthen the seal. Now for the final jutsu. She said as she quickly formed more hand signs, each with impressive speed. Vapor style. She said as she suddenly breathed her acid mist all over the earth and lava dome. May dropped to her knees feeling exhausted after the huge amount of chakra she had just used to try and counter the rakage. If this doesn't work, I have nothing else that will. She said, knowing full well that was everything she had just now. Suddenly the earth dome started to shake, the tremors growing stronger and stronger, even shaking the earth below. Arg! The rakage yelled as he burst free from the prison May had created, moving so fast she didn't have time to defend herself from his shoulder barge. May was hit hard and sent flying before she crashed and skidded along the sand like a rag doll, coming to a stop looking broken and beat. The rakage was clearly angry and had used close to his full power to break free from her trap, the damage his skin had taken from the acid mist could even be seen, as a few burn spots had appeared. That wasn't half bad. You forced me to use at least 70% of my strength to escape your little trick. He said as he picked up some wet sand to wipe it on his burns. May was completely out of it barely conscious after the massive hit she had just taken. Ao had seen what had happened, knowing that May was the strongest of them. We need to retreat, the rakage is too powerful. Ao said as he blocked another attack from a hidden cloud ninja. That was also easier said than done, as the Anvia units were still engaged in battle with the cloud ninja, who was proving to be just as skilled as them. Meanwhile, Ganri and Kagetsu were doing their best to simply survive against Killer B. His skill with the Eight Blades was simply amazing, showing his true talent and power as a shinobi. Ganri simply couldn't keep up and was getting cut to ribbons, taking a lot of damage before B landed a kick to his head, smashing him to the ground. Kagetsu was also doing his best to fight, 
his ability to turn to liquid helping to stop B from landing critical blows. However, he soon figured out he was massively weak to lightning style and B let his chakra engulf all eight of his blades, turning him into Kagetsu's worst nightmare. Float like a butterfly, sting like a killer bee. He shouted as he launched in, twisting and flipping as he attacked with all eight of his lightning blades. Kagetsu couldn't keep track of them all and was quickly forced to retreat into the air. B didn't hang around though and jumped up after him. Water style, water gun barrage. Kagetsu shouted as he fired multiple shots of high pressure water from the tip of his finger at B. B could see that these water bullets were no joke and quickly started twisting in the air, using his lightning style swords to cut through the water bullets, rendering them harmless. Kagetsu landed back on the ground and blocked another attack from B. However, his lightning style enhanced blades were started to chip away at his normal blade, and he knew it wouldn't be able to hold much longer. Surrender is key, defeat is to BBB. Ya fool, ya fool. B said as he flipped into a handstand and used his legs to attack, twisting the swords between his knees, spinning them in the air before he changed his attack pattern again and again. I can't keep up. I haven't seen such formidable Taijutsus since I practiced with Lord Fifth. He thought as he fell back doing his best to avoid being hit. B's sword finally broke through Kagetsu's and he landed a direct hit with his lightning-enhanced blade, dropping Kagetsu into a slime pile on the ground. That should keep you there, you slimy fool. He said, knowing full well he wouldn't be able to move now. B turned around and could see that his brother A had also defeated Mei, all that was left now was to give a hand to the rest of the Anbu and Jonan who were battling with Ao and the other missed Anbu. Suddenly though, the sea became violent and the waves started to grow large as they threatened to even crash into everyone on the beach. The rakage noticed the huge wave heading towards them and gave the signal for his men to retreat, knowing it was too big for him to stop. Every one of them did as they were told, not wanting to take the wrath of the huge tidal wave heading towards them. Ao could see that Ganri, Mei and Kagetsu were all down and out for the count. Crap, you two, get Kagetsu and Ganri. Ao shouted as he rushed over towards Mei. The rakage let his lightning cloak fade as he jumped back to the top of the cliff with C and Derui, being at a safe distance away from the wave. Ao got to Mei in time but could see she was in bad shape, quickly he picked her up and dashed as quick as he could to avoid the crash of the wave. The other mist Anbu had made it over to Genri and quickly picked him up onto their shoulders. However, they could not remove the lightning-enhanced blade from Kagetsu. I'll leave me. He said, knowing he would be fine once the wave hit. The Anbu did just that and only just made the clearing as the wave crashed into the beach and smashed against the cliffside. Everyone was drawn to the mighty roar of the beast that emerged from the water after the wave hit. A giant armored turtle with three large tails rose up from the depths of the ocean and howled as it locked onto the rakage and the others who stood on the cliff. The rakage could see Ao and the others standing on the other side of the cliff from him and his men, deciding to leave them and focus his attention on the three tails for now. All right men it's time to take down the three tails. He roared himself, letting his lightning-style chakra cloak burst to life. B. Get ready. He shouted, giving his younger brother the signal. B nodded. All right bro, yo, yo let's go. Ya fool. He shouted at the three tails as he lifted his hand into the air, bursting into state two of his chakra mode. Way he. He roared as the red chakra flared to life, all eight of his tails on display. The three tails could sense the eight tails chakra and howled as it fixed its attention on B, becoming enraged. All right, let's take this thing down. The rakage then said, placing his foot on a rock in front of him, looking the three tails in the eye as he got ready for an epic clash of titans. Charge. Chapter 62, Naruto Chapter 62 The three tails let rip a might roar, its very voice strong enough to make the seas violent, while its tails crashed around whipping up winds so strong they created tidal waves. Charge! The rakage shouted as he and B launched in with everything they had, attacking head-on with their most powerful attacks. However, the three tails had a thick shell and a very impressive defense to boast, causing both of their attacks to be futile. The three tails roared and quickly jumped into the air, spinning into a massive spiked ball, landing a direct hit on B who had not been able to get out of the way. B! The rakage shouted as he watched his brother smash into a cliff, hitting the rock and stone hard. Why you? He shouted as he jumped in for another attack, now that the three tails had landed back in the water. The tailed beast could see the rakage moving towards it and fired a huge blast of water at him. The rakage easily moved out of the way, dodging blast after blast with his amazing speed. Arg! 
He roared as he suddenly appeared above the tailed beast and dropped his elbow onto it before he let loose a barrage of punches and kicks. The three tails had impressive armor, but the rakage had impressive power, and the beast could quickly feel the energy of his punches becoming sharper with each and every strike. Using its tails, the beast swatted the rakage away from it. He had been so focused in attacking he had failed to see the beast's counter-attack coming. The three tails quickly used the space it had gained from hitting the rakage to dive back underwater, taking shelter from any more attacks for the moment. The rakage also had an impressive defense and increased durability, getting back up and dusting himself off from the three tails attack. Blast, it dived back under. He said before he turned to look at Killer B. Man that turtle hits hard, ya fool. He said as he got back up, still in his second form of tailed beast mode. Fire a tailed beast bomb into the water and draw it out. The rakage shouted. You got it, bro. He shouted as he drew in the chakra, opening his mouth before he fired three yellow chakra blasts into the water. The high-density chakra hit the water and exploded, creating huge waves that burst from the sea, soaking the entire cliffside with the salt water. Suddenly two large chakra blasts burst out from the water, heading right for B, as the three tails counter-attacked with its own chakra blasts in return. Oh crap! B shouted as he fired another three quickly causing them to explode in the air, saving the others on the cliffside from being wiped out. The shock wave was immense and sent everyone flying including B. Look out! The rakage shouted as the three tails burst from the ocean again, this time charging a full-powered tailed beast bomb to attack with. A and the others had been watching from the sidelines and could see that the three tails was incredibly strong, attacking with all of its might. Even with the rakage and B fighting together, it was still a close battle. However, Ao knew that B was a perfect Jinchuriki and would most likely transform soon enough, flipping the odds for sure. Arg! The rakage suddenly screamed as he let his power explode, increasing the power and density of his lightning cloak, causing his hair to stand on end. Take this! He yelled as he burst from the cliff so fast, that all that could be seen was a blue flash of electricity. The three tails had almost finished its attack and was getting ready to unleash it upon them. However, the rakage appeared next to it and slammed his fist so hard into the side of the three tails head that he knocked its whole body off of the ground, causing it to lose control of its own attack. Look out! Darui shouted, seeing that the attack was about to explode, as he tried to warn the others who could only watch. The rakage waited until the last moment before he flickered clear of the explosion, appearing back on the cliffside with the others to watch the blast. The three tails had been caught in its own attack and had been knocked back into the water, giving everyone a quick breather so they could formulate a plan. Now is our chance. Get a ceiling jutsu ready. The rakage shouted to his men. But the three tails wasn't done yet. With a mighty roar, the creature smashed its tails into the water, creating huge and monstrous waves that threatened to swallow the coastline. Quickly the beast fired off three blasts of huge water bullets before it dived back under the cover of the ocean. Darn it. The rakage shouted as he quickly smashed each of the water bullets out of the air with his amazing speed and power, protecting his men as he did. B. He roared, looking to his brother, who understood what he wanted him to do. All right, bro. Leave it to me, the eight-tailed killer B. Ya fool. He shouted as he suddenly started to transform into the full version of the eight tails, letting loose a mighty roar of his own. Ao and the others watched in horror as now there were two giant monsters on the battlefield with Killer B taking the form of the eight tails, a mix between an Aza and an octopus. Here I come! B shouted as he suddenly dived into the ocean and disappeared under the water. Everyone waited as the sea seemed to calm itself, the huge waves settling back down for but a moment. That was until both of the eight and three tails burst out from the surface of the ocean, each of them wrestling against each other for dominance as they fought. Arg! B roared as he used his arms and tails to hit and wrap the three tails up, taking control of his limbs. The three tails was at a huge disadvantage as it could only stand on four legs, trying its best to use its tails and armored shell to attack with. The two titans clashed and sent colossal waves crashing into the cliff and the coastline. The very earth shook from the power both of them were exerting, leaving all of the shinobi who bore witness to the event speechless. The three tails did its best but soon found that it could not match the eight tails in a battle of strength. Leaving it no choice but to resort to blasting B with chakra blasts at point range. B howled in pain before he raised both of his arms and interlocked his fingers, bringing down the combined power of both his fists, hitting the three tails on the back doing some big damage. Take this! He then roared as he charged a massive black ball of chakra before he fired a massive yellow blast at the three tails, 
which exploded right in its face. The three tails roared in pain, still having felt the effects through its thick layer of armor. Feeling like it had no other choice the three tails pushed off the water, jumping high into the air while B watched. The three tails suddenly curled into a ball and started spinning rapidly again, crashing into B who did his best to catch it, holding the beast back best he could. Ouch, ya fool. The three tails had such strong and spiky armor that the eight tails and B couldn't take the brunt of its attack, feeling his skin and flesh ripping from the force of its spinning. Why you? The eight tails roared, tossing the three tails to the side with all of his strength. The three tails landed and continued to spiral with all of its might, rotating back around as it charged in for another attack. B didn't have a choice this time and quickly slammed his arm into the ocean shallows, planting himself for a massive tailed beast bomb. Take this. He shouted, unleashing the full power of his tailed beast bomb at close range, engulfing the three tails in the blast. The three tails took a direct hit from behind its armored shell, even its incredible defense was not strong enough to fully protect it from the eight tails attack, leaving it floating in the water in pain as it groaned and moaned. B looked at the beast and could hear the eight tails talking to him before he nodded and turned back to his brother. It's down, yo, eight don't wanna fight the three no more bro. Ya fool. The rakage had been watching from the sidelines, deciding it best to let the two titans duke it out before he got involved. All right. Ceiling squad on me. He shouted, getting a handful of his anvu to join him in heading down towards the three tails. B watched and slowly turned back into his human form, the eight-tailed octopus with one horn returning back inside of his body. No. We can't let them get the three tails. A shouted. However, as he and the others tried to make a move, they quickly became surrounded by Cloud Ninja, who blocked their path. Now that it's weak enough, sealing it shouldn't be a problem. The rakage said as he ran towards it with his men. Mei was still out cold, Ganri had also been injured, Kagetsu was nowhere to be seen and Ao was left with five Anvu members, surrounded by ten Cloud Shinobi. He wished he could say he had made it through worse odds, but he really couldn't, feeling like this was the worst he had been cornered. The rakage and his men were fast approaching now, but as they ran across the water, two of his men were suddenly dragged under by their feet taking everyone by surprise. What they? The rakage shouted as he noticed what was going on. Surprise! Kagetsu suddenly shouted as he emerged from the ocean, surrounded by a massive layer of water that took the shape of an armored clam. I thought he had been dealt with. The rakage shouted as he turned back to look at his brother. B rubbed the back of his head with an awkward smile. Whoopsie! He simply said. Kagetsu suddenly attacked, seeming to have all the might of the ocean at his disposal. This is my ultimate jutsu. Giant clam vortex. He shouted as he made a few hand signs, allowing the armored water clam to open its mouth, absorbing a great amount of water from the ocean and blasting it out, creating a massive vortex that engulfed everything around it. The best way I can explain this jutsu is like a giant version of Zabuza's vortex jutsu he tries to use on Kakashi. Darn it. The rakage shouted as he quickly activated his lighting cloak and launched forwards to meet the jutsu head-on, punching it as hard as he could. The rest of his men had not been so fortunate and had been blasted away by the massive water style, leaving only the rakage to do battle with him. I won't let you have the three tails. Kagetsu shouted as he clashed with the rakage, over and over again, exchanging blow for blow with the monster of a man. Thankfully, as long as he was surrounded by water, he could continue to regenerate his giant water clam and keep fighting, even against someone as powerful as the rakage. I'm growing tired of you Mist Ninja and your tricks. He shouted as he quickly darted back to a safe distance from Kagetsu. Time for a lariat. He shouted as he extended his arm, letting his lightning style explode all around it. All right, looks like bro's about to get serious, ya fool, B said as he crossed his arms, deciding to watch this one from a safe distance. Kagetsu wasn't sure if he would be able to defend against this attack but knew he didn't have a choice. The rakage let his lightning cloak burst with even greater power, causing his hair to spike up even more than before. It's time to die. He shouted as he slowly bent his legs, preparing to attack. Boom. The rakage exploded from the ground, moving so fast that he broke the sound barrier as he burst forth to deliver his killer blow. Everyone watched in suspense as the rakage had powered up to the max preparing to use his full power against Kagetsu, knowing there was nothing anyone could do about it. However, to everyone's surprise, instead of Kagetsu being killed in the blink of an eye from the rakage's attack, the sound of an explosion could be heard as the entire cliffside shook from the power of his attack instead. What the hell yo? 
B said as he watched his brother smash into the base of the cliffside on the beach, going the complete opposite direction to where Kagetsu had been. In fact, everyone watched, no one being able to explain what had just happened. Kagetsu most of all. Well, looks like I made it just in time. A voice said coming from above Kagetsu. He looked up, knowing whose voice that was, seeing his blue cloak blowing in the wind as he slowly stepped out of an ice mirror and hopped down to the ocean, standing on the water before he looked up at everyone. A had been watching with his Byuakugan and couldn't believe his eye as he saw who had appeared. He made it. Darn that guy. He said as a smile appeared on his face, feeling hopeful at last. The rakage was confused as to what had happened and had to heave his arm free from the rocks he was trapped in. What in the hell was that? He said, clearly enraged. Finally, he broke free of the rock that binds him and turned around to see who had dared try and interfere with his battle. B I can sense he's not normal. The eight tails said to B, letting him know about Fona. What you mean, you fool? He asked. I can feel the power of the six tails inside of him. The eight tails then said, knowing he was a dangerous opponent. The rakage walked out of the debris of the cliffside so he could get a clear look at what was going on, finally noticing who it was that now stood before him. Sorry I'm late, Kagetsu, Fona said, seeing the situation they had gotten into. Everything will be all right now though. He then said as Kagetsu slowly undid his jutsu, feeling that his chakra was running low. Here go and give some to the other two, Fona said as he placed his hand onto his shoulder, letting some of Saiken's chakra enter his body, helping to restore him and give him a power boost. W what is that, Kagetsu said surprised. Never mind that for now, go and place your hand on the others, Fona said, snapping him out of his thoughts. Kagetsu did as he was told and quickly dashed off towards the others at the top of the cliff leaving Fona to face the rakage himself. A, could finally see Fona clearly, taking his black hair and blue cloak in as he stood tall and proud. I see I arrived just in time, Lord Rakage, Fona said, staring into his eyes. The rakage grit his teeth at the cocky expression on Fona's face, getting angry at him. So shall we talk about how you tried to kill my men? Fona then said, allowing a more serious expression to fall upon his face, letting everyone know he wasn't here to talk. Chapter 63, Naruto Chapter 63, Fona vs The Rakage Everyone was shocked as they looked at the newcomer, watching as his blue cloak fluttered around in the wind. Who is that? C asked, standing next to Derui and the other cloud ninja. No way. That's the... Mizu Cage. The Rakage shouted, taking a few steps closer towards him. You dare come here and challenge me? He shouted with a wave of his arm. Fona could see that trying to talk sense into him wouldn't work. Instead, knowing that strength was the only thing he respected. I warned your men what would happen if they didn't leave my borders and I will say the same to you. Leave now or die. The rakage said, offering Fona one chance. We will leave. But only if the three tails comes with us. Fona said after a moment's pause. The rakage grit his teeth at his response. So you have chosen death. He then said before he took a fighting position. Fona also took a ready position, knowing that the rakage was no joke. Here I come, Mizu Cage. He shouted before moving in the blink of an eye. Fona was surprised by how fast he actually was, hardly having any time to react to the incoming punch. In fact, the only thing Fona could do was to let the chakra on his feet, responsible for holding him up on the water diminish, causing him to suddenly drop into it. The rakage had of course aimed for his face, as he had predicted and his fist sailed over Fona's head, missing him by an inch. What the? The rakage said, as a huge burst of ice spikes suddenly shot up from the ocean, each threatening to skewer him. The rakage easily dodged the attack, zooming from side to side like a bolt of electricity, as he continued to dodge the ice. He is fast, Fona said as he created more hand signs, letting ice burst up from all around him, using the entire ocean around them to attack with. The rakage may have been fast, but now he had nowhere left to run, doing the only thing he could do, jumping into the air. Smart, Fona said. But not good enough. He added. A, watched from above as the surrounded area had all been frozen by ice, noting the rumors he had heard about the ice devil of the mist to be true. Still, he smiled nevertheless, knowing now was the perfect chance to drop with a heel kick, using all of his power on one attack. But suddenly, an ice mirror formed behind him with a reflection of Fona inside of it, readying an attack. What? 
The rakid shouted as he turned and swiped his fist at the mirror, attempting to shatter it with a powerful back hammer fist. However, instead of his fist smashing the ice, it simple passed right through it, passing out to another mirror next to Funa, who grabbed the rakid's wrist in a powerful grip. Got you. He said with a smile, just before he pulled the rakid through the mirror link and slammed him into the ice, causing his body to slide along it, smashing and crashing into all of the large icicles that had formed. The rakid didn't take long to recover and soon flipped back to his feet as he finally slid off the ice and back onto the water. His lightning chakra cloak keeping his body from taking any damage from the ice. It was safe to say that he had underestimated Fona, something he didn't plan to do again. That was an impressive jutsu. But it won't work on me again. He shouted, letting his lightning chakra cloak burst to life and become even more powerful. Fona could sense now that he wasn't playing around, and had fully powered up intending to end their fight with his next blow. Suddenly, Foyna sensed a surprise attack come from behind him, quickly darting out of the way as Killer B charged past in his version 1 Red Chakra Cloak with a lightning-style attack. B stopped and skidded on the ice before he turned to face Fona, smiling at him. You gotta fight me too. The Killer B, ya fool ya fool. B shouted as he raised his hand into the air, giving a loud shout. Hole he. Fona now had both the Eight Tails host, Killer Bee, and the fourth Rakage to worry about at the same time. Not something he could do easily. Guess I have no choice. He suddenly shouted. Let's do this Saiken. He also said in his head before a red and black chakra burst from his body, quickly fading away as he entered stage two of his tailed beast mode. Both Bee and the Rakage were surprised, but they each quickly nodded to each other and Bee powered up to his stage two also, while the Rakage charged at him with his full power. Fona suddenly let his body turn purple as the rakage appeared behind him like a flash of lightning, with his fist raised ready to slam it down upon him. Fona's body spat out a corrosive liquid from all over him, splashing a little on the rakage before he quickly flashed away to avoid the rest. B then slammed into Fona from the side, using his horns to try and tackle him with all of his might, pushing him back best he could. However, Fona suddenly became slippery and wrapped his body around B letting his corrosive acid ooze from his body, burning B, and causing him to scream in pain as he tried to rip him off. Let him go. The rakage shouted as he appeared and slammed his foot into Fona's head, knocking him flying through the air, saving B just in time. He had kicked Fona so hard that it made his head and neck stretch before his body finally followed, sending him flying into the air. Don't let your guard down. The rakage said as he used his lighting style to rip the acid slim from B's body, preventing it from burning him anymore. Fona sailed through the air before flipping a few times and opening his arms and legs to slow his fall. That wasn't half bad. He thought as he watched them. The rakage's power is like fighting another Jinchuriki. He certainly packs a punch. But let's see how they handle this. He then said to himself as he started to gather a large amount of chakra. Let's go B. The rakage shouted, seeing what Fona was doing, even while still falling from the air. Oh yeah. B shouted as he too started to gather a large amount of chakra, forming a tailed beast bomb in his mouth. Two can play at that game. Fona and B fired their blasts at the same time, watching as the red beams clashed in the air, exploding on contact creating a huge shock wave that created large waves in the ocean. The rakage appeared behind Fona, taking advantage of his and B's clash, grabbing his waist with both hands before he moved so fast that Fona couldn't react in time. Let's see how you deal with this one. Liger bomb. He roared as he suddenly sailed down towards the ground at terrifying speed, tossing Fona above his head as he prepared to slam him into the ground with all of his might. The rakage hit the ground, slamming Fona into the sand with all of his power, creating a huge explosion of lightning that even drew thunder from the very sky itself, scaring the earth from its blast, kicking up a huge dust cloud. Everyone watched in shock as the three of them battled. Ao and the others trying to keep their hope alive for Fona, knowing how strong the rakage and B were. At the same time, the Cloud Ninja couldn't believe that the Mizu Cage was so strong, being able to hold his own against both their Rakage and the Eight Tails Jinchuriki. The dust from the Rakage's attack slowly cleared and to his horror, he could see that Fona had been unaffected, allowing his body to turn into slime so that he harmlessly splat onto the ground. H how? The Rakage shouted before bones started to spike out from all over Fona's body, with two of them stabbing the Rakage in surprise. Quickly he dashed away, seeing that Fona had managed to cut him, even though his lightning-style chakra cloak was still up. Fona's body slowly returned to its solid form, snapping his neck back into place before his body did the same. In this form, 
he could freely control his body, allowing it to become a liquid or solid, rendering physical attacks completely useless. And unlike the Hazuki clan, thanks to his ice Kekiai Jenkai he could completely negate any lightning style attacks by simply merging his liquid body with his ice style. Then with his Shikatsumayaku, he could return his bones to a solid state, even creating a body of exoskeleton armor if he wished, to use defensively or offensively depending on his opponent. He survived Lord Rakich Sliger bomb. Derui shouted in disbelief as he and the others watched from the sidelines. Suddenly Kagetsu dashed up the cliffside and smashed his fist into one of the cloud ninja who had surround Ao and the others. Take my hand. He shouted as he suddenly slapped his hand onto Ao's. Ao suddenly felt as if he had been infused with power as Fona's chakra flowed into him, forming a red cloak around his body just like Kagetsu. Lord Mizu Cage said to use his chakra to help the others. Kagetsu said. Ao nodded and quickly slapped his hand onto everyone's shoulder, also infusing their bodies with the chakra, helping to heal them and boost their strength. Amazing. One of the Anbu said as he looked at his hands, with the others doing the same. Hopefully this helps to heal Mei, and Ganry's wounds. Ao thought as he turned to look at the Cloud Ninja. The Cloud Ninja didn't know what was going on and quickly jumped back on the defensive at Derui's orders. Get back. He said to them knowing that they all had a tailed beast chakra cloak, not understanding what was happening. We can't let them get away. Be ready for anything. He said, still injured from his fight with Mei. Kagetsu felt great, knowing with his energy refilled he would be able to use that jutsu, giving them a huge edge against it to escape. Summoning jutsu. Giant clam. He shouted as he made the hand signs and slapped his hand onto the ground. A large clam suddenly appeared in a poof of white smoke hailing the hidden mist symbol on its outer shell. Now it's time to use my elder's jutsu. Kagetsu said as the clam suddenly opened up and let loose a large amount of mist from its body, getting a shocked reaction from all of the cloud ninja. Meanwhile, B was firing rapid-fire blasts of chakra at Fona, who ran along the ocean surface, avoiding the blasts one after the other as they made contact with the water, exploding on impact. The rakage zoomed in and attacked Fona, trying to kill him with every strike, however, Every time he hit him, Fona's body simply turned into slime and almost covered the rakage in a corrosive acid, threatening to melt the very skin off of his bones. Darn it! I can't even hit him! The rakage shouted as he jumped back, flicking the acid off of him again. Time after time as he tried to attack him over and over. B was also doing his best, but he and the eight tails knew that he was simply too fast to hit. B. We need a distraction something that can hold him in place long enough for us to do some damage. Teijutsu won't be effective against the six tails, but if we can hit him with a tailed beast bomb, he won't be able to deflect that. The eight tails said to B. All right, but how we gonna do that? Ya fool. He's too quick. B said in response. I'm not sure either. Look out. The eight tails then said as Fona suddenly slithered along the surface of the ocean towards him, using his liquid body to move like a snake. He wrapped himself around Killer B, squeezing him tightly as he restrained his movements in an instant. I I can't move. B said as he tried with all of his might. The rakage could see that Fona had restrained B and knew he had to help him. I'm coming B. He shouted before he zapped towards them. Fona was ready for the rakage this time, knowing there was no way he would leave him to die. Fona allowed his six tails body to suddenly extend, with another head and two arms coming out to form some hand signs that created an ice dome around them. The rakage hit the ice as hard as he could, but with the ice infused with the six tails chakra, it was stronger than the hardest steel, resisting his attacks one after the other. Oh crap! B said knowing this wasn't good. Fona let his head slide around so that he was face to face with B, looking into his eyes as he formed a few hand signs and slowly placed his hand onto B's head. B tried to resist, but it was no use, he was trapped by Fona and couldn't overpower him whether he liked it or not. Looks like we got no choice 8 to 0. Time to go full power. B said, inside his inner world to the eight tails. Wouldn't you say that that's enough fighting for now? Fona suddenly said from inside B's and the eight tails inner world, suddenly appearing next to them. Both of them were shocked as to how he had appeared here, and they both took a defensive pose. What the hell yo? You can't just burst in here ya fool. B said pointing at him in anger. Calm down, both of you. Fona said before he looked at the eight tails, or should I call you Jiki? He said, using the eight tails real name. I don't want to hurt either of you. 
he then said being honest as he waited for their response. How does he know your name? B asked confused, slowly lowering his hands as he looked to the eight tails. I don't know. The eight tails said, also confused. I didn't come here to fight. Fona then said, seeing they were a little more willing to listen now. Slowly the six tails appeared behind Fona, nodding its head to the eight tails. It's true Jiki. Please listen to what he has to say. Saikan said. The eight tails and B were really confused now. Yo. What the hell is that slug, ya fool? B said jumping back at the sight of it. Saikan. The eight tails said, seeing his fellow tailed beast had appeared before them. What are you doing here? Jiki said. I am with Fona. He has asked me if I will help talk to you, and try to stop this violence. The six tails said. The eight tails was more prone to reason than others of their kind. Knowing that if Fona was this strong, he could have killed B already if he wished. What is it you want? The eight tails asked. B. I want you and the rakage to allow me to take the three tails back. You see, I need to borrow its power to save someone dear to me. Fona said with a heavy heart. I do not wish to fight with you over this, as I believe your power will be needed in the future. But if you continue to persist, I will have no choice but to fight at full power and take the three tails by force. Fona then said. B, put his hands on his hips taking note of Fona's words as did the eight tails. Boro. The eight tails said, not sure he had heard him right. That's right, Fona said. Humans do not borrow our power. They take it for themselves. He shouted. No. Fona is telling the truth. Just as you and that human there have become friends, Fona and I also have a strong bond, one where we share each other's power and help one another. Saiken shouted. B didn't understand what was going on and instead looked to Jiki. B, here is a special exception. Before B, I had never found anyone who I could trust. Fona is special Jiki. I believe he is the one father spoke about all those years ago. Saiken suddenly shouted. Jiki was shocked at Saiken's words, taking a closer look at Fona and noticing his blue eyes and resemblance to the sage, their father. It's can't be. The eight tails said as he remembered the words of his father when all of the tailed beasts were still young before he died. And you want the three tails for what? Jiki then asked, waiting to hear his answer. Fona looked down at the ground before he looked the eight tails in the eyes. Someone that I see as a son to me is sick. He won't last much longer now but I believe if the three tails were to be sealed inside of him, its massive chakra would help to heal his body, saving his life. Fona said. I know it seems like a selfish request. But I am prepared to do anything to save his life. He then said. Even beg the three tails myself. He then added. Both B and the eight tails were silent for a moment until finally, the eight tails spoke. B. We cannot fight him any longer. He said seeing that he held no ill will for his kind in his eyes. But bro is gonna. B started. However, the eight tails suddenly hit him on the head and started telling him off, causing everyone to laugh. Listen B. This guy isn't our enemy anymore. The eight tails then said. B, listened to his words and soon nodded before he looked back to Fona. If eight to zero says you're cool, then ya cool, ya fool. B said before he extended his fist towards him. Fona smiled and also extended his, bumping it against B's. Thank you, the both of you. I will not forget this act of kindness. He then said. B nodded as he crossed his arms. Just one problem yo. Bro ain't gonna back down. He said looking a little worried, as he crossed his arms over his chest. Don't worry. Leave him to me. Fona said with a smile, before undoing his sealing jutsu. With that. Fona unwrapped from around B's body, with both of them relaxing and returning to their human form. I'll trust 8 to Zero's judgment on this one yo, but you better watch out, ya fool. B said with a smile. Fona also smiled as he created an ice mirror. Time for you to go and sort things out on your end, B leave this to me, Fona said, watching as B nodded and slipped into the ice mirror, appearing behind Derui and the others. He could see that his fellow Cloud Ninja were attacking Thin Air while the Mist Ninja attacked from the side, taking full advantage of a Genjutsu that Kagetsu had cast with his giant clam. That's enough, ya fools. B said getting all of their attention as he suddenly went full eight tails mode, blasting all of the mist away. Lord B. They said, seeing that he had just appeared from nowhere and come to save them. 
But how did you? Never mind that yo. It's time to watch the real show. He said, pointing towards the rakage and fauna. Even showing the mist that they were to stop fighting each other now. Ao and the others also stopped seeing that B had stopped his troops and pointed over to Fona. What's going on? Kagetsu said to Ao, releasing his summoning. It looks like Fona and B came to an agreement and he sent him over here to stop the fighting, Ao said surprised. But what about the rakage? Kagetsu asked. It looks like we are about to find out. Ao then said, with a grim expression. Meanwhile, the rakage was still trying to break through the ice dome with his attacks finally starting to crack it. He watched in confusion as B willing undid his tailed beast cloak and walked into an ice mirror with Fona even waving goodbye to him. What have you done to B? He shouted as he finally broke the ice barrier and charged at Fona, throwing a punch with all of his might, roaring as he did. Arg, time to die. Fona knew there was no other option now, as he stood with his back turned, listening as the ice cracked all around him. I didn't want to have to use this here, but I guess the rakage is just too strong. He said, letting his chakra flared to life all around his body. With one swift motion, Fona turned around to face the rakage, as the ice finally broke. His body had now burst to life with a blue chakra cloak that covered him, complete with black markings from the seal on his stomach. Tailed beast chakra cloak. He said to himself as he caught the rakage's punch with one hand. His hair had spiked up into the air with his entire body covered in the light blue chakra cloak of the six tails, bubbling blue chakra ran off of his body, and the rakage could feel the power he was admitting. It's time to end this. Fona finally said, as he opened his eyes, revealing their crystal blue color with a black fang iris running down the center of them. Chapter 64, Naruto Chapter 64 It's time to finish this Fona said as he gripped the rakage's fist tightly in his hand. He had become enveloped in a blue chakra cloak, showing an ability never before seen by any who were present to witness it. W what is this? The rakage said as he could feel his fist burning from simply being in contact with Fiona's chakra. Fona smiled and let his power burst before he kicked the rakage with deadly force. If not for the rakage sliding style chakra cloak and impressive durability, he would have been killed for sure. The rakage bounced off the water before he flipped backwards and landed back onto his feet, impressed that he had been shaken by that kick being forced to shake off the pain and stand back up, ready to go on the offensive. Fona was stood upright as his aura flared in the sunlight, blue chakra bubbles popping all around him as his chakra cloak resembled the power of his tailed beast. I haven't mastered this form yet. I don't have long to use it, so I had better make it count. Fona said to himself as he remembered training to use it with Saiken. That is amazing Fona. Saiken said as Fona transformed into his Saiken chakra mode for the first time. I did it. Fona said as he took a look at his hands and body, noting that massive amount of chakra he was emitting. Amazing. You have somehow managed to concentrate all of my chakra into a condensed form, saving you from taking my full form and instead focusing all of my power into your body. The six tails said, impressed. How did you know how to do such a thing? Saiken then asked after a moment. Fona smiled as he felt the power flowing through his body. I just had a hunch was all. He said. You never cease to amaze me Fona, Saiken said as he watched from his inner world. Fona could feel the strain this form was placing on his body to maintain it and knew it would take a while before he learned to control it fully. However, he could also see the huge perks and physical buffs he would get from this form, making him look forwards to seeing what he could do with it. Fona opened his eyes to look back at the rakage, knowing he only had five minutes to try and finish this fight. However, he knew that the rakage was no pushover and would probably be the toughest opponent he had faced so far. Arg! The rakage suddenly roared, before he charged in, vanishing and then reappearing in a flash of electricity as he attacked with all of his power, aiming for the kill. Lightning straight! He roared as he threw his strongest punch at Fona with such amazing speed, even with his tailed beast cloak he wasn't sure he could react in time. Fona was quickly forced on the defense as he dodged the rakage's attack, much to his surprise. However, he didn't let up and quickly launched a new barrage of punches and kicks, all with killing intent as Fona continued to dodge or block the attacks, each of them moving at superhuman speeds. I'm sorry Lord Rakage. I'm still not used to this form, so I will have to apologize if I fail to hold back. Fona shouted as he blocked another one of the Rakage's punches, gripping both of his wrists now in a tight grip. The Rakage was utterly shocked as all of his attacks had failed. Each of them being batted off by Fona who seemed to almost be playing with him. Here I go. 
Fona suddenly shouted as a huge chakra fist suddenly formed from his stomach, smashing into the rakage and landing a direct hit against him due to his arms being restrained. Arg! The rakage huffed as Fona continued to let his chakra fists, which had become four arms now, continue to rain blow after blow down upon the rakage. Fona knew if he had used his Shikatsumayaku ability or his ice release he could have certainly fatally wounded the rakage. But his plan wasn't to start a war with the hidden cloud if he could avoid it. I have to admit, you're a tough son of a bitch. Fona said with a smile on his face as he stopped attacking the rakage. A, who knew all too well that Fona could have finished him with that chance was surprised to see him stop, but his pride and rage would not allow him to admit defeat just yet. If you are done playing around. I have one last attack that will finish you for sure. He shouted as he let his lightning style aura flare to life, managing to overpower Fona and escape his grip. Hell's Spear. He suddenly shouted as he concentrated all of his power into his hand, using only three fingers to increase the penetration power of his jutsu. Fona remembered this attack all too well from his memories. It belongs to the third rakage, A's father, and it was not to be taken lightly. Shit, I let my guard down. Fona shouted knowing he didn't have a choice but to use his full power to counter the attack. But I, I, The rakage shouted as he put all of his remaining strength into his father's attack. Fona had no choice but to let as much bone as he could grow in the short time, grow around his arm and hand, infusing it with ice to increase the strength and durability of it as he clashed in one final attack with the rakage, each of them attacking with everything they had. Meanwhile, everyone else watched on the cliffside as the rakage and the Mizu cage clashed in a battle unlike any they had seen before watching as both of them glowed in chakra, going well beyond the power of normal shinobi. What the hell is that? Someone said as they looked at Fona, not knowing what was going on. Ao was also amazed as he watched with his Byakugan, seeing that Fona had somehow activated his tailed beast's chakra in a way no one had ever seen before, granting his abilities far beyond anything he thought possible. Is that really Lord Mizu Cage? One of the Anbu said as he watched with the others, amazed at what was happening. They weren't alone as the Cloud Ninja couldn't believe that their rakage was being pushed back and overpowered. Even Killer B was amazed at the transformation Fona had taken on, even as a perfect Jinchuriki, it was something he had never seen before. Amazing. The Eight Tails said from inside B as he watched. Yo, eight to zero. What the hell is that? B asked as he crossed his arms. He has somehow managed to concentrate all of the Six Tails chakra and compresses it, allowing him to use the full power of its chakra in his human form. Simply amazing. The Eight Tails said. B nodded as he watched, noting that it was indeed impressive, as even his all-powerful brother was being pushed back by the Mizu cage. Lord Rakage. C shouted as he watched his leader take a bad beating from Fona, who seemed to be toying with him now. We need to help him. Derui shouted as he started making hand signs. No. Yo. B suddenly shouted. You'll only get in the way, ya fool, ya fools. He shouted in anger at them before he turned back to watch the battle. Beside. Bro ain't done yet, ya fool. He then said, causing all of them to turn their attention back to the fight. Is that? Derui shouted all of a sudden as he recognized the third rakage's attack that the fourth was about to use. It is. It's the hell spear. C shouted, also surprised to see that he was attempting to use his father's jutsu. Mei was also watching in amazement as she had recovered enough to stand back to her feet thanks to Funa's chakra he had given to Kogetsu to share with everyone. That man. He just keeps getting stronger and stronger. She said as she watched the rakage get serious with his final attack. Oh no. Funa. She shouted as everyone also flinched before the two cage clashed with their attacks creating a shock wave that shattered anything within close proximity to them. Boom. The explosion that followed knocked a huge dust cloud into the air shielding everyone's vision from the final outcome. Fona and the rakage had clashed, with the rakage using his father's unstoppable hell spear thrust attack, and Fona using an enhanced tailed beast chakra cloak bone and ice spear. The result had smashed both of them flying, knocking the rakage into the ground hard as he bounced off the sand again and again before finally shooting out of the dust cloud and into the cliffside, where his lightning cloak finally faded. Fona had been able to overpower the rakage and broke through his three-finger hell spear, using his ice and bone spear to smash into his chest, knocking his flying and finishing the fight. Fona was tired now and he could feel the little control he had left over his new form slipping away, looking down at his own jutsu before he looked over to the rakage. If he had used one finger for that attack, I would be the one in trouble right now. 
Fona admitted to himself as he noticed his attack had only just held up against the rakage's. Fona's tailed beast cloak finally faded and he let his attack crumble from around his arm. Looks like I will have to come up with a better counter to that one. He thought as he looked over to the rakage. The dust settled and everyone could see that Fona had been victorious, as he stood and turned to face everyone before he turned to the rakage. Fona slowly walked over towards him before stopping and looking down at him for a moment. The rakage was still conscious and was a tough bastard, one who would prove difficult if made an enemy out of. W what's the matter? Finish me. A said as he tried to pull himself up, falling back down due to his injuries. Fona shook his head slowly and instead offered him his hand to help him up, getting a very surprised look from the rakage. I never came to fight you in the first place. Fona then said with a smile, holding his hand there for him to take it. The rakage growled a little and slapped his hand away, looking at him in anger. Why spare me? He then said, still not impressed. I didn't come to start a war with the hidden cloud, Lord Rakage. I simply came to retrieve the three tails and save my comrades. Fona said, taking his hand back. I refuse to kill someone of your strength. You will be important to this world in the future. Fona said as he turned his back on the rakage. A had to admit he was impressed by Fona, but his pride as a Kaga would not allow him to admit it. I hope the next time we meet, we don't have to battle in such a way. Until next time, Lord Rakage. Fona then said as he let an ice mirror appear before him quickly slipping into the ice mirror and appearing next to all of the others on the cliff. How did he? One of the cloud ninjas shouted as he appeared next to them in an instant, shocking everyone and putting them on edge. This battle is over. He suddenly shouted, looking at them all dead in the eye. We will be taking the three tails as is the purpose we are here. There will be no more bloodshed between the mist and the cloud on this day. He then said, issuing the order to all of them, looking at Killer B, nodding to him. B nodded back and turned to his men, noting it was a good time to get his brother and leave. All right ya fools, this fight is over, let's get bro and make like a tree, yo. He said as he raised his hand into the air, getting the attention of all of them. No one dared argue with B now after seeing how strong Fona really was, and the cloud retreated back to the rakage helping him up before they all looked up at the mist, Fona S and A's eyes locking one last time before they took their leave. Lord Mizu Cage. Ao suddenly shouted as he and the others ran over to him. Fona. May suddenly shouted as she dived into his arms, hugging and kissing him with passion, with no regard for the others being there at all. Fona didn't mind and kissed her back, glad to see she was safe and had not been hurt too badly. I'm glad everyone is all right. He said noting that only two Anbu had sadly lost their lives in the battle. No matter how strong I become, I will always struggle to protect everyone. He thought as he let his eyes cover the two bodies before he sealed them in a scroll so he could return them to the village and bury them there. I'm afraid we didn't stand much of a chance. The rakage and his men were powerful foes indeed. Ao said, taking responsibility for their death. No Ao. I could never expect any of you to battle with such a monster. It's a miracle I made it when I did. He then said nodding to the others who bowed in his presence. Just like you to save the day, May said as she kissed his cheek. But anyway, we need to get the three tails while we still can. She said becoming serious again. Yes. Leave that to me. Fona said, noticing that the three tails was starting to stir again, regaining its strength after some rest. This won't take long, Fona said as he walked over to the edge of the cliff to get a better look at the three tails. I hope you remember me Isabu. He said before he walked into an ice mirror. All of you stay here, I'll be back soon. He then said just before he vanished into his mirror, not allowing any of them to follow him. But Fona. May shouted in protest, however it was too late as his ice mirror melted and turned to water leaving them at the top of the cliff alone. Fona slowly stepped out of his other mirror that had appeared in front of the three tails, bringing him face to face with the tailed beast he had once had to battle and kill its last host. This time he could only hope that it would be more understanding with him, and hopefully, it wouldn't come to a fight. You ready Saiken? Fona asked. Not yet Fona. You used all of my chakra in that last fight, it might take me some time to regain it. The six tails said as it did its best to recover its chakra. Suddenly the three tails woke up and noticed his presence, attacking in a mad fury with all three of its tails, as well as charging a tailed beast bomb at the same time. Well. Sage Mode it is. Chapter 65, Chapter 65 The three tails attacked in a fit of rage using its tails, 
attacking from a distance. The beast gave a mighty roar having remembered being attacked by the rakage and Bifona was quick to avoid the assault from its tails, dodging and flipping across the ocean's surface as the waves grew larger and larger. Calm down Isabu. Fona tried to shout. However, the three tails had become lost in rage and attacked anything in sight, even preparing a tailed beast bomb as it gathers an intense amount of chakra. Not good. Fona said as he flipped back, and dashed across the raging surface of the ocean, still doing his best to avoid the three tails attacks. The sea had become rough, with titanic waves that crashed down. A truly monstrous sight to behold. Fona was glowing across the water, as he avoided the beast's attacks, riding the huge waves before he decided he had to counter-attack. Ice style. Giant ice trap. Fona shouted as he quickly formed the hand signs as he flipped through the air over a giant wave. Giant pillars of ice suddenly burst from the ocean under the three tails, covering the beast in a prison of ice, while Fona tried his best to distract it. But, the three tails wasn't playing games this time and launched its full-powered tailed beast bomb, breaking the ice to pieces as it glided along the surface of the ocean towards Fona. I don't think so. Fona said as he quickly formed a large number of hand signs before clapping his hands together. Giant ice mirror. He said, forming a large ice mirror that blocked the path of the huge blast of chakra. The tailed beast bomb was giving off such a powerful aura that it burst across the ocean and kicked up powerful winds that could be felt by everyone nearby. Get down. May shouted as they all watched from the top of the cliff knowing they wouldn't be able to do anything against such a force of nature. The chakra blast flew towards Fona's huge ice mirror and to everyone's surprise, became absorbed by the mirror, passing right into it and disappearing. Secret Technique Ice Mirror Sealing Jutsu Fona said to himself as he formed a few more hand signs, causing the ice mirror to suddenly flash as it sealed the blast inside of it, trapping it there. The three tails roared as it realized its attack had been stopped, suddenly crashing down into the ocean, disrupting its surface even more as even larger waves started to form, until one huge tidal wave came to life, heading right towards Fona. I don't have a choice this time. Fona said as he closed his eyes for a moment, remaining still as he drew in the natural energy around him. Fona's hair suddenly turned white starting from its roots while two Kagai-like horns grew on his head, the markings on his face changing and taking from to signify he had entered sage mode. Sage Jutsu. Frozen Graveyard. Fona suddenly shouted as he made the hand signs and placed his hands onto the surface of the water. The surface of the ocean suddenly froze, freezing even the huge wave in place as the ice spread at a rapid rate, stopping it in its tracks. Thanks to his sage mode Fona could freeze even something like the ocean in place. However, the three tails wasn't done just yet as it burst through the frozen wave, crashing through the ice as its massive body shattered the frozen ocean, heading towards Fona with a mighty cry. Roar! The monster cursed in its rage as it attempted to crash down upon Fona with all of its power. Fona was impressed as it was putting up a much greater fight than last time, but he didn't want to let it drag out too long and risk getting anyone hurt. With a strong burst of his own, Fona leapt from the surface of the ocean, reaching his hand out towards it. Isabu. Fona roared as the two of them came face to face, allowing Fona to place his hand onto the three tails head, and with the help of Saiken enter the beat's mind so he could talk to it. Fona slowly opened his eyes, standing to his feet as he came face to face with the three tails in its own inner world, taking it by surprise. At last we can talk, Isabu, Fona said, getting a strange look from the beast as he said its name. How? How do you know my name human? The three tails roared as it prepared to expel Fona from his mind. Wait Isabu. Saiken suddenly shouted as Fona let the six tails take form from his body. The three tails was most certainly shocked now halting its attack for the time being. Saiken? What are you doing here? It asked a little confused. I am here at the request of Fona. He does not wish to fight with you and only wants to talk. The six tails said, trying to convince its brother. The three tails looked at Fona and then back to Saiken, taking in his appearance now that he had calmed down a little. You. I know you. The three tails said slowly as he looked Fona up and down. That's right. You killed Yagura. It then said, becoming a little sad. I didn't wish to. But it was the only way to free him from the genjutsu that had enslaved you both. Fona said, jogging Isabu's memory. Yes. I remember now. Isabu said, calming down now. What is it you want to talk to me about? The three tails then asked, looking at both Saiken and Fona. Fona took a breath before he looked at Saiken and then at Isabu. 
I don't know how else to say this, so here it goes. I need your help to save someone who is special to me. Fona said. Isabu could tell his words were true and continued to listen as he cocked an eyebrow. I know this might come off as a selfish request. But please. I ask that you allow me to seal you inside of his body. The three tails was shocked and looked at Saiken as if he was joking. Do not mock me human. Why would I allow you to seal me away after I have just gained my freedom? Do you think we tailed beasts are simply here to be used as tools? The three tails shouted. It's not like that Isabu. Saiken said. Fona is different than the others. I believe he is the one father spoke of. Saiken said, trying to calm the three tails down. Isabu looked at Fona, seeing that his blue eyes were full of conviction and determination, unwavering in his request, no matter how unreasonable it sounded. But why would sealing me inside of this person save them? What good would it do for either of us? The three tails then said. Why would I allow you to seal me inside of someone just so you can save them? Surely you do not care so much about them if you have to seal me away in their soul. Fona looked down with a heavy heart. He's sick. He is but a boy, who I consider as a son. He has a world of potential. However, limited by his illness that is eating away at his chakra and his body. I believe that it would require a massive amount of chakra to eliminate such an illness, the kind that only a tailed beast possess. Fona said. Isabu could tell Fona was not going to give up seeing the determination in his eyes as he spoke about this child. And what if I say no? What is your plan then human? Isabu suddenly asked, looking at Saiken too. Do you plan to force me? Seal me away like all of the others before you. Isabu shouted as the memories of all the times it had been sealed away over the years passed through its mind. Fona remained silent for a moment as he broke eye contact and looked at the ground. I said to myself that if you didn't agree I would be prepared to seal you away by force. Fona said before he looked back into Isabu's eyes. But I also made a promise to Yagura that I would protect you. So, I guess I have changed my mind. He then said. I will not force you Isabu. The pain and suffering that has been inflicted upon your kind by humans ever since the great sage passed away has been nothing short of an atrocity, and cannot be forgiven. He said. But I know, Hago Romo believed that one day someone would come who you could trust, Fona said, using the sage's name this time taking Isabu off guard and causing him to remember his father's last words to all of them. I believe I have been chosen to fulfill that wish. And as the Mizu cage and a friend of Saiken, I ask you. Please help me. Fona said, not breaking eye contact with Isabu. Isabu looked hard at Fona, studying him as a glimmer of the Sage of Six Paths suddenly took his place, before Fona's image returned to normal. Causing the three tails to do a double take. You see it too, Isabu. Saiken said, remembering the first time he saw it happen. Isabu frowned for a moment but then gave an inside. Knowing there was no denying it now. Very well. I will agree to be sealed. The three tails said. Fona smiled. Thank you Isabu. I promise you will not regret this. He then said. We will see. Isabu then said, seeing the sage one last time in Fona's place. All right, I'll make the preparations. Fona said before he looked back into Isabu's eyes with a large smile. I won't forget this Isabu. Thank you. He said. Isabu felt a little flustered by his flattery but quickly batted it off as he pretended not to care. Okay, let us get on with it. It then said. Fona and Saiken also nodded before they ended their chat inside their inner worlds, returning to the physical one where they were still about to crash into the ocean. The three tails' body smashed into the ocean and all of the surrounding ice shattered, disappearing, and causing the others to worry that Fona had been defeated. We have to help him. May shouted as she lost sight of what was going on behind the huge waves. Even Ao couldn't see what was happening properly with his Biakugan. Hold on. Is that? He said as he finally got a clear picture of what had happened. Fona was stood on the three tails' head with his arm crossed while the three tails calmed the ocean down. Fona hopped off from its large body and allowed his sage chakra to leave his own body, causing his hair to turn back to black and his horns to vanish. So where is this child you wish to seal me inside of? Isabu asked, looking down at Fona who stood on the water. Fona smiled and created an ice mirror with his right hand, only waiting for a moment before young Kimimaro stepped through looking at Fona before he sensed the massive chakra behind him. Kimimaro slowly turned to look and Isabu was impressed that he remained calm, even smiling at the beast before him. So this is the boy. 
Isabu said taking a close look at Kimimaro. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Kimimaro said as he smiled at Isabu, taking the beast off guard. Yes. This is Kimimaro. Kimimaro, meet Isabu, the three tails. Fona said making the introductions. Isabu could smell that the boy was sick and realized Fona was speaking the truth about his illness indeed. Come closer child, Isabu said, looking at Kimimaro. Kimimaro looked a little surprised but didn't hesitate, stepping closer to the three tails. Is that enough? He asked, not sure if he should get closer. The three tails looked to Fona and nodded. I'm ready. It then said giving him a nod. Fona smiled and placed his hand on Kimimaro's shoulder. It's going to be all right now. He then said as he smiled at him. Fona smiled as he started making the hand signs, knowing he had already used a large amount of chakra to begin with. Lend me a hand Saiken. He said sheepishly in his mind. The six tails laughed and Fona's body suddenly burst to life with a single-tailed chakra cloak before he put one hand onto Kimimaro's stomach and another onto Isabu's body. Sealing Jutsu. Multi-layer tetragram seal. Fona shouted as Isabu's huge body suddenly compressed and traveled into Kimimaro's body all at once, making it quite the sight. Kimimaro was suddenly knocked back onto his back, splashing into the ocean as if he had been punched in the chest. Fona quickly stopped him from sinking into the water and created an ice mirror that took them to the others who had rushed down the cliff to the beach, having been alerted to what was going on by Ao. Fona. Lord Mizu Cage. The others shouted as they got closer. May could see that Fona was holding Kimimaro in his arms and she quickly rushed in to check on him. Oh, Kimimaro are you okay? She said, noticing the seal on his stomach. Ao also noticed the seal and was impressed, expecting no less of Fona at this point. It's a multi-layered tetragram seal, May. This way the three tails chakra will leak out spreading through each layer of the seal and blending harmlessly with his own chakra. This way it should cure his illness. Fona said. May looked into his eyes with tears in her own before looking back at Kimimaro who had fallen unconscious from the sudden strain put on his body. Nodding as she stroked his head. She had become close with the child over the time they had all spent together, seeing him as one of her own along with Haku. The others remained silent knowing it was not their place to question Fona, even if it was to do with one of the tailed beasts. All right then, I guess that's mission complete, Fona said as he looked all of the others in the eye. Everyone nodded, feeling a sense of bewilderment due to Fona pretty much doing all of the work. Still, though, they cheered and gave a nod. Come on all, let us return to the village, and worry not. Leave the report to me. Fona said as he creates two ice mirrors for everyone to walk through, surprising some of those who had never experienced the jutsu before. With that said and done, everyone walked through the mirrors that lead back to the Mizu Cage's office. Fona let May take Kimimaro home so he could rest, while he and Ao remained to sort out the paperwork. Fona also dismissed the others, granting them some well-earned time off missions, also making the arrangements for the two that had been killed in action. All in all, it had been a tough mission, facing the rakage was no easy feat and Fona was sure it would cause unwanted trouble in the future. But for now, he had other things he needed to concentrate on. Chapter 66, Chapter 66, New Arc A few weeks had now passed after the incident with the rakage. Thankfully nothing had come from it, and as far as Fona was concerned, no news was good news. Although he wouldn't hold his breath as he was sure something would happen eventually. On the other hand, Kaimimaro's body had taken to containing the three tails better than expected, with the seal doing its job. Fona had been right thanks to the sudden vast amounts of chakra that had been sealed inside of his body, along with the three tails chakra steadily mixing with his own. Kaimimaro's illness had started to reverse, making him healthy once again. Once he was able, Fona had both him and Haku training again, as he knew that Kimimaro would have to overcome the challenge of taming Isabu to control its power once he was ready. Something he wasn't worried about for now. The boys had come so far in their training and even with the time Kimimaro had taken off due to his sickness, he was still showing huge improvements as always. Also now that he was back up and fit, he would be able to go back out on missions with the others, and Fona had received the perfect one to get him back into the swing of things. Fona summoned Haku, Kimimaro, Koihoki, and of course Kaga, who was still their squad leader and sensei to his office to give them their new mission in person. All right you three, I've got a new mission request that I feel will suit you perfectly, Fona said with a smile. The three genin looked at him eager to know what it was, waiting for him to tell them the details of the said mission. We have received a request from a noble of the Land of Snow. 
he has decided to request a bodyguard escort to a party which will be held at the Damies, Lord Setsu's castle. Haku had a questioning look on his face, which Funa noticed, allowing him to speak. But why would a noble from the land of snow hire shinobi from another nation when they have their own shinobi? The boy asked, showing his knowledge of the world. That's a good question Haku. Sometimes these things happen, either due to price, or anything as far as political arguments and trust issues within one's own nation. Kaga said, answering his question. All that matters is that we have accepted the mission and placed it as a rank C. It should provide you all with some good traveling experience and shouldn't be anything to worry about. Funa then said, giving Kaga a nod before he threw him a scroll with the documents in. Besides, I hear the land of snow has an impressive level of technology that other places in the world don't have access to yet. Funa then added. This way, we might be able to form a friendship with them and perhaps gain in more than just a new client. The team nodded and started to get excited at the prospect of the new mission. Funa couldn't help smile as he watched them become excited and wished them luck, dismissing them from his office. Kaga and his team bowed before they headed out, leaving Funa with his advisors, who looked at him unable to hold their thoughts back. Is it really a good idea to send three children on such a mission? Would it not be better to send more experienced shinobi to ensure the success of the mission? One said. Ao also couldn't help but in. I had heard that the land of snow was currently in a particularly tough position and on the brink of a possible civil war. He said as he stroked his chin. Fona nodded, listening to their thoughts and concerns. However, he already knew what was going to happen, or at least had a good idea from his knowledge of the world during his previous life. Don't worry. I'm sure with Kaga there, nothing will go wrong. He said with a large grin on his face, trying to put the others at ease. However, they simply frowned, not seeing the funny side of things. You are the Mizu Cage. We follow your orders. The head elder then said as he and the others bowed before taking their leave, leaving Fona and Ao in the office alone. I can't wait to get to the land of snow. I hear it's so pretty there, covered in snow all year round. Koyoki said, getting excited about their new mission. Haku agreed with her as the two of them jumped around happily and full of energy before they turned to Kimimaro. Hey Kimimaro, what's the matter, are you feeling okay? Haku asked, noticing he seemed lost in thought. It's nothing, Kimimaro said as he looked up and smiled at Haku, reassuring him he was fine. Kage noticed Kimimaro seemed troubled but decided he would address that later. As first thing was to head over to the docks and board the transport that was waiting for them. Since Fona had become cage, the land of water had started to open its borders and become involved in heavy trade with as many lands as possible, opening up its waters and travel restrictions. This allowed them to travel between other lands more easily for missions and vice versa. This was why a new guard and border patrol force unit had been created, helping to protect the village and the land of water. The mist even had shinobi who monitored the sea, guarding against pirates and those who might try to sneak into their lands. The increase in trade had even led to the development of the village, which had started to grow in size, eventually spreading all the way out to the ocean where the old shipping yards had been. Now they were a thriving port in which all trade and travelers arrived and checked into the village hidden in the mist. Kaga and the others arrived at the port and could see many ships of various sizes that had docked. Cargo was being hauled on and off of the ships and checked by Miss Shinobi who were part of the border force. Kaga found the port where their transport was waiting and the four of them made a move towards the boat. It was a trading ship that had been given permission by the noble who hired the hidden mist to be used to transport their team into the land of snow, with the added bonus of protecting the goods on board. Welcome! A large man with a wooden leg shouted as Kaga and the others walked up the wooden plank onto his boat. You must be the mist ninja who have been hired by Lord Hoagie. The man said greeting them. It's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Peggy. Due to my leg. He said as he pointed to his wooden leg. Haku and Koyoki couldn't help but stare as Kaga cleared his throat. Nice to meet you, Peggy. I'm Kaga. This is Haku, Koyoki, and Kimimaro. He said making the introductions. Peggy raised an eyebrow at Koyoki as he heard her name, giving her a smile. Koyoki you say? Koyoki nodded as Peggy looked at her with a smile. That's the same name as our beloved princess of the land of snow. You'll be getting extra special treatment on board me lady. Peggy said as he gave her a large smile. Koyoki blushed a little while the others simply smiled, with Haku laughing. T thank you, Koyoki said not sure what else to say as she punched Haku in the arm. Alright, how about we make a move, it's a good week's journey to the land of snow from here, 
let me show you where you will be staying, Peggy said, nodding at them to follow him. They all followed him to the inside of the ship seeing the small cabins where they would be sleeping. The deck of the ship was quite large and the inside had a seating area where you could relax and eat with the engine room below that. Kaga had already counted about 30 other crew members aboard the large ship and once Peggy left, he asked his students how many they had counted and tested them on the layout of the ship to see how observant they had been. I counted 30, Haku said. No way. I got 28. Koyoki said, certain she was right. 30. Kimimaro also said. Kaga nodded. 30 is correct. Koyoki I think you missed the two chefs that were chatting in the kitchen as we passed it. Kaga then added, filling her in on what she had missed. Koyoki went a little red and crossed her arms angry at herself for losing to the others. All right you two, why don't you go and explore the ship, get some food and report back to me with anything you find. Understood. Kaga said to Haku and Koyoki. They both nodded, standing to their feet before they left their cabin, leaving Kaga and Kimimaro alone. Why don't you tell me what's on your mind Kimimaro? Kaga then said, knowing that the boy was still troubled. Kimimaro wasn't surprised that he had caught on inside. It's nothing sensei. He said clearly not wanting to share. Kaga raised an eyebrow as Kimimaro stood to his feet and excused himself from the conversation, leaving Kaga in the cabin alone. Well, that went well. I guess I'll give him some space for now. Fona did say he was struggling to come to terms with the three tails that was now inside of him. Kaga thought as he crossed his legs, remembering what Fona had told him before the mission. The first couple of days passed by without any issue for the group. Kaga had made them practice their chakra control by running on the surface of the ocean, following the boat for a good hour as they ran along the water after it. Haku and Koyoki had taken to it rather well, however, Kimimaro seemed to be lacking focus in his training, something that had not gone unnoticed by Haku. After that he had them go over team battle formations and tactics that would utilize their abilities strengths and weaknesses so they could face different opponents in all sorts of situations. Once that was complete, it was time for food and after, Kaga let them work on whatever it was they wanted to do. Kimimaro was still quiet and Kaga knew that he had not been sleeping much. Even Haku had noticed that something was wrong now and had decided to ask him what the matter was after training one day. The three of them had just spent an hour running along the ever-changing surface of the ocean, using a lot of chakra concentration before they climbed back up the ship and onto the large deck. They were all out of breath now and Kimimaro was about to walk off when Haku stopped him, pulling him to the side for a moment. What's the matter Kimimaro? He asked bluntly, his soft features fading for a moment as he pulled his arm. Kimimaro was shocked that Haku was taking time to ask him like this but he simply shook his head. It's nothing Haku. I'm fine. Kimimaro said pulling his arm free of Haku and walking away from him. Suddenly Kimimaro couldn't move and looked down to his feet, seeing they had been frozen over, trapping him in place. What are you doing Haku? He asked, looking him in the eyes. You're not going anywhere until you talk to me Kimimaro, Haku said as he lowered his hands. Kimimaro wasn't happy and frowned at his friend. I said let me go Haku, Kimimaro said in a more serious tone this time. Koyoki noticed what was happening and could see that things were growing heated between the two of them. Of course, Kaga had also noticed this but decided to let them carry on thinking that maybe Haku would be able to get through to him. No, Haku said, looking Kimimaro in the eye as he too grew serious. Kimimaro grit his teeth as he let bones grow from his feet to shatter the ice, freeing himself from Haku's grasp. I don't want to talk about it. He said as he turned his back on Haku again. Kimimaro suddenly felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end and turned around using a quick bone blade from his arms to block a handful of senbon needles from hitting him. Kimimaro was shocked that Haku had attacked him out of the blue like that and with intent to harm him too. What the hell? Kimimaro said as he looked at Haku with anger on his face. Why won't you talk to me? I've been watching you Kimimaro. You won't talk to anyone and I know you are suffering. Why can't, you trust me? Haku said in a hurt voice. Kimimaro could see the hurt in Haku's eyes and it seemed to hit a soft spot inside of his soul. I. Haku. I'm. He started. Look out. We're under attack. A voice suddenly shouted, alerting everyone to a surprise attack of Kunao with paper bombs that hit the deck all over the ship. Kaga hadn't even seen the attack coming as he had been too focused on Haku and Kimimaro, making sure they weren't going to try and kill each other. Koyoki had also not seen anything and she froze as the kunao with paper bombs landed all around her on the deck, 
not knowing what to do. Get to cover. Kaga shouted, getting everyone to move. Haku could see that the paper bombs were about to explode and quickly made a hand sign letting ice form all around Koyoki, Kimimaro, and anyone else on the deck to shield them from the explosion. Boom. All of the paper bombs exploded and caused massive damage to the ship, blowing holes in the deck and the side of the ship, letting water from the ocean suddenly spill in. Attack. A voice suddenly shouted as groups of pirates boarded the ship, all armed with swords as they stormed onto the ship, attacking anyone in their path. Haku had saved everyone on the deck with his ice and quickly looked at Kimimaro and Koyoki, who nodded, taking action. Kaga had also jumped into battle, saving two members of the crew as he quickly cut down a group of pirates that were about to kill them. Haku, use your ice to fill the holes and stop water leaking into the ship. Kimimaro, take the offensive and eliminate any and all enemies you come across with me. Koyoki, gather all of the survivors on the deck and protect them no matter what. Kaga suddenly shouted forming a plan in a split second before he vanished into action. The others all nodded and Kimimaro looked at Haku, smiling before he dashed off to attack some of the pirates that had climbed onto the deck. Haku also smiled and flipped over the side of the ship, forming hand signs and using his ice style to freeze all of the water around the base of the ship, stopping any more water from leaking into it. Kimimaro dashed at the group of pirates and let his bones suddenly expel from his body as he jumped towards them, forming a spiral of razor-sharp spikes killing any and all who dared get too close to him. Look out he's got some crazy ability. One of them shouted, trying to warn the others. But it was no use. Anyone who tried to attack Kimimaro was skewered by his bones as he ran through the group, slashing and thrusting, cutting them down one after the other like they were nothing. Kaga had already finished off the last of the pirates that had made their way inside of the ship and decided it was time to put an end to this once and for all. He dropped the collar of the last pirate he had finished off to look out of one of the windows, seeing the enemy ship that had anchored next to their ship, while more pirates tried to board. I don't think so, Kaga said as he quickly made his way to the deck and jumped onto the railing as he faced the pirates. The pirates could see Kaga standing there as he started to weave hand signs, panicking as they turned to their own caption. They have ninja bodyguards. One of them shouted. What the hell? We were told this would be an easy target. The captain said as he watched in horror while Kaga finished his hand signs. Quickly retreat. The captain shouted. However, their boat started to freeze over, and the pirate who was steering screamed in pain as his hands froze to the helm. What the hell is happening? The crew screamed in horror as the ice continued to spread. Kaga could see Haku had already started on his counter-attack and trapped all of the pirates on their ship with his ice style. Guess it's my turn. It's over for you. Water style. Giant Vortex Jutsu. Kaga shouted as he pumped a huge amount of chakra into the water-style jutsu. Suddenly the ocean started to twist and turn under the pirate's ship, soon turning violent and forming a massive whirlpool. What the hell is this? The pirate captain shouted. Suddenly the ship was swept up by the powerful vortex that had formed in the ocean, ripping the boat to pieces as the powerful current took a hold of it, shattering the wood and twisting the metal while the crew screamed in horror before they were all dragged to the bottom of the ocean never to be seen from again. Kaga breathed a sigh of relief as the water started to calm down, meaning he could take it easy from this point. Haku had already sealed all of the holes in the ship with his ice while using his water style to empty all of the water back out into the ocean. Kimimaro had finished off all of the pirates without a scratch, as to be expected from him after all. Koyoki had also gathered all of the crew onto the deck, keeping them safe and out of harm's way. They had all seen the amazing abilities of the Mist Shinobi and were amazed they had dealt with the pirates with such ease. Peggy was most pleased to see that not a single member of his crew had been harmed, thanks to the efforts of Kaga and his squad. A amazing. Thank you all so much. He shouted over and over again as the rest of the crew cheered. Kaga and the others gathered on the deck, telling them not to worry about it, and not long after they were back on track to the land of snow. Thankfully the ship engines had not been damaged and the crew quickly got to work to help try and repair the ship as best they could. Haku walked over to Kimimaro and punched him on the arm, giving him a playful smile as he did. Kimimaro returned his smile with one of his own, finally acting like his normal self again. Good to have you back with us, Kaga said, also noticing his expression. Kimimaro nodded to his sensei. Yes. Thank you everyone for bearing with me. He said, bowing to them all. All right, that's enough of that. Let's help out best we can with the repairs, all right. Kaga then said. Getting a nod from the others. 
The rest of the time passed without much issue and without any more attacks on the ship and before they knew it the land of snow had come into view. Land ahead! One of the crew shouted as he spotted it. Haku, Kimimaro, and Koyoki all sat on the edge of the deck as they looked into the horizon at the land of snow. We're finally here, Kimimaro said. I can't wait to get back on dry land again. Koyoki said having grown sick of the ocean. Well I don't think it's dry in the end of snow, Koyoki, Kaga said as he appeared behind his students, surprising them. Everyone laughed and greeted their sensei, looking back to the land of snow as it came into sight. I want you all to be on guard once we arrive, is that understood? The three of them nodded, picking up on the seriousness of Kaga's tone when he said it. Anything could happen here. Kaga said as he folded his arms over his chest, seeming overly serious. The three genin all nodded and looked towards the land of snow, preparing themselves for anything like Kaga said, with the sunrise shining upon them brightly as the new day started. Chapter 67, Chapter 67 The boat arrived in the dock at the land of snow and the crew disembarked, along with Kaga and his squad. Koyoki was glad to be back on dry land for one but now had to face the sudden cold that came with it. She could see that the landscape was covered in fresh snow as it covered everything in sight. It's so pretty but so cold. She said as she rubbed her arms trying to warm them. Haku smiled, unaffected by the cold as he took in the sights of the beautiful snow, picking up a small handful to look at it. However, the small white ball seemed to cause a momentary flashback of his childhood. Everything all right Haku? Kimimaro asked, noticing his distress all of a sudden. Why yet? I'm fine. He said as he shook the memories away. Replacing them with ones of his new family, dropping the snow from his hand as he did. Kaga also took a good look around, as he wrapped his white cloak around his shoulder and clipped the top together. All right everyone, keep an eye out for our liaison. He said, taking note of the small port town they had arrived at as people went about their business. Soon enough a snowmobile pulled up next to the port and a tall yet slender looking man stepped out, approaching Kaga seeing that they were Miss Shinobi from a mile away. Welcome Shinobi from the Hidden Mist, and welcome to the Land of Snow. I have been sent by Lord Sande to escort you to his estate. He said before he bowed. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Z. Pleased to meet you. He then said. Kaga nodded and made the introductions. Giving the others the sign to follow along. If you will be so kind as to follow me, we shall make our way. Z then said, getting them to follow him to the large snowmobile. Haku, Kimimaro and Koyoki had never seen anything like it before. Even Kaga was unfamiliar with such a form of transport but had heard of them before. Noting that the level of technology here was already more impressive than the land of water. Please hop in, this will make the trip much faster. He then said as he opened the driver's door, offering them a seat in the back. Everyone climbed into the back, getting as comfy as they could as he turned the engine on and started the snowmobile up. This is a rather new invention, a mechanical vehicle that can travel great distances across the snow at a good speed. One of many models that have been released. Z said. Haku and Koyoki were amazed as it started to move, the hum of the engine ticking along as it slowly drove over the snow with ease. Kimimaro was also impressed but hid it better than the others, taking more interest in the eyes that watched them from the surrounding forest outside of town. So you have noticed too, Kaga said with his arms crossed. Kimimaro nodded to his sensei, not expecting any less of him having already noticed that they were being watched. Don't worry. They probably just want to keep tabs on us, after all, we are shinobi from another land. Kaga said, putting Kimimaro at ease, just a little. The journey only lasted an hour or two and before they knew it, they had arrived at Lord Sande's estate. Kaga and the others hopped off, seeing that the estate already had security keeping watch and patrolling the area, none of which looked like shinobi. Kaga couldn't help wonder why the Lord had hired shinobi outside of his land and he was starting to slowly piece together the puzzle the more he saw. Z showed them into the estate and walked them into the main house where Kaga and the others would meet Lord Sande. Kaga could see four guards on either side of the room, with who he presumed was Lord Sande in the middle as he spoke to a group of men. Z announced his arrival and bowed to his master. I have returned with the Miss Shinobi as requested my lord. Sande turned around to look, giving a smile before he thanked his servant. Sande had short black hair with small black glasses on his face, wearing formal robes of his nation. Welcome. Welcome Shinobi of the Hidden Mist to the Land of Snow. He said as he got up and walked over to meet them. I am Lord Sande, please make yourself at home here. 
he said looking at Kimimaro, Haku, and Koyoki, smiling at them as he did. Pleased to meet you, Lord Sande, Kaga said as he greeted him. I am Kaga. This here is Koyoki, Haku and Kimimaro. He then said, introducing the others. Sande smiled at all of them, noting how young they looked, his expression showing surprise when Kaga said Koyoki's name like the sailors. But unlike them, he held his tongue for the moment. I assume your Mizu cage has told you why I hired you. He then said, looking back to Kaga as he spoke. Yes. You require an escort to a party being held by the daimyo of your land. Kaga said, laying out the facts he knew. Sande slowly nodded his head, turning to his men with a reassuring smile before he looked back to Kaga. Kaga could tell he wasn't getting the full story, but before he could say anything, Sande made the first move. Please, follow me so we may speak more privately. Kaga nodded before looking to Kimimaro and the others. You three stay here for now, and don't go anywhere. He said as he followed Sande. I assure you, they will be quite safe here Sir Ninja, Sande said before they made their way out of the room. Once Sande felt that they were alone he turned to face Kaga giving him a gloomy expression. I'm afraid I haven't been very honest with you. He said. Kaga could feel a request coming on here, and a dangerous one at that. You see. I have had wind of a plot to overthrow our daimyo by his very own brother. He plans to execute a coup d'etat at the party and has the backing of all of the other lords through fear. He even has the ninja from the land of snow at his side and well. I. I want to try and save our lord and the princess. He said with a heavy heart. I just can't bring myself to allow him to go ahead with such a plan. That's why I hired you, the hidden mist has a strong reputation and with your help, we can surely get them out of the country and to safety. Sande said. I know this is asking a lot of you, and that you have every right to decline. But please. I beg of you. He then said as he dropped to his knees. Kaga sighed as he processed the information he had been given, thinking everything over before he responded. What you are asking is for us to become involved with another country's political matters. This kind of mission is usually placed at rank AOR above. What you requested was placed at a rank C. I know. But please you must help us. I couldn't afford to spend any more money without it drawing too much attention. You must help us. Sande pleaded. Kaga sighed again and placed a hand on his head. I'm sorry but this is well above my pay grade pal. Besides, I don't think our Mizu cage would be very happy if he finds out you lied about such a huge detail now would he? Kaga said. Others have tried to hire groups from other lands for assistance too. But other than the Hidden Mist, the only others who were willing to provide us with Shinobi is the Hidden Leaf. Sande said. Surely with the help from two of the great nation, we can save our lord and the princess. The Land of Snow would forever be in your favor. I beg of you. Kaga couldn't help think back to Funa's words before they left for the mission. Somehow only just realizing he had a feeling he knew something like this was going to happen. That guy. Always one step ahead of everything. Kaga thought before he looked back to Sande. The hidden leaf you say? Kaga asked, ignoring the rest of what he said for now. Yes. Sande replied. And who have they sent you to help with your request? Kaga said, looking into his eyes. Some time later. So that's the scope of the real mission. Kaga explained to Koyuki and the others. They remained quiet and listened to Kaga's explanation of the real reason they had been hired to come to the Land of Snow. Although they had been hired as bodyguards for an escort mission, their real objective was to rescue the princess and her father, fleeing with them to safety if possible. With that said, this is now an A-rank mission, even possibly higher. Kaga finished, looking at Kimimaro and the others. Koyuki was shocked along with the others, but they had been trained well to keep their emotions in check and remain silent. The party is tomorrow night, it's being held at the Kazahana castle which belongs to the daimyo, Lord Satsu Kazahana, Kaga explained. We have to presume that the castle will be heavily guarded by snow ninja on all sides. Once inside we have been instructed to escort Lord Satsu and his daughter, Princess Koyoki out into safety by any means possible, even using violence if it means saving their lives. The others remained quiet as they listened to the plan. Haku already had a picture in his head and had an idea of just how hard this was actually going to be. There is a huge area of grey here where things could go wrong. I have been informed that Dot Kazahana who is the brother of the daimyo is the suspect. Intel suggests that he has plotted to overthrow and kill his brother and the princess. 
he has gathered support from the other lords of the land and has the full support of Yukagakur. Meaning once we become involved, they will try to kill us for sure. Kaga finally finished. Kimimaro also had a good idea of just how difficult this mission was going to be, deciding to voice a question he had. Would it not be easier to rescue both the daimyo and the princess before the party, sensei? Kaga smirked, knowing one of them was going to ask that. If only it was that easy. Our informant, Lord Sande has informed me that the castle is under full severance and would be next to impossible to penetrate. Leaving us with the party as our only means of entry. Kaga said, answering the boy's question. Kimimaro nodded in understanding. So that's why they were watching us as we arrived. He said as it made sense now. Yes. If we make one wrong move, the snow ninja will most likely attack us with everything they have, not wanting to take any risks here. I noticed that too, I also wondered why until now. Haku said. Koyoki was surprised to hear that they were already being watched, a little embarrassed she hadn't noticed hearing that Haku and Kimimaro had noticed. Sande has also informed me that they have also sought help from the Hidden Leaf Village. Kaga then said, getting a surprised reaction from his three students. Word is that they have sent Kakashi Hitaki, Kaga said, taking note of the reactions of the other. Kakashi of the Sharingan? The copy ninja. Haku said, clearly having read up on him in the bingo book. That's the one, Kaga said as he crossed his arms. Are we going to kill him? Kimimaro then asked plainly. No. Not unless we need to. After all, we might need his help. However, if possible we will deal with this alone. Kaga said, letting them know his intentions. With that, the three genin were dismissed to go and rest while Kaga worked out the rest of the details with Sande and the other lords who were on his side. He still felt like a fool for accepting the mission, hoping that Fona already knew something like this was going to happen and he sent them for this reason. The next day came fast and Kaga and his team had made all of the necessary preparations for the mission at hand. Readying their gear and equipment as they prepared for everything that they could. Night soon fell upon them and the time of the party was here. Sande had dressed in his formal robes and was also ready for what was about to happen, as well as the consequences that it would bring, not only upon himself but his entire nation. As agreed, Kaga and the others provided him with an escort to the castle. They travelled by snowmobile, one that was a little fancier than the last they had been in, fit for a lord of the land. Once they reached the castle grounds Kaga and the others could instantly see the level of security was no joke. Snow Ninja lined the trees and borders as they kept watch over everything. They also controlled the flow of traffic in and out of the castle grounds, booking in all guests, making sure they were on the list. Sande's snowmobile finally reached the front gate and came to a stop at the Snow Ninja's command as they asked for his name and invitation. I am Lord Sande. He said as he showed his invitation. The snow ninja also checked the vehicle and eyed Kaga and the others with intense suspicion. They are my private security and are here to escort me to and from the party. You will see they have been booked in and are on the list. Sande said bluntly to the snow ninja. The man checked the list next to Sande's name and could see he was telling the truth. So they are. Welcome, Lord Sande. The shinobi said as he gave the signal for the front gates to open for them, welcoming them inside. Sande and the others entered the castle grounds and his driver parked next to the other long line of snowmobiles. All right, remember the plan, Kaga said to the others before they got out of the vehicle. Haku and the others nodded and followed Kaga and Sande out into the open. The night air was cold and fresh snow fell from the dark sky, covering the ground in a fresh layer of snow that glowed from the lights provided around the castle. Sande walked towards the front entrance while Kaga and the others escorted him, keeping a close watch on their surroundings. They could tell that their every move was being watched and once they reached the front doors they would have to initiate their plan. Welcome Lord Sande. A large man said as he reached the main entrance. I see you have brought your own private security, I do assure you though, they will not be needed inside. The man said, eyeing the four of them up as he weighed them in. Thank you Lord Dot, Sande said as he realized who it was standing there, trying his best not to flinch. Of course. You can never be too careful these days and for the price they charge, one really cannot complain. He said, playing his part well. Dot smiled as he looked Kaga in the eye, looking at his hidden mist headband. Yes. I had heard that the new Mizu cage had made many welcome changes to the hidden mist village, one of them lowering the cost of their services by a rather large amount. He said before he looked at the three genin, weighing them up as he did. I can assure you though, your services will no longer be required here. 
he said in a blunt tone. It would seem not, Sande said agreeing with Dot. Your mission is complete as of this moment, you are dismissed until I am ready to leave, Sande said as he turned to look at Kaga, giving him the signal. Very well Lord Sande, Kaga said with a slight bow of his head. Please enjoy the party. We shall remain in the vehicle until you are ready to leave. He then said as he and the others took their leave, leaving Sande and Dot alone to enter the castle. Meanwhile, high above the entrance atop the castle, Kaga watched Dot with a careful eye as he blended into the darkness like a shadow. The mission is a go, he said through the earpiece he was wearing, provided to him by Lord Sande. Roger. Kimimaro, Haku, and Koyoki responded, each from a separate location in the castle grounds. Kaga then looked back down to the water clones of himself and the others as they got back into the snowmobile, being kept a strict watch on by the snow ninja who hadn't noticed yet. This should at least buy us a little time before they notice. Kaga thought as he slowly entered through a window, creeping into the room in silence before he shut it behind him. Kaga took a look around the room, noting that it was empty before he moved to the door, peeking through the crack to see the coast was clear. Now to find the princess. I only hope that the others don't run into any issues. Chapter 68, Chapter 68 Lord Sande followed Dot inside of the castle, finally arriving at the large hall where the party was being held. Sande was greeted by the other nobles of the land and forced to make small talk, noting that the princess and Lord Sitsu were currently not present which caused him concern. Kimimaro had snuck into the castle and was currently in the west wing. He crept in silence through the hallways, avoiding any passing patrols made by the snow ninja, not making a sound as he made his way through. So far he had failed to locate the princess or her father and decided to radio into the others to report his failed findings. This is Kimimaro. The west side is clear. He said through his earpiece to inform the others. Roger, Kaga responded. Move to phase two. He then said, letting Kimimaro know what to do next. Haku was doing the same, scouting the south end of the castle, but just like Kimimaro his search had yielded no results. The daimyo had multiple rooms in the castle where he could be located, meaning they had a large area to search. This is Haku. No sight of the target on this end either. He reported. Kaga was currently walking through the main hall, disguised as a waiter serving drinks from his tray. Roger. Move to phase two. Kaga said slowly before giving a smile to a guest as he handed them some champagne. Roger that, Haku out. Haku said as knelt on a wooden beam overlooking a large hallway as he blended into the shadows. All that remained now was to wait for Koyoki's report to see if she had found any trace of the princess or her father. Koyoki, report, Kaga said. Waiting for a response. A moment passed with no reply and so Kaga sent another message. Koyoki, report. Koyoki could hear Kaga's voice in her ear. However, she was currently occupied as a masked man holding a kunau to her throat glared at her seeing through her disguise with ease. Who are you? The man with white hair said as he looked at her with caution. The man spotted the earpiece and pushed his kunau up against her throat one last time. You better start talking before I get impatient. He said, giving her one last warning. Koyoki saw no other option and released her transformation jutsu, revealing her identity to the man. Hidden mist. He said as he took in her appearance. They said they had hired you. He said as he slowly pulled his kunau away from her throat. Koyoki was able to get a proper look at the man now as he stepped back a little, revealing his identity to her. Kakashi Hotaki. She muttered softly. You had better radio through so your squad knows you are all right. Kakashi then said as he took another look around to make sure the coast was still clear. Right. She said as she slowly reached for her earpiece. Koyoki reporting in. I'm with Kakashi of the Hidden Leaf. She said, letting the others know. Kakashi turned back to Koyuki, sighing as he made up his mind. I don't like to have to do this, but I think it's better for all if you don't get in my way. He said as he suddenly pulled his headband up that was covering his eye to reveal his Sharingan. Koyuki was hypnotized by his eye as it spun around, casting a powerful genjutsu on the girl before she fell unconscious. Don't worry, I'll make sure to hide you out of sight so you are safe. He then said as he pulled his headband back down standing over Koyoki with his hands in his pockets. Kaga and the others heard her transmission come through their earpieces, Kaga, of course, remained calm and continued to play his part as a waiter. However, both Haku and Kimimaro broke off from their location to rush to her aid, knowing she would stand no chance alone. Do not engage. 
Koyoki, can you hear me? Kaga said once he got the chance. Her silence prompting Haku and Kimimaro to move faster. Darn it. Haku, Kimimaro, get to Koyoki. Kaga said. Already on it. Both of them responded as they rushed through the castle as quickly as they could without drawing any attention. Kakashi placed Koyoki's body to the side, hiding it out of plain sight so she would be safe before he placed his disguise as a snow ninja back on, walking into the hallway before disappearing. Not long after Haku arrived slowly entering the room that he could sense Koyoki coming from. He was careful to search for traps first and was surprised when he found none. Haku quickly dashed to her side and took a look at her, feeling that she had only been placed in a simple genjutsu. How is she? Kimimaro asked as he suddenly appeared next to Haku. She's alright it's just a harmless genjutsu. He must have placed it on her to stop her getting in his way. Haku said as he placed one hand on her arm. Release. He said as he channels his own chakra into her, breaking the genjutsu. Koyoki suddenly shot up and took a deep breath as she realized what was going on. Haku, Kimimaro? Wait, what happened? It's alright Koyoki, everything is fine, Haku said as he reassured her. Where did Kakashi go? Kimimaro asked, not seeing any trace left by him to follow. I don't know. It happened so fast, he just... It doesn't matter. What's important is that we get on with the mission. Kimimaro said. Haku nodded as he stood back to his feet. We should stick together for now. We can't take Kakashi one on one if it comes to a fight. He said. The others agreed before Kimimaro spoke. All right, let's get going. Meanwhile, Kaga was still blending in with the party guests as a waiter. The main hall only had ninja around the exterior of the hall, meaning the inside was relatively safe to operate inside of. All of the guests had arrived now and Kaga could see Dot greeting them all as he made his way around the room, shaking hands and making small talk. However, he was still surprised to see that the princess and her father, Lord Satsu were not present at the party yet. Kaga knew something wasn't right, he could feel it in his gut, but he could only hope that the others made it in time to stop whatever was going to happen. Kaga watched as Dot rose to the center stage, gaining the attention of all the guests as they quieted down for him to speak, watching him with eager eyes. Welcome, lords and ladies of the Land of Snow. It's a pleasure to see you all here tonight, and I thank you on behalf of my brother. He said, letting his words linger in the air. However, I am afraid my brother will not be attending the party tonight. As well, you see. I am now the lord of the Land of Snow. Dot said. Getting a shocked reaction from those who didn't already know his plans. Suddenly the doors burst open and swarms of snow ninjas sprinted into the hall surrounding the guests and blocking off all the exits. The crowd gasped in horror as they realized what was happening. For those of you who are with me, no harm shall befall you. But for those of you who are not. He said, allowing his snow ninja to suddenly arm themselves with Kunao. Well, I think you get the picture. He said as an evil smile formed on his face. The signal had been given all around the castle for the snow ninja to act, all of them moving into position and carrying out their orders. Now. A female said as she watched from the distance of the snowmobile that Kaga and the other's clones were set in. Boom. The snowmobile suddenly exploded causing it to flip into the air as it set ablaze. That should show those mist scum. She said as she stood to her feet, admiring her handiwork. Kakiyaku. A snow ninja shouted as he ran over to her. It was a fake. The mist ninja were only clones. The man said, getting an angered expression from her. Darn it. That means they are already inside. She shouted, suddenly rushing off towards the castle. Kimimaro, Haku, and Koyoki had made it to the daimyo's chambers, hoping to find Lord Satsu. They entered the chambers from the ceiling moving through the tatami mats of the room above as to enter undetected. Looks like we found them, Kimimaro said as he spotted both the princess and her father, who sat on his lap while he brushed her hair. Suddenly a group of snow ninja burst into the room, killing his bodyguards in an instant, with one man stepping forwards. What is the meaning of this? Satsu shouted as he pulled his daughter back behind him to protect her. Forgive us Lord Satsu, but Lord Dot sends his regards. The man said as he drew a blade from his back. Kimimaro and the others watched from above at what was going on and were about to jump into action, when suddenly all of the snow ninja dropped to the floor dead as one of them dashed forwards and blocked the man's blade with his own, saving Satsu and the princess. What is the meaning of this? The snow ninja said. 
The man had purple hair that was tied back in a ponytail behind his headband. He had teal eyes and purple markings on his forehead and below his eyes. Both of the men pushed each other back, and the other disguise disappeared revealing his identity. Kakashi Hotaki. The man said as he took in his appearance. Rganatare, Kakashi said as he also took in his appearance, holding his ground in front of Lord Satsua and the princess. So they hired the leaf to try and intervene did they, Rga said as he smiled, standing tall in front of Kakashi. You could say that, Kakashi said, standing his ground wearing his Anbio gear. Although officially I'm not here. He said giving a smile. Also, now would be a good time for you three to lend a hand. He said, speaking to Kimimaro and the others. He knew we were here all along. Koyoki said, surprised. Haku and Kimimaro didn't hesitate and quickly burst from their cover as they landed around Satsua and the princess. Miss Chinobi. Riga said in surprise. I thought Fubuki took care of you. He said. No matter, you will not escape. Riga shouted as more snow Shinobi suddenly flooded the room, surrounding them from all sides. Haku. Now would be a good time to get us out of here. Kimimaro said, looking at him. I can't use that jutsu like that. He said, referring to the ice mirror transportation jutsi that Fona used. What's the plan? Koyoki said as she held onto the kunao in her hands tightly. I'm still thinking. Kimimaro said as he tried to think of a way out without risking the life of the princess and her father. Kakashi was the first to move as he quickly threw a kunao with a paper bomb attached to it at the back wall, causing it to explode and stun everyone in the room for a moment. Go now. He shouted as he quickly blocked an attack from Rge who had launched forwards not hesitating like the others. Kimimaro turned to Haku and Koyoki. You two go and get them out of here. He shouted. What about you? Koyoki asked, confused. Let's go Koyoki, he will be fine. Haku said as he quickly dashed and picked the princess up, throwing her over his back against her will. What are you doing? Put me down. She screamed as he did so. Koyoki nodded as she quickly ran over to Lord Satsua and took his arm. Quickly this way. She shouted, pulling him towards the large hole in the wall. We can't jump from here. Satsua shouted as he hesitated. We don't have a choice. Koyoki shouted as she jumped, pulling him with her and following Haku who was free falling with the princess as she screamed at the top of her lungs. Kakashi watched them jump as he was locked in a tense battle with Rge, feeling the pressure due to the strange armor he was wearing but he felt better now he could fight without worrying about having to protect them. Kimimaro quickly dashed towards his aid, letting bones rip throughout his body and anyone else who got too close trying to stop him. Arg! The snow ninja screamed as he ripped through their ranks with ease, slashing and hacking away at anyone he got close to. What the hell is that brat? Riga shouted as he flipped back away from Kakashi as Kimimaro charged at him. Kakashi was also surprised, remembering the last time he had seen such an ability. Kimimaro landed and stood next to Kakashi, giving him a nod before he looked back at Rge. That's just like the Mizu cages. Kakashi thought, making the connection. He didn't linger on the thought too long and quickly started back to action. I'm not that easy. Rge shouted as he made a few hand signs. Kakashi's eyes opened wide as his Sharingan noticed what he was doing. We need to jump now. He shouted at Kimimaro, turning and running towards the hole in the wall. Kimimaro didn't hesitate and followed Kakashi with haste. Not so fast. Riga shouted as his hand signs triggered paper bombs that had been planted all around the room to explode, engulfing the room in fire and smoke as the explosion burst throughout the castle shaking its very foundations. Meanwhile, Kaga was trapped inside the main hall with the other lords, surrounded by a small army of snow ninja who he placed at, at least Chunin level. Kaga's role was to protect Lord Sande and get him to safety if possible. However, that would be easier said than done now. I am going to read a list of names now. If your name is on this list, then you shall be executed for standing against me. Dot said as he pulled a piece of paper out. This is an outrage. A large man shouted as he stood above the crowd. Dot simply smiled, raising a hand to stop a snow ninja from killing him so he could talk. You would seize power for yourself and kill any and all who oppose you. We shall not stand for this. You will not get away with this. The man shouted, trying his best to rally the other nobles with him. I'm afraid I already have, Dot said as he gave the order for him to be killed. The snow ninja swiftly dashed and slit his throat, allowing blood to spray all over before his body hit the floor. Arg! 
The screams began as everyone watched in horror, while Dot simply smiled as he began reading names from the list. One by one, those whose names were read fell, each of them being killed in rapid succession as he continued to read the names out loud, not slowing his pace. Amidst the slaughter, the explosion from above shook the entire hall, causing the lights to shake and flicker, taking everyone's attention away from what had been going on for a moment. Kaga was also surprised but took his chance, quickly grabbing Sande and bursting through an exit that was least covered with Snow Ninja. Stop them! Dot roared as he watched them escape. The Snow Ninja nodded and quickly gave chase, quickly gaining on Kaga as he burst through the halls of the castle, doing his best to find an exit that wasn't surrounded by enemies. Haku and Koihoki were free falling through the sky with the princess and her father in hand, the cold air and snow blurred their vision as they fell at speed, with the pair screaming from the terror of the fall. Ice style, crystal ice mirror. Haku said as he made the hand signs, creating two mirrors. He and Koihoki both fell into the first mirror before they quickly passed through the next, rolling safely into the snow that broke their fall. They both looked up at the castle to see the huge explosion burst through the top layer, engulfing it in flames causing them to fear the worst. Did they make it? Koihoki asked as she looked at Haku. Haku had placed the princess down now, allowing her to run over to her father for comfort, thankfully both of them were fine, just a little shaken up. There. Haku shouted as he spotted two dots burst out of the smoke and into the sky as they fell from the castle. Catch them Haku! Koihoki shouted as she watched. Haku was already on it as he created two ice mirrors again, causing both Kimimaro and Kakashi to suddenly burst out of the one on the ground, hitting the thick snow that broke their fall for them. Kimimaro slowly stood to his feet, shaking himself free of the snow as he looked around, seeing no sign of Kakashi. Thanks for the help, Kakashi said as he appeared on a tree branch above them. Everyone looked up to see him before he jumped down and walked over to Lord Sitsu. My lord, my name is Kakashi Hitaki, of the Hidden Leaf Village. My mission is to rescue you and Princess Koihoki and retreat you to the Land of Fire, where you will be safe. He said in a serious tone. Sitsu looked down at his daughter who stood behind him before he looked back at his castle. I was warned this might happen. But I never believed that my own brother would betray me like this. He said, clearly in turmoil over the events that had transpired. Please Lord Sitsu, we don't have much time, Kakashi said. You don't have any time at all. A voice suddenly shouted as a rain of kunao burst from the sky. Kakashi quickly grabbed Sitsu and the princess, dashing out of the way while Haku and the others jumped to cover. The kunao burst as they hit the ground, causing ice to spring from the snow as it skewered anything it touched, gaining Haku's attention. A woman and a man suddenly appeared from the darkness with a small army of snow ninja at their backs. The female had green eyes and pink spiky hair that stuck out of two holes at the top of her grey helmet, reminiscent of pigtails. She also has small circular dark pink eyebrows. While the rather large man had a short crop of purple hair and dark eyes. He wore the standard snow ninja uniform which consisted of a blue and white outfit. Well well, if it isn't Kakashi the copy ninja. The woman said. Kakashi didn't recognize them but knew they were at least jonin level. He's a strong one misery, watch out. She said to the large man. Don't worry about me, Fubuki. He said as he eyed up Kimimaro and the others. Now, hand them over, Fubuki said as she extended her arm. Kakashi didn't like their odds here, knowing that with that many of them, their chances were slim at best. I'm afraid I can't do that, Kakashi said as he pulled out his Sharingan to remain on high alert. Then you leave us no choice, Fubuki said as she gave the signal for her men to attack. The horde of snow ninja suddenly charged forwards, each of them drawing a kunao as they did. Kimimaro turned to Haku and Koihoki. You two handle the leaders, leave this lot to me. He shouted before charging towards the wave of snow ninja. Haku nodded and turned to Kakashi. Get them out of here. Leave this to us. He said, turning his attention back to the enemy. Kakashi was surprised, not thinking that they could handle this situation. But then again. He knew the conduct of Miss Chinobi and after seeing the abilities of Kimimaro, knew they were no mere children. Right. Kakashi said as he picked up the princess and quickly escorted Lord Sitsu into the forest. This way. Arg. Kimimaro shouted as he charged head first into the wave of shinobi, letting his bones flare to life as his body became covered in razor sharp weapons. That kid got a death wish. Fubuki said as she laughed. However, she quickly realized that he was no joke, watching as he cut everyone to ribbons, 
seeming as if he was untouchable. No way. What the hell is that kid? She shouted in disbelief. Kimimaro flipped and jumped, slashing with his arms and legs and he fought as hard as he could, using all of the Taijutsu training that Fona had taught to him, allowing him to utilize his entire body as a weapon at any time, rending him almost untouchable to Taijutsu attacks. One after the other they fell as they tried to fight against the monster that was Kimimaro of the Hidden Mist. Screaming as they were impaired or cut to pieces. Fubuki had seen enough and started forming hand signs to intervening when suddenly Haku appeared and threw a handful of Senbon at her. However, they bounced off as if they had been replied by an invisible force. Not that ease kid. She shouted as she turned her attention to him. Ice style swallow snowstorm. She shouted as she turned the snow around her into a flock of icebirds that flew towards Haku like a storm of shuriken. Haku was caught off guard as he watched her use an ice style jutsu, not knowing that the snow ninja could use ice style. However, he quickly regained his composure and flipped backwards to dodge the attack. The snowbirds quickly flew around and changed direction as they headed back towards him, ready to skewer him. But Haku wasn't so easy. Ice style, ice wall. He said as he created a wall of solid ice that blocked all of the ice shurikens. Ice style, ice prison jutsu. Fubuki shouted as she slapped her hand onto the ground, causing large pillars of ice to spring to life trapping Haku inside one of them as he tried to jump out of the way. Fubuki looked at her handiwork and smiled. That's one down. She said as she placed her hand on her hip, seeing Haku trapped inside the ice pillar. Meanwhile, Koyoki had stood her ground as the larger man Misery charged at her on what looked like a snowboard. He glided along with the snow at impressive speed towards her ready to attack. Koyoki quickly flipped back into the air as she threw a handful of kunao at him. However, they simply bounced off thanks to his strange armor. What the hell? She thought as she landed and watched him turn around on the snow ready to charge towards her again. All right then. Wind style, air bullets. She shouted as she made the hand signs and unleashed a barrage of air bullets at him. But once again, the armor he was wearing seemed to cancel out her jutsu, as if it had been blocked by an invisible force, leaving her with only the option to dodge again. Not so fast little girl. He shouted as he jumped off the snowboard, slamming his fist eye into the ground as she avoided his attack. Misery charged and attacked with powerful punches that shattered the ice and snow beneath them as Koyoki flipped backwards again and again doing her best to dodge. Quickly she threw a handful of kunao, this time with wires attached to them in different directions trying to trap him in them, but he easily cut the wires with his own kunao before he threw it at her. Koyoki dropped to the ground to avoid the metal projectile hitting her, but in doing so she had left herself wide open to an attack from above. Say good night. Misery shouted as he dropped from the sky with a heel kick slamming and into her back. Koyoki's body suddenly burst into smoke and Misery could see that his foot had snapped a wooden log, wrapped in paper bombs for added effect. She did that on purpose. He shouted as he noticed the paper bombs and tried to jump out of the way. Her substitution exploded before he could get fully clear and Misery was sent flying into a large tree which his back slammed against. Koyoki suddenly appeared as she formed more hand signs in front of him, flipping to the ground from the tree above. Fire style. Fireball Jutsu. She shouted as she unleashed the large breath of burning fire. The fire engulfed him as she used his arms to shield his face from the heat. So far his strange armor was holding up and the fire style had little effect. Not that easy little girl. He roared. Now wind style, violent gale. She also shouted as she formed more hand signs and unleashed a wind style jutsu that amplified her fire style, creating a massive vortex of fire that slapped misery back against the tree engulfing him in flames. Let's see you survive that. She said as she watched his armor crack from the powerful jutsu, no longer being able to protect him as he screamed in burning agony. Fubuki watched as Misery was blasted back by the explosion and was about to rush to his aid when suddenly a presence from behind her caused her to jump to safety. Haku was stood there silent as if nothing had happened, simply watching her with interest. You. But how? You should be. She said not understanding how he had escaped her ice prison jutsu. At first I thought you possessed the Keki I Genkai. But now I see that you simply manipulate the ice with your chakra. Haku said bluntly. Fubuki didn't know what he was talking about and quickly formed hand signs. Just shut up and die kid. She shouted. Ice style. Dragon vs tiger. She said as she made the hand signs, summoning a large ice dragon to form from the snow. Haku didn't move and the ice dragon crashed down upon him, 
freezing him in a large blast before it vanished. That will teach you brat, Fubuki said as she looked at his body, frozen in the ice jutsu. However, Haku smiled from inside the ice and simply floated to the edge of it before he walked out as if nothing had happened. T that's not possible. Fubuki shouted in horror at what he had just done. You simply manipulate the ice. But I have complete control over it. Haku said as he raised his hands and crossed his middle finger over his index finger, forming the hand signs for his crystal ice mirrors. Fubuki watched as large ice mirrors suddenly formed all around her, each of them linking together as they trapped her inside an ice mirror prison with no way out. An ice style. It can't be. She said as she noticed Haku's reflection appear in all of the mirrors. No. You are a member of the Yuki clan. She shouted as she looked around the ice prison in horror. That's right, Haku said as he raised one hand, all of his reflections copying his moments. I'll show you the power of a real ice style user. He said as the ice mirrors started to bubble and slowly ripple and shake. Ice style. Crystal ice mirrors execution. Haku said softly as ice spikes suddenly burst forth from every angle, crushing anything and anyone trapped inside the prison. Fubuki didn't even have time to scream as she was crushed in an instant, leaving nothing other than a pile of blood and mush. Kimimaro was still flipping and spinning around, cutting down wave after wave of snow ninja. He must have killed at least 60 of them now, yet they still charged at him trying to subdue him with numbers. They had tried to use ninjutsu too, thinking that if they could get close that they would keep him at range. However, Kimimaro simply allowed his bone to fire out from around his body at high speed, shredding anyone they hit from distance. It didn't matter what they used. Kunao, Shuriken, Taijutsu, Ninjutsu. He was simply too fast and too deadly. He's a monster. We can't win. The snow ninja shouted as they turned to look for their commanders. They could see that both Fubuki and Misery were down now and what little remaining moral they had left vanished. Retreat. They shouted, turning and running for their lives. There must still have been over 100 of them left, but when faced against the monster of the mist, they stood no chance. Haku. Kimimaro shouted to him as they all ran. Haku nodded and formed a large number of hand signs as he roared. Ice style, snow tsunami. He shouted as he let his chakra burst to life. With such a large amount of snow and ice at his feet, it was easy for him to manipulate it to his will, rather than creating ice from simply the moisture in the air. Haku had turned the snow at the ninja's very feet into a violent wave that swept all of them up like an avalanche burying them beneath it and trapping them there. Kimimaro and Koyoki joined Haku, with Kimimaro whistling as he watched his jutsu in action. I bet that one tired you out. He said. Haku was a little out of breath but wasn't too bad. We should get back to the castle and make sure Kaga-sensei is all right, Koyoki said, interrupting their fun. Kimimaro nodded. You're right. Let's get a move on, our work here is down. He said. Koyoki and Haku nodded but Koyoki pulled Kimimaro to the side for a moment before they did. She formed a few quick hand signs and suddenly water blasted him from the ground. What the hell was that for? He said confused. Well, I couldn't leave you covered in blood now could I? She said with a smile. Haku also laughed as he looked at his face. Let's get moving. Haku then said, as his laughter subsided, causing the three of them to get serious again. Kaga had done his best to flee managing to escape from the castle with Sande and get past the forces that had tried to stop him so far. Kaga was a jonin level ninja and expert swordsman, even being considered as one of the next in line for the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, meaning that most of the normal snow ninja didn't stand a chance against him. However, there was still one who could pose a challenge, one who was also known in the bingo book. And now Kaga stood face to face with him, clasped in a stare down. Rga of the hidden snow, Kaga said as he stood in front of Sande. Kaga of the Bloody Mist, Riga said with a smile. First Kakashi of the Sharingan, and now Kaga of the Mist. We truly underestimated just how far these pathetic nobles would go to protect their lord and princess. Riga said. As they spoke Kaga could sense that he had become surrounded by snow ninja. To his back was the castle that burned, providing light throughout the night sky, illuminating the falling snow as it covered the already white blankets. Yet to his front was an army of snow ninja, lead by a powerful shinobi. You will not escape alive, Riga said as he gave the order for his men to attack. Here we go, Kaga said as he watched the waves of snow ninja descend upon him. Chapter 69, Chapter 69 Kaga stood face to face with Riga of the hidden snow, 
along with his small army of ninja that surrounded them, forming a circle, leaving Kaga and Lord Sande nowhere to go. Raga smiled as his posture rose, knowing that Kaga had no way out. It's over for you, you might as well surrender and die. He said. Kaga was struggling to think of a way out, knowing he couldn't take on such a large number of shinobi and protect Lord Sande at the same time. When suddenly an idea came to mind, a long shot, but with no other options, he wasn't exactly left with much choice. A big man when surrounded by your forces. But what are you when you take that all away? Kaga said, trying to provoke him. Raga was smart though, knowing what Kaga was trying to do and not falling for the bait. My, my. Is that really your plan? He said as he was about to shut his pathetic attempt at provoking him down. However, before he could finish speaking, one of his men spoke his mind. We aren't afraid of you mist scum. He shouted, getting the others all riled up. Yeah, Raga can take you all by himself. Another said, getting the others pumped up now. Raga wasn't impressed by his men, having fallen for Kaga's trap. Show him the power of us snow ninja Raga. Yeah, mess him up Raga. The group of snow ninja started to chant for their leader, egging him on to take Kaga out in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Giving Kaga exactly what he wanted. Kaga smiled as he stepped forwards, knowing his plan had worked, perhaps not on Raga himself, but the result of it working on his men was even better. Well. If you think you can, then come and prove it. Kaga shouted, enraging the snow ninja that surrounded him. Raga now knew he had no choice. If he backed out of this challenge he would lose all respect his men held for him. Kaga took the center of the circle, pulling a scroll from his hip as he tossed it into the air where it opened and burst, creating smoke. A large sword appeared and flipped through the air before Kaga caught the hilt and twirled it around with skill as he took his fighting stance. Raga instantly realized Kaga's skill with a blade, seeing that the information in the bingo book was true. Raga quickly drew his own short dagger, knowing he would have to remain on guard. I guess I have no choice. He said as he took his own stance. You will die mist scum. Raga shouted as he charged in on the attack, slashing down with his short sword. Kaga smiled as he blocked the attack, pushing Raga back with his strength and pressing on the counter-attack after they clashed. Kaga slammed his blade down, hitting the ground as Raga avoided the blow. Quickly Kaga pulled his blade up and blocked a flurry of blows from Raga while the two exchanged in a vicious flurry. Take this. Kaga suddenly shouted as he blocked one of Raga's slashes by slamming his blade into the ground. As he did he used his sword to push off as he spun around and planted a kick into Raga's chest, with the blow knocking him flying back skidding across the snow. Why you? Ice style, snow shuriken. Raga shouted as he formed the hand signs before he flipped backwards onto his feet. The snow around him burst into the air as it formed into hundreds of shuriken that suddenly exploded towards Kaga, threatening to shred him to pieces. Water style water wall. Kaga shouted as he made the hand signs and fired a large burst of water out of his mouth. The shuriken hit the water wall and stopped in their tracks, allowing Kaga to jump over the water wall, throwing his sword at Raga as he did. Raga was shocked, being forced to stop making more hand signs and dodge the attack, meanwhile allowing Kaga to make his own hand signs. Water style, water dragon jutsu. He shouted as he used the water from his water wall to transform into a mighty dragon that burst forth towards Raga. Raga didn't have time to avoid the attack and was forced to cross his arms over his face to defend himself. But to Kaga's surprise, the water dragon burst around him as if it had hit an invisible force, dispensing into the air. Raga smiled as the water cleared around him. Seeing that his chakra armor had worked in negating the ninjutsu. My turn. Ice vs Tiger. Raga shouted as he created a huge ice-style tiger that dashed towards Kaga. Not good. Kaga shouted as he quickly dashed as high into the air as he could trying to avoid the jutsu at the last second. But Raga quickly appeared behind Kaga, taking him by surprise as he slashed at his back. Kaga was able to turn midair at the last second and block the attack with his own sword, but the force of the blow caused them to both drops back down to the ground. Kaga was indeed impressed by Raga's skill. But he was more impressed by the strange armor he wore around his body. Somehow that strange armor was able to repel my jutsu. He thought as the two circled each other, both looking for an opening, as the snow ninja cheered from the sidelines. I can see why you made your way into the bingo book, Raga said. Kaga smiled. I could say the same about you. Or perhaps it was thanks to that armor. Kaga said. Raga didn't let his comment bother him as he took a good look at the suit. Do you like it, Kaga? It is rather handy now, isn't it? 
I must say, I didn't quite believe it at first. But this suit is one amazing piece of technology. Not only does it repel all ninjutsu and genjutsu, but it also boosts my chakra reserves. Here let me show you. He shouted as he suddenly started making more hand signs. Ice style, horned white whale. Rga shouted. Suddenly the snow all around them burst to life as a huge ice whale with a horn on its head exploded from the ice in the ground. Kaga was shocked at the size of the jutsu, doing his best to avoid the massive beast as it jumped into the air, its size covering the glow of the moonlight sky. As soon as the whale was in the air it seemed to come crashing down just as fast. All of the snow ninjas had already run to cover, those who were too slow would be left to be crushed under its enormous weight. Kaga was, unfortunately, one of those who didn't have time to get out of the way, as the whale came crashing down, creating a massive shock wave that ripped the trees from the ground and kicked up a huge amount of debris. Rga watched from the distance as his jutsu came crashing down with a mighty roar. That should have put a stop to him. He thought as he waited for the debris to clear. Suddenly the hairs on his neck stood on end as he turned to see where Lord Sande had been. However, the men that had been watching him were now dead and Sande was nowhere to be seen. Don't tell me he escaped. Rga shouted. Realizing Kaga had used his jutsu as a distinction and escaped. Find them. Do not let them escape. Rga shouted to his men, who realized the same thing now that the debris had cleared. Spread out and cover every part of this forest. Roga shouted to his men as they dispersed, moving as fast as they could. Cuse that bastard. Rga muttered as he looked into the night sky before he too vanished to help in the search. Meanwhile Haku, Kimimaro and Koihoki were rushing through the forest trying to head towards Kaga as quickly as they could. They had completed their end of the mission and helped Kakashi get the Lord and Princess away and to safety. Now all that was left was to regroup with Kaga and help rescue Lord Sande, if they were still alive. Look. Over there. Haku suddenly shouted as he spotted the huge ice whale jutsu in the sky before he watched it crash into the earth. That must be where Kaga Sensei is fighting. We have to hurry. Koyoki shouted, fearing the worst. Come on let's move. Kimimaro said, as he suddenly shifted his speed up a gear and dashed off. Haku did the same with Koyoki following behind them. As they did Kimimaro suddenly felt a presence and turned around to see Kaga and Lord Sande running along the ground below. There. Kimimaro shouted to the others who had also spotted them now. Kaga Sensei. Haku shouted as the three of them dashed down towards them, happy to see he was still alive. Good you three are all right. Quickly we have to escape, there is no time for small talk. We need to get out of here ASAP. Kaga said, knowing the snow ninja were fresh on their tail. Kimimaro and the others nodded at the situation and Haku and Koyoki took a hold of Lord Sande under each of his arms. Come on let's get a move on. Kaga said, not wanting to waste any more time. Kaga suddenly felt the hairs on his neck stand on end and turned around to see an incoming attack. Look out. He shouted trying to warn them. A rain of ice style kunao suddenly hit the ground all around them and caused the ice and snow to burst up forming razor sharp spikes. Kimimaro was able to counter them with his own bones, snapping the ice with them before it could hit him. Kaga quickly grabbed Sande and Koyoki as he dashed up into the trees for cover, avoiding the barrage that followed him while Haku simply stopped the ice with his own chakra before it even came close to him, seeing how he could completely control the element with his chakra, unlike the snow ninja. Kimimaro and Haku both looked at each other and then at the large amount of snow ninja that had surrounded them, each having a smile on their face. Let's do this. Kimimaro shouted as suddenly fired round after round of bone bullets towards them, using his wits to help move them into position for Haku, and of course, killing any who thought they could block them with mere kunao. Haku smiled as he started making hand signs, locking onto all of the snow ninjas he could before he slapped his arms onto the ground. Ice style, ice graveyard. He shouted, using the technique that Fona had shown to him. Ice spikes suddenly burst from the snow, ripping through and freezing anyone they touched. It made it super effect thanks to the amount of snow that already covered the land, making it the perfect environment for Haku to fight in as he could use any of the snow as a weapon. The entire battalion of snow ninja had been wiped out in a matter of seconds thanks to Kimimaro and Haku's teamwork, leaving none of them left alive. Come on let's get back to Kaga and Koyoki, Kimimaro said with a smile. Haku nodded before they were both taken by surprise. Not so fast kid. Ice style dragon vs tiger. Rga suddenly shouted as he used his jutsu from a safe distance, aiming it right at Kimimaro, taking him off guard. 
the jutsu hit Kimimaro head on and smashed into the ground before trapping him in a large pillar of ice. Kimimaro! Haku shouted as he watched, too slow to do anything. That's one down, one to go. Rga shouted as he landed next to Haku and slashed at him with his dagger. He had already seen Kimimaro's abilities up close and knew that his chakra armor was weak against Teijutsu, meaning if he took him out first his chance of victory was almost certain. Haku was quick though and was able to duck under the first attack before he blocked the second with his own Senban needle, holding Riga in a clash between the two of them. You're strong for a runt. Riga said as he tried to push Haku back. But Haku held him place as he matched his strength. I don't have time to mess about with this guy. Haku thought as he grit his teeth in anger, knowing Kimimaro wouldn't have long being trapped in that ice. Ice style, 1000 needles of death. Haku suddenly shouted as he made the hand signs with just one hand. Riga's eyes burst open in surprise before he quickly broke the exchange between them as he tried to get clear. However, Haku had already used the snow by his feet to freeze him in place, trapping him as he was hit at full force by the ice needles over and over again. When did he? He shouted as he covered his face with his arms. Luckily for Riga though, his chakra armor was able to hold up and the ice needles smashed into the barrier around him. Haha. <laughs> I don't think so, kid. Riga shouted as he smashed the ice around his feet and jumped into the air, slapping a spinning back kick into Haku's shocked face, landing a direct blow as he sent him crashing into the ground. So you're a Yuki member hey? Riga said as he looked down at Haku connecting the dots, knowing he could control ice freely, being capable of incredible feats in such an environment. I'll kill you quickly. Riga then shouted as he raised his dagger, preparing to kill Haku with it before he could use any more jutsu. Haku didn't have time to move or defend himself as he had been taken off guard by Riga's chakra armor and being hit by the strong kick. Haku's world slowed down as he watched Riga cock his arm back ready to kill him, knowing there was nothing he could do to defend himself in this moment. As he did, just one thought kept playing through his mind over and over again. Fona-sensei would be disappointed. Suddenly the ice that Kimimaro had been trapped in exploded, sending large chunks of ice flying through the air as both Riga and Haku were forced to turn their attention to what was going on. W what in the? Riga shouted as he turned to see what had happened and what he was now faced with. Meanwhile, both Kaga and Koyoki were fighting wave after wave of snow ninja as they still chased them, not giving up on capturing them anytime soon either from the looks of it. Kaga sensei, I don't see Haku or Kimimaro. Koyoki shouted as she dodged more ice kunao. Don't worry about them right now Koyoki, we have to focus on getting Lord Sande out of here first. Kaga shouted as he threw a handful of shuriken to counter more ice kunao that were headed for them. Also what happened to Lord Satsua and the princess? He asked as they continued to run through the forest. Kakashi of the Hidden Leaf took them both while we held off the enemy sensei, I think they made it out, Koyoki said. Kaga sighed as he nodded. No worries, as long as they are safe, I'm sure we can sort something out once we make it out of this mess. But for now, let's focus on keeping Lord Sande alive. Kaga said as he suddenly grabbed a kunao out of midair, not a hair's length away from Sande's face before he strapped a paper bomb around it and threw it back towards the enemy with amazing skill. Lord Sande couldn't believe how things had turned out, but now was no time to act like a coward, even though kunao were raining down upon them. Roger that. Koyoki shouted as she followed her sensei's example, doing her best to duck and dive as they continued to run. Ice style, black dragon. A voice suddenly said from in front of them. Watch out! Kaga shouted as he pushed Koyoki out of the way, also tossing Sande with her. A massive black dragon made of ice crashed into Kaga, smashing into the ground before it dragged him away and finally slapped him against a tree where he was trapped in a layer of ice around his entire body, leaving his head free. The force of the blow had left him unconscious as his head dropped, but he was still alive for the time being. Koyoki turned to look who had used the jutsu as they slowly walked into the moonlight, revealing their new assailant. Dot. Sande muttered under his breath as he finally walked into the light, revealing his large black set of armor that covered his entire body. Sande! Did you really think I would let you escape? He said with an evil grin that reflected from the full moon's glow, leaving Koyoki and Lord Sande in a world of trouble. Chapter 70, Chapter 70 What in the hell is that? Riga suddenly shouted as the shock waves knocked him back, giving Haku enough time to avoid his finishing blow. Both Riga and Haku stared at Kimimaro watching as his body was covered in a ferious red chakra. Haku smiled and quickly jumped back into the air as he threw a handful of senban needles at Rukai, 
taking advantage of the confusion to get clear of him. Urga blocked the projectiles but was quickly forced to deal with Kimimaro, as he charged head-on at him like a wild animal, not wasting another moment. Kimimaro looked like a monster as his features had become wild. His body was covered in bones and he roared like a mindless beast, slashing toward Urga with nothing but rage. This must be the tailed beast chakra cloak that Sensei told us about. Haku thought as he watched Kimimaro from above, holding his position in the trees and staying out of the way. Kimimaro slashed and clawed at Roga, who was having a difficult time defending himself, being forced back on the defensive as Kimimaro's taijutsu proved to be overwhelming. Shit, I can't get away. He said as he tried to jump back into the air to get clear of the monster he was faced with, blocking another attack that snapped his sword. However, Kimimaro was too quick, already showing a massive increase in his strength and now his speed. Har. Kimimaro roared as he opened his hand, cocking it back all the way preparing for a powerful swipe. Roga could see Kimimaro's hand turn to solid bone, his fingers becoming as sharp as a kitchen knife, being unable to move as they swung right at him. I can't get out of the way. Kimimaro's attack hit dead center, forcing Roga's chakra armor to shift into overdrive as it tried to protect him from the attack. And oh oh oh. He yelled as his armor broke from the force of the attack, sparking with electricity as it overloaded. Kimimaro's claws cut deep into his body, each of them ripping through his flesh like butter. Roga dropped to his knees as he choked on his own blood, watching as his last moments fell upon him in a dull fashion. Defeated. Kimimaro was too lost in his rage and didn't allow him any time to process what was going on, instead, he delivered one final swipe of his hand, cutting Roga's head clean off of his shoulders, letting his blood soak the snow below. Haku had watched the whole thing and was amazed at how much stronger Kimimaro was with the aid of this chakra cloak. In fact, it almost made him feel jealous because Fiona had picked Kimimaro over him. Kimimaro slowly calmed down and the red chakra that enveloped his body started to fade. Haku could sense it was safe to come out and dropped from the trees. Are you okay, Kimimaro? He asked, waiting for a response. Kimimaro took his time to answer, slowly turning his head to Haku and giving him a nod. Yet. I'm okay Haku. He said. You made that look easy, Haku said as he crossed his arms. Kimimaro nodded. That was the power of the three tails that Sensei sealed inside of me. I've. I've never felt anything like it. He said as he inspected his hand, slowly making a fist and squeezing. Haku nodded. It was pretty amazing. He then said, remembering that Kimimaro would have died if Fona had not sealed the three tails inside of his body, feeling bad for being jealous. Kimimaro nodded, shifting his attention back to the mission. We had better catch up with Kaga-sensei and Koyoki, I have a bad feeling. He said. Haku agreed, giving him a quick nod before they both shifted into gear and dashed off. Meanwhile. Dodo stood atop a hill in the snow with his arms crossed over his body, facing Koyoki and Sandeu. Kaga-sensei. Koyoki shouted, seeing he had been struck by the black ice dragon and frozen to a tree unconscious. It's no use little girl, he is the first to fall and he won't be the last. Dodo shouted as he started to make hand signs, letting his chakra flare to life. You need to get out of here. It's not safe. Koyoki shouted to Sandeu as he raised her kunau, not sure what was going to happen. I, I can't leave you behind. Sandeu said, knowing he couldn't be of any use, but feeling like he couldn't abandon her. Now die. I style black dragon jutsu. Dodo shouted, unleashing another huge black ice dragon towards both of them. Move. Koyoki shouted as she grabbed Sandeu, trying to pull him out of the way with her. The ice dragon hit the trees and exploded, freezing everything in its path with incredible power. Stay here. Koyoki said as she placed him down on a tree branch, jumping into the air and making her own hand signs. Fire style, fireball jutsu. She shouted as she shot a ball of fire towards Dodo. Do you really think that will work? Dodo shouted with a sinister smile. And wind style, violent whirlwind. She then added, making more hand signs in quick succession and using a wind style jutsu. Dodo watched as her fire style and wind style combined, creating an even more powerful combo jutsu, trapping him in a vortex of fire. Pitiful girl. This level of jutsu will never touch me. He shouted as he let his chakra armor burst to life, negating her jutsu with ease as he waved his arm walking out of the fire unharmed. Koyoki watched in horror, wrapping an explosive tag around a kunau in a latch-notch effort. Even my wind and fire combo can't touch him. 
she thought, getting into a low stance as she prepared her next attack. Time to end this, Dodo said as he made a few hand signs, using his chakra to mold the snow and ice around him. Ice style, 1000 shurkenjutsu. He said, pumping a large amount of chakra into his attack and creating what looked like an almost infinite amount of ice shuriken. Koyoki didn't even know what she was supposed to do, feeling helpless at the onslaught that was to come. It's no use. She said, dropping her kunao as she fell to her knees. Sensei. I'm sorry. Haku. Kimimaro. I. I'm sorry. She muttered under her breath as a tear came to her eye. Father. I'm sorry. She finally said, letting the tears flow. Die. Dodo shouted as he let his jutsu fly, firing the 1000 ice shuriken, letting them tear through the cold air ready to shred her to ribbons. Koyoki looked up, watching death flying towards her, taking what she thought to be her last breath of cold air, feeling her lungs burn one last time. However, the ice shuriken that were flying towards her slowly stopped right before her, floating in the air in front of her face. WH what? She said not believing it. Dodo was also shocked to see that his jutsu had simply stopped mid-air. What's going on here? He said, confused. Well, that was certainly a close call. A voice that needed no introduction said, walking from behind Koyoki before he placed a hand on her shoulder. Koyoki looked up in disbelief at her savior, almost lost for words. Lore, Lord Mizu Cage. She blurted out, feeling embarrassed, thankful, confused, happy, and sad all at the same time. Everything is all right now, Koyoki, Fona said as he helped her to her feet, giving her a reassuring smile. Dodo was shocked to see Fona standing next to Koyoki simply ignoring him as if he didn't matter. So even the Mizu Cage greets our land with his presence. Dodo shouted getting his attention. Why don't you get back to cover for a little while, Ekoyoki, Fona said before turning to face Dodo. Well, when my students are in danger I guess I have no choice. He said, picking one of the ice shuriken out of the air to inspect it. You, the Mizu Cage dare to attack me, Lord Dodo of the Land of Snow. This is an act of war no less. Dodo shouted, bringing the politics into it. Fiona sighed before he let go of the shuriken letting it float back into the air with the others. I guess our only course of action is to kill you and let the princess take her rightful place on the throne then. He said, crossing his arms over his chest. Dodo bit his lip as his rage boiled. You insolent. Mizu cage or not. You can die like all the others. He roared as he placed his hands together, activating his chakra armor trying to get the ice shuriken to move. However, it was no use and they remained still in the air floating as if held by a string. So that's the chakra armor I have heard so much about, Fona said with a keen eye. Dodo was almost out of breath he was trying so hard to get his jutsu to obey his orders. What in the blazes is going on? He suddenly blurted out as he was forced to stop and take a breath, red in the face. Hmm. I'm afraid your false ice style attacks won't work on me. Fona said, smiling as he said it. Dodo was confused but he quickly realized what was happening as Fiona waved his hand. Allow me to show you the true power of an ice style user. Suddenly all of Dodo's ice style shuriken changed directed and flew towards him. Arg! He shouted as he raised his hands to defend himself from the 1000 ice shuriken of his own creation. His chakra armor indeed did its job in protecting him as the ice shuriken hit the barrier it provided, smashing off of it and turning into snow on impact. It's no use. My chakra armor is unbeatable. Dodo boasted. His eyes suddenly widened though as a kunao hit the ground by his feet, the very same one Koyoki had dropped into the snow with the explosive tag on it, causing Dodo's eyes to widen. The kunao exploded causing smoke to fill the air and snow to burst all over. Dodo jumped out of the smoke seeming unharmed as he landed on a tree branch, turning to face the Mizu cage. Why you? Ice style black dragon. Dodo shouted. Fiona watched as the ice dragon roared to life before it charged head on at him. Really? What did I just say? Fiona said as he extended his arm, creating an ice mirror to absorb the attack. Have a taste of your own jutsu. He then said, letting the ice dragon shoot out of his mirror, heading right for Dodo. Dodo couldn't believe his eyes as his own jutsu was rebuilt and now heading towards him. What trickery is this? He yelled, doing his best to raise his guard and defend the oncoming attack. The ice dragon smashed into Dodo, 
exploding against his chakra armor with the force sending him flying back where he slammed against a tree. I think that's enough of this, don't you? Fona said, appearing next to Dodo and placing a hand on his shoulder. Dodo almost jumped out of his skin, quickly slapping his hand away and moving to get some distance. I don't think so. Triple Ice Dragon. He shouted, making the hand signs before he fired three black ice dragons at Fona, leaving him with nowhere to go. I'm already tired of this. Fona said, this time letting his chakra burst to life as he seemingly disappeared he moved so fast. Where did he go? Dodo shouted as he watched his ice dragon smash into the ground where he had been stood. Dodo was suddenly struck in the face, knocking him across the snow with force. Dodo was surprised and flipped back, hopping up to his feet again. Show yourself. He shouted, enraged beyond anything he has felt before. Fiona appeared in front of Dodo with blinding speed and cut all the steps that held his churka armor to his body. It's over for you. He then said as he parried Dodo's heart with a bone blade, infused with his own ice style. Dodo took a step back as the pain washed over his body, unable to even moan as he felt his body freezing from the jutsu. Kerr, curse you. Dodo muttered as his body froze, crumbling and breaking apart as it fell into the snow, becoming one with the land of snow itself. Fona sighed in relief. It's over. He then said, turning to look at Koyoki. Fona then turned his attention to Kaga, who was still frozen to a tree. Quickly he vanished and reappeared next to him, placing a hand on the ice and melting it with his chakra. Koyoki couldn't even keep track of his movements, still amazed he had shown up to save her. Is that who I think it is? Sandeu asked, not believing how easily he had dealt with Dodo. That's Lord Mizukage all right, Koyoki replied, admiring him as she did. Fona put Kaga down next to Koyoki and Sandeu, looking to Sandeu with a smile. Lord Sandeu, I believe. He said, extending his greetings. Lord Mizukage. Sandeu replied with a slight bow of his head. Please, call me Fona. He said with a smile. Fona then stood up turning his attention behind him. Right on time. He said. Haku and Kimimaro couldn't believe their eyes as their sense came into view. It is, it really is Fona Sensei. They both shouted, charging towards him overjoyed. Sensei. You're here. They both said charging over to him. Now, now boys. Let's keep it professional. Fona said with a smile as he placed his hands on their heads, giving them praise. I'd say that this mission is finally complete. Fona then said, getting a nod from the others as the sunlight shone from over the trees with the morning sunrise. Chapter 71, Chapter 71 With Dodo now dead and the land of snow free from its a dictatorship. The hidden leaf and hidden mist had worked together to help Princess Koyoki reclaim her rightful place on the throne. Kaga had also made a full recovery, with only his pride being hurt. Haku, Koyoki and Kimimaro had also made it out unscathed proving themselves on a difficult mission and earning some well-deserved time off. Fona had done more than his part to ensure Princess Koyoki was placed back into power, even offering Shinobi to help support her claim to power, something that had not gone unnoticed by the Hidden Leaf Higher UPS. It had made things more difficult due to the princess being taken back to the Land of Fire by Kakashi, but he had made do, having Sandeu on his side helping things massively. All was well in the world for now, and the Hidden Mist was beginning to thrive for the first time in a long time under his leadership which no one now questioned. Thanks to the Hidden Mist and Hidden Leaf cooperating with the Land of Snow incident. The Hokage had offered Fona an invitation to join the Chunin exams this year around, hoping he could finally meet the new Mizu Cage who he had heard so much about. Although the elders and advisors had disagreed, saying that Fona should turn down his invitation, that it could be a trap. Nevertheless, Fona had accepted the Hokage's invitation, thinking it would be a great idea for his village's genin to take part in a mixed village chunin exam to gain more experience. Now the hidden leaf, hidden grass, hidden rain, hidden waterfall and now the hidden mist would be taking part in the exam, meaning all sorts of young shinobi would be taking part. Fona was excited, wondering what kind of exams they would use and if it would be similar to the manga and anime. He had already placed three teams who were ready this time around for the exam. Of course, the first was Team Kaga consisting of Haku, Kimimaro, and Koyoki. The next was a team of genin that consisted of one Kyujura Hashigaki. This is a fan character for Logan Lewis, a big shout out for his support of my work. He was a member of the Hashigaki clan and one to watch out for. His team consisted of another member of the Hazuki clan and another genin who had scored highly on the exams. 
Finally was another team of Miss Jenin who were from no clans, but had good potential and were ready for the exam. Fona was also looking forwards to seeing the Hidden Leaf Village for himself, as well as meeting the third Hokage in person, this time when he wasn't trying to kill him, he thought as he chuckled to himself. A few months had passed now and Fona had allowed Haku and Kimimaro to rest, while also spending time with Mei and Swiren and his two children. His son who had been named Shitoyuki was Mei's son. He was a broad baby with black hair that had small hits of red in it. His eyes were ice blue like Fona's and he always smiled once he picked him up. Swiren's daughter, who had been named Asami Yuki, had blonde hair just like her mother, but blue eyes like her father, although her hair was starting to grow a little darker as she got older. She also bore the Kagaya markings on her forehead and around her eyes. Both of them were now crawling around and proving to be difficult to manage as they could somehow move faster than Fona could track, which was strange considering how quick he could move. My, my Fona, you might be able to teleport between your ice mirrors, but you can't keep track of your own children, May said laughing as she watched him chase the two of them around the living room. I've got you now. Fona said as he cornered a Sammy, getting a nervous giggle from her as she tried to get away from her father, crawling at the speed of a moving bullet towards the wall. Fona grabbed her and lifted her into the air, letting her little legs dangle as she kicked and screamed in joy. Got you. Fona cheered, getting a laugh from her. Suddenly the child sneezed and two bones shot out of her back and hit the wall behind her, outridding everyone. Everyone was shocked as they looked at the small bones stuck in the brick, turning to look back at the baby who was still giggling as if she found it funny. My goodness what happened? Swiren said as she ran over to take a look. Fona was very surprised and handed her to Swiren. It would seem she has inherited my Shikatsumayaku ability, Fona said looking a little concerned. But she's so young. May added, thinking it strange that should would display her abilities at only eight months of age. I'll have to keep an eye on her, it's a dangerous ability after all, Fona said, turning to look at Shito who was sitting down with a smile as he played with some blocks. I'll be keeping an eye on both of them as they grow. He then thought, wondering about the abilities each of them could have. Not only did Fona have to worry about the abilities his children might have gained from him, he also had to worry about Kaimimaro's training as a new Jinchuriki. He had heard about what happened during his battle against Riga of the Hidden Snow. Hopefully, the three tails would be kinder than most and be willing to help him as second head for himself. The boys had been given a small amount of time off to relax away from missions, but Fona had still had then keep up their basic training, something he didn't have to enforce all too much as they both wanted to continue to grow stronger. Haku had even been asking for him to show him some new jutsu, edger to improve so he could keep up with Kimimaro. The days were passing fast and soon the day of the Chunin exams would be upon them. Fona had summoned the three squads who he would be sending to his office, wanting to give them a final brief before he sent them off. Kaga, stood with Haku, Kimimaro, and Koyoki in the middle. To the left was a jonin by the name of Tobato, a young jonin but an experienced one, who he had trusted to look after both a Hashigaki and Hazuki clan member speaking in no way little of his ability as a shinobi. Next was a female jonin, by the name of Tammy. She was like most old-school mist ninja, being a little older than Fona and someone he had worked with on missions before. Her team consisted of the three jonin who had scored some of the highest points in the academy, and Fona was excited to see how they would fare in the exams to come. Welcome all, Fona said as the others all bowed showing their respect. I hope you are all excited as you already know you have been selected to attend the Chunin exams in the Hidden Leaf. However, please remember you will be representing the Hidden Mist, as well as myself. Therefore I want you all to do your best. Fona said as he sat down in his seat. And please try not to cause any trouble, Fona said looking at all of them with a serious glare before smiling again. Everyone gulped but nodded. Yes sir. All right, I won't take up any more of your time. Make sure you prepare your mind and body for what is to come, and you will do fine. Good luck. Fona then said, allowing all of them to leave feeling excited. He had already briefed the Jonin instructors on the instructions he had been given by the Hokage on their accommodation and rules of the village. Meaning he shouldn't have to worry as long as they kept an eye on the students they would be fine. All that was left now was to assemble his own escort of Anbu, he was only allowed to bring two bodyguards with him, not that he felt like he needed them, however it would be good experience for them too. Now it was time to head to the Hidden Leaf himself, where he would finally meet the Hokage in person, something he was both excited and a little nervous about at the same time. We are ready sir. A voice said from behind. Fona nodded as he turned on his chair to look at the two Anbu he had chosen for the job. All right, 
it's time to head out then. Chapter 72, Chapter 72 All right, Kagetsu, and Kaya. It's time to move out. Fona said, standing from his seat and pulling his cloak on. Kagetsu pulled his Anbu mask off and nodded. Yes sir. Kagetsu was a member of the Hazuki clan and had proved his strength and loyalty in the overthrowing of the 4th Mizu cage, having been promoted to Funa as personnel guard after. Yes sir. Kaya also said, removing her mask like Kagetsu. Kaya was a member of Funa as Anbu and had served in the battle against the Rakage and his men when they captured the Three Tails. Proving she could hold her own even against such mighty foes. She had long purple hair and pretty features. Of course, she had the pointed teeth like most mist ninja but she had proved her strength and Fona felt she was right for the mission. The door opened and both A and Ganri entered his office, bowing their head to him before they spoke. Everything is in order Lord Mizu Cage, A said. Good. I leave the village in your care while I'm away. If anything happens, remember the plan. Fona said, giving him a nod. A also nodded. I still wish I could accompany you. He said as he crossed his arms. Fona nodded. I don't think that would go down very well Ao. Since you have one of their by Akugan and all. Fona said. Ao nodded. You're right, I can't see that going down well either. All right then, we had better get moving, it's a long trip to the Hidden Leaf after all. Fona then said, looking to Kagetsu and Kaya. Both of his Anbu nodded and followed him out of his office, being stopped by Ao, while Fona made his way out to the village. Make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. A said to both of them before they left. Kagetsu rubbed TBS back of his head giving a nervous smile. I don't think I could stop him even if I wanted to. He said. A slapped his own face as he sighed. You know what I mean. Kagetsu and Kaya both nodded anyway, saying they would do their best. Fona walked through the village as everyone came to see him off, wishing their Mizu cage farewell and good luck, shouting and screaming his name in applause. He had well and truly become the most loved Mizu cage in history having provided something that none other had been able to. Stability. I promise, I won't be away for long. He said giving everyone a wave as he stopped at the gates. Kagetsu and Kaya were also stood by his side, donning their Anbu masks with their faces hidden. Fona turned to face the outside of the village, pulling his Mizu cage hat on as he did. Time to move out. He said as he created an ice mirror in front of him. Follow me. He then said to his Anbu guards, looking back at them. Kagetsu was used to this now, but Kaya was seeing it up close for the first time. Fona and the others slipped out of the ice mirror into a forest that overlooked the ocean. They had traveled a full day's walk and sail across the ocean in a mere second. Th that's amazing. Kaya said not be living it as she looked over the ocean. You have no idea, Kagetsu thought with a smile from behind his mask. Well come on you two, aren't you supposed to be guarding me? Fona said already walking off from them down the path into the forest. Both of them almost jumped out of their skin as they quickly ran after him, shouting at him as they did. Wait for us Lord Mizu Cage. With that Fona and the others headed into the forest and towards the hidden leaf, walking at a steady pace. It wasn't too far now, being only a few hours away thanks to Fona's ice mirrors. To be honest, this was pretty much the closest he had ever come to the hidden leaf, the last time being when the Mizu Cage had sent him to try and capture the Nine Tails, i.e., Naruto. And we all remember how that one played out. Suddenly a group of men made their way out of the bushes and onto the road. Fona and the others had of course known they were there the whole time, but had sensed no threat from them whatsoever. Hey get a load of these guys. A man said as he appeared in the middle of the road, blocking the way. Ten more suddenly surrounded Fona and his Anbu, blocking their path as the so-called leader spoke. Look, we don't want to hurt you but if you don't give us all of your worldly possessions, well then we might have to break you. He said, seeming sincere at the very least. Fona couldn't quite believe it. Here he was, wearing his Mizu cage hat and everything, and a group of lowy bandits was trying to threaten him. Well, I guess there is a first for everything. He thought. You insolent fool. How dare you even stand in our presence? Kaya shouted as she stepped forwards. Please sir. Give me the order and I will kill them all. She said, turning to Funa for permission. Now, now, Kaya. Calm down. They don't know any better. Funa said, almost impressed that they even had the balls to do what they were doing. My lord, please allow us to remove this scum from your path, 
Kagetsu said as he gripped the handle of his sword. No, no. Please let me handle this. Fona said as he stepped forwards, tilting his hat over his face with his fingers. The bandits seemed confident, seeing that they outnumbered them so much. However, one of them noticed his hat, knowing he had seen that symbol somewhere before. Hey guys, hold on a minute. He suddenly said as the penny dropped. That hat. Isn't that one of those cage hats? He said, getting the others to take a closer look at it. Everyone these suddenly started to panic, unsure of what to do as they realized they had just threatened the Mizu cage. So the penny finally drops, Fona said, chuckling to himself. My lord, please. Allow me to kill them for showing you such disrespect. Kaya said again, keen to please and becoming more and more pissed off. PP please. Sir, have mercy, we didn't know. The bandits shouted as they dropped to their knees, fearing for their lives as they bowed their heads. Fona raised his hand for Kaya to stop as she started to draw her sword. Do you really mean that, or is it simply because I am stronger than you, Fona said. No. No, we just. We're despite is all. The leader stuttered. Fona could see the poor clothing and gear that these men had, quite sure he wasn't lying. But still, if he did nothing, it would spread word that the Mizu cage was soft. Hmm. What to do, what to do? Fona said as he took his time to think. Suddenly a storm of shuriken hit the bandits one by one, with shuriken even hitting each other to change their trajectory midair. Fona was impressed, to say the least as the bandits all dropped to the ground dead, each having been hit in a vital spot. Look out my lord. Kagetsu said, jumping in front of Fona and drawing his sword to defend him. Kaya did the same, each of them scouring the trees to find the one responsible. Relax you two, it's all right, Fona said as a smile came to his face, already knowing what was happening. Mk. Kagetsu and Kaya did as they were told and slowly put their swords away, watching as two hidden lead Anbia dropped from the trees into sight. Welcome, Lord Mizu Cage. The small one said, bowing his head ever so slight. Fiona looked the boy up and down, taking in his features. Even with his face covered, there was no mistaking those eyes. Itaki Uchiha. Fona thought, finally coming face to face with the legend himself. Chapter 73, Chapter 73 Fona was now face to face with one of the strongest members of the Uchiha clan, someone who was well beyond his years and cared for his village above all else, even if he was still just a kid at this moment, he was still a dangerous opponent. Itaki Uchiha, Fona said, looking just below his eyes, not making contact with them. Itaka couldn't hide his surprise as Fona said his name, even behind his Anbu mask. Fona then turned to the other Anbu, recognizing him too as he came into view. And Kakashi Hotaki. It's a pleaser to meet you under better circumstances this time. Fona said smiling at him. Kakashi bowed his head ever so slightly, also remembering the last time they had met, not being surprised he recognized him. I take it Lord Hokage sent you to escort me towards the village. He then said, confirming his thoughts. Correct sir, Itaka said, eyeing Fona carefully, trying to get a good read on him. Kagetsu and Kaya were confused about how Fona knew so much about the two Anbu standing before them, but they had learned to stop asking these kinds of questions and just go with it. Well, please lead the way. Fona then said, breaking the short silence that had followed between them. Both Kakashi and Itaka nodded, following his lead as they both turned for him to follow them. Please. This way, Kakashi said. Kaya didn't like the look of them and kept her guard up, with her hand still on her sword, her eyes locking with Kakashi's. Relax Kaya. Play nice. Fona said as he placed a hand on her shoulder. Kaya bit her lip but agreed with him nevertheless. Yes sir. Besides. Neither of you are a match for this pair. He then thought to himself, knowing Itaki and Kakashi were stronger than Kagetsuo and Kaya by far, especially with their sharing gone. The group now headed towards the hidden lead, with the rest of the trip being mostly silent. However, that was more due to Kakashi not knowing what to say, and Itaka not wanting to give anything away, already being cautious of Fona. He had thought about perhaps cracking a joke about the last time they had battled, but he decided against it, not feeling his audience would take it well. Soon though the leaf village came into view and Fona knew that the awkwardness would soon be at an end. Here we are. Fona then said, taking the sight of the village in. It certainly is a peaceful place. He thought as he watched the tree leaves dance in the wind, with the everyday activities of the villagers going about. 
This is your first time here, yes? Kakashi asked, almost making sure he had never been in before, knowing how strong he was. It is, Fona said, smiling at the sight. It's even more surreal than I could have imagined. He then thought. Of course, he had memories of what the Leaf Village looked like from pictures and the anime, but to see it in person was on a different level. Is everything all right sir? Kagetsuo asked, seeing that Fona had zoned out for a moment. Yes. Let's get going. Fona said, quickly snapping out of his daydream. Kakashi and Ataka continued to lead Fona and the others into the village and towards the Hokage's mansion, doing their best to keep Pit of sight. They soon came to the large red building, overlooking the stone faces of the previous Hokage, that watched over the village. He took a good look, seeing the faces of some of the most powerful shinobi caved into this mountain hoping one day he would meet them. Please this way, Kakashi said as he opened a secret door for them to enter through. Fona had guessed it was for quick passage and also to avoid any attention from those inside the building, used only by Anbu and high-level Jonan. Fona and the others followed Kakashi inside, while Ataki remained at the rear, keeping his eyes on Fona. Kakashi soon stopped as they arrived at a door. Here we are. He then said as he slowly opened it for him. Kakashi stepped out into the room, bowing his head before he announced Fona's arrival. Lord Hokage. The Mizu cage had arrived. He said, moving to the side for Fona. Fona entered the Hokage's office, taking a quick look around before his eyes fell onto the third Hokage himself. Ah yes. Thank you, Kakashi. He said as he stood to his feet. He wore his standard Hokage robes, hat included as he took a quick poof of his pipe, getting up and walking towards Fona. Welcome Lord Mizu Cage. He said giving Fona a nod. Please, it's a pleasure to meet you in person again, Lord Hokage. Fona said, giving him a large smile. The Hokage raised an eyebrow in question. Again? He asked confused. You wouldn't remember, as the last time I was but a child amidst a battlefield. I still remember how your power turned the tide of battle that day. Fona said as he placed his hands on his hips. The Hokage sighed with a small chuckle, finding it amusing that he would say such a thing. Ah yes. Well, I guess that was a long time ago. And for you to have survived and become a cage yourself, it certainly speaks for your ability. After all, I too know of your accomplishments on the battlefield. He said, looking Fona up and down. Please, you flatter me too much Lord Hokage, Fona said as his eyes locked with the Hokages, neither of them backing down. The room went silent for a moment and Fona could feel the tension coming from everyone. Suddenly both the Hokage and Fona burst out laughing. The others looked at them strangely before feeling the tension in the room disappear. I'm glad you accepted my invitation Lord Mizu Cage. The Hokage said as his laughter settled. Fona nodded. Me too, I'm glad you thought to send one. I believe it will do our young good to experience what it's like to battle and compete against other nations. The Hokage nodded. I see we are on the same page Lord Mizu Cage. I have to say, I did try with your predecessor. However, we could never see eye to eye. He said seeming a little sad about it. I was surprised to hear about his passing. The Hokage said, giving Fona a strange look. Yes. It was not a decision made easily. But it was necessary for our nation. In fact, that is something I would like to talk about. In private if you would allow. Fona said getting another questioning look from the Hokage as he took his pipe in his hand. Very well. He said after a moment of pause. But sir, Kakashi said, voicing his worry and speaking out of place. It's fine Kakashi. If Lord Mizu Cage has something to talk to me about in private then I trust him. The Hokage said. Kakashi wasn't impressed but did as the Hokage said, lowering his head as he and Ataka walked out of the room. You too, Fona said looking at Kagetsuo and Kaya. They both did as they were told, not wasting any time as they followed Ataki out of the room, going to wait in the hallway as instructed. Kaya shut the door behind her, taking one last look at Fona before fully closing it. Thank you, Fona said, not sure if the Hokage would have done as he asked. So what is it you wished to talk about Lord Mizu Cage? The Hokage then asked, taking a seat as he offered for Fona to sit also. T. The Hokage then asked as he poured himself some. Fona nodded before he sat back. Why thank you? He said before looking the Hokage in the eyes. I wanted to talk to you about who was controlling the fourth Mizu cage. As well as the one who was responsible for the Nine Tails attack and the death of the fourth Hokage. 
Fona then said, getting a very serious glare from the Hokage. Chapter 74, Chapter 74 The Hokage gave Fona a very serious look as he put his pipe back into his mouth. That is top secret information, and a very serious subject, Lord Mizu Cage. He said, taking a puff on his pipe. I understand that, but I can assure you. You will want to hear this. Fona said before he took a sip of his tea. Meanwhile, Haku, Kimimaro, and Koihoki were currently on board a ship that was sailing them towards the Land of Fire. They had been invited to attend the Chunin exams in the Hidden Leaf Village, having set off from the village hidden in the mist after getting prepared. The three of them were excited, to say the least, wondering what kind of tests they would be faced with. Kaga was sat with his arms crossed over his chest, watching his students as he chewed on a piece of tobacco, watching as their nerves seemed at ease. These three should have no problem with these exams. I can't think of any other genin who have experienced as much as the three of them in the whole village. He thought, remembering each of their accomplishments and strengths on each mission they had faced together. No matter what we face, we won't fail, Kimimaro said, standing with the others as they looked over towards the land of fire that was slowly coming into view. Haku and Koihoki also nodded, feeling confident with his words. All right you three, get some rest. Kaga said as he stood to his feet. We still have a long journey to the Leaf Village, and you will have plenty of time for theatrics later. Haku and the others turned and nodded to their sensei, each of them taking a seat, trying their best to relax their mind. We won't let you down, Fona sensei. Haku thought as he looked over the sea one last time before he finally sat down with the others. You can't be serious. He's dead. The Hokage said, almost speechless at the information Fona had just given him. Obito Uchiha. The third Hokage said, still not believing it. But why would he target the Nine Tails and kill his own sensei no less? The Hokage asked. Fona remained silent. Deciding to let the Hokage use his mind to work things out a little. And Madara Uchiha you say? He can still be alive. After all these years. He was killed by the first Hokage himself. He said almost seeming angry and worried at the same time. I know this information might seem disturbing, but we have reason to believe it was Obito who was controlling the fourth Mizu cage. In fact, I can confirm it was him, as I fought him myself. Fona then said. The third Hokage sighed, seeming troubled at the news. And you're saying that it was Obito that caused the Nine Tails to attack the village and kill Minato? I am, Fona confirmed. The fourth Hokage did indeed leave me information before he died, believing the attacker to indeed be Mardara but I never thought it to be true. The Hokage said, interlocking his fingers as he became lost in thought. Why tell me this? Why do you come to me with such information? The Hokage then asked, wondering why Fona would do such a thing. Fona had to think about that himself. Could he really trust the Hokage to keep this information secret? Or would Denzo steal the show and use this information to his own gain? Could he prevent a war? Start an entirely different one? he would have to have a very serious think about what path would be best to follow. Fona also had to ask himself where he wanted this to go. He couldn't solve the Hidden Leaf's problems all alone. Was it even something he wanted to do? So much was still meant to happen that would set the chains of future in motion, with the next thing being the slaughter of the Uchiha clan. He would have to choose his next words carefully, knowing what had to be done having thought about it. I tell you this is an offer of friendship between our nations. He said with a slight pause. Too long have our nations been at war, hating and taking petty gains all at the cost of their citizens' lives. I believe that we should cast aside our differences and join forces. Perhaps that way we can create a world that contains less hatred. Fon said, leaving the Hokage with almost a speechless expression. Are you suggesting what I think you are suggesting, Lord Mizu Cage? The Hokage said after a moment to think about his words. I am, Lord Hokage, Fona said placing his teacup down. I am offering an alliance between the mist and the leaf. What say you, Lord Hokage? Do you accept my offer? Fona then said as he crossed his legs. The third Hokage had a serious expression on his face for a moment, taking his pipe as he struck a match, lighting it and taking a large puff. Fona Yuki. The ice devil of the mist. The cage killer and perfect Jinjuriki. Not only did you achieve great renown at a young age, but you also killed the fourth Kazakage. Then going on to overthrow your own Mizu cage, who you had swore to serve. The third said, clearly having done his homework on Fona. 
how can I trust someone who has killed two cage that I knew quite well I might add. He then said looking into Fona's eyes as he weighed him up. I second that. A voice said coming from the back of the room, one that Fona recognized. Dan's so? What are you doing here? The Hokage said, not happy at his sudden appearance. Fona had a bad feeling about this, but had decided he would wait and see what Danzo had to say. Don't be a fool Hiruzen. We cannot trust a word the Mizu cage says. He could be feeding you false information in order to infiltrate the village. He said as he came and stood next to the Hokage, using his walking cane. The Hokage didn't look impressed and crossed his arms. Danzo, what are you doing here? This is a private meeting between myself and the Mizu cage, who is a guest here at my request I might add. He said with a serious voice. To have already killed two cage, one of which was his own in order to overthrow him no less. Danzo said, glaring at Fona as he said it. Fona had to admit, when all of it was put like that, it sounded pretty bad. I understand your concern over my endeavors. And I understand how it looks, killing the former Mizu cage was not something I wanted to do. Fona said as he slowly stood to his feet, looking into Danzo's eyes. However. I have achieved more than any Mizu cage has ever done for my village and its people. Going above and beyond to make the village hidden in the mist, as well as the land of water, thrive. He said before he turned to look back at the Hokage. I understand your hesitation about considering my offer. So I am prepared to wait for a response. Fona said, sitting back down as he crossed his legs. Why you? Danzo started. That is enough Danzo. The Hokage shouted, causing him to go silent. I am the Hokage and this is my village. I decide what is right and what is within the best interest for it and my people. Not you. He said, glaring at Danzo. Danzo clenched his teeth in anger but held his tongue. You're a fool Hiruzen. You always have been. He said before he slowly turned and left the room. I accept your offer Lord Mizu Cage. In fact, I welcome it. The Hokage said as he turned to look at Fona, standing to his feet and extending his hand. Fona also stood to his feet, taking the Hokage's hand and shaking it in his own as the two of them sealed the offer with a handshake. Two great nations becoming allies. I never thought I would see the day. The Hokage said. It may prove difficult at first, with so much bloodshed in our past. However, with the two of us steering the ship, I believe we can overcome any hiccups we may encounter along the way. I agree. And with the Chunin exams not far away. It will prove a great start to our village's cooperation. The Hokage said. To peace. Fona then said. Yes, to peace. The Hokage then also said. Fona let go of his hand and took a small step back. I will have to head back to my village to begin the preparation. However, I will be back in time to watch how the exams play out. Fona said. Of course, I will do the same. Besides. There are now matters that will need attending to. The Hokage said, taking another puff on his pipe as he thought about what to do next. I believe it would be best if we keep this information to ourselves for now. Perhaps waiting for Obito to make a move would be our best bet in finding him. Fona said. The Hokage agreed, knowing the troubles it would cause, not only for his village but certain individuals too. Yes, I agree. All right. It has been a pleasure Lord Hokage, thank you for the tea and your time. Fona said, giving him a slight bow. The Hokage nodded his head also, in a sign of respect, before he gave the signal for Kakashi and the others to enter the room. The door opened and the four of them walked into the room, blowing their heads as they did. All right you two, we are going back to the village, Fuma said to Kagetsu and Kaya. They nodded, surprised that he had dealt with business so quickly. Be seeing you soon. Fona then said to everyone, summoning an ice mirror as he did. The Hokage looked a little surprised as he stepped inside, disappearing before both Kagetsu and Kaya did the same, watching as the ice melted and dispersed into the air. Itaka was also surprised seeing that he had completely disappeared. Kakashi on the other hand had seen this before. Sir, is everything all right? Kakashi asked, looking to the Hokage as he seemed a little tense. The third looked at Kakashi, knowing how much the news that Obito was alive would hurt him. Everything is fine Kakashi. But there is work to be done. He said, taking his pipe out of his mouth and smiling. What work is that sir? Kakashi asked. Peace between the leaf and the mist. The Hokage said. Chapter 75, 
Chapter 75 Now that negotiations with the Hokage were over, Fona had returned to the Hidden Mist to start things on his end. He didn't waste time in summoning the village elders and higher-ranking officials, including the daimyo and other lords. The meeting would take place later that day. Thanks to Fona's ice mirrors he could have everyone in the meeting as fast as they could get ready. Fona had already told Ao and Mei, who had reported to his office once informed of his arrival back in the village. Mei had of course given him an earful about him returning without telling anyone. She was, however, pleased with the idea of an alliance with the Leaf, with Ao being less so. I'm not disagreeing with you Funa, I just don't trust those Leaf Ninja, especially those Uchiha, and that Danzo. Ao said as he crossed his arms. I understand we have a long and bloody history with Kanaha. But this alliance is the start of a better change for our village. Fona said, doing his best to convince him. Ao couldn't see how, considering how well the village was already doing under Fona's watch. Still, he had never led them astray so far, and Ao owed his loyalty to him, never questioning him about the choices he made, even if they did seem strange at the time. Sometimes he swore that Fona could see further into the future than he could see with his Byakugan, always doing the strangest things that ended up resulting in great outcomes. Soon enough the rest of the elders and higher UPS of the village arrived, taking their seats in the meeting hall inside the Mizu Cage's mansion. All but the daimyo had arrived, and everyone awaited his arrival patiently, chatting amongst themselves as they waited with Fona, who sat at the head of one end of the table. Soon enough an ice mirror formed, signaling the daimyo had activated Fona's seal and was ready to enter. Everyone stood to their feet getting ready for his arrival, showing the proper respect. However, they were quickly surprised as a young woman walked through the ice mirror. She was dressed in a fine kimono, with her blonde hair tied up professionally, standing tall and proud. Princess Mizuko. Fona thought as he watched her walk through his ice mirror, not having seen her for a few years now. Mizuko made eye contact with Fona and smiled at him as she took his appearance in. Greetings Lord Mizu Cage. She said as she gave a slight bow, locking her eyes with his. Good to see you again Princess, Fona said, returning her bow. My father sends his regards, however, he is feeling a little under the weather and asked me to come in his stead. I hope that is all right. She said, not taking her eyes off Fona, something may noticed as she cocked an eyebrow at her. That's not a problem princess, I trust your judgment in our nation's matters, Fona said as he looked to everyone else, making sure no one had a problem with that. He then offered her a seat down at the head of the other side of the table, where her father would have been seated. Now that everyone is here we can begin. Fona then said as he leaned on the table, interlocking his fingers. I would now like to inform you about a recent meeting that I had with the Hokage of the Hidden Leaf. He said, getting the attention of everyone. We have both agreed that it would be in the best interest of both of our villages to enter a peace treaty, and by extension an alliance, Fona said, waiting to see the reaction of the others. It took a moment before anyone spoke up, the first being one of the elders of the village. The leaf cannot be trusted. How could you agree to such a thing before consulting us? He said. Fona had expected this kind of reaction from some of them and was prepared to let them voice their concerns to him. Others slowly started to pipe up some agreeing with the elder while others defended Fona's actions. Ao and Mei who were also present for the meeting both grew angry with the petty squabbling and Mei were about to speak up, however, someone beat her to it. Please tell me, elders. When was the last time you achieved anything for this village, or our nation? The princess said, causing everyone to fall silent. The elder slumped back into his seat, deciding to shut his mouth as he had no augment to lean on. I thought not. The princess then said. Lord Mizu Cage has the full backing of my father in the land of water. If he thinks this is the right thing to do, then who are any of you, who have not been able to accomplish anything close to what Fona has in only a few short years? Who are you to stand against him? She said, looking everyone in the eyes as she dared anyone to disagree with her. Fona smiled at her words and stood to his feet getting everyone's attention. Thank you, Princess Mizuko. As Mizu Cage I must protect the village and its people. Everything I do is in regards to that duty. I ask you to trust my decision at this time, and of course, I ask for your loyalty. Everyone nodded, knowing they couldn't disagree with his track record of strange decisions having paid off, speaking for itself. I know our history with the leaf is not tremendous. However, this will open up a new age of peace between the two of our nations. It is time to put the bloodshed behind us, and look to the future. Everyone agreed, 
remaining silent before the princess too stood from her seat. It's settled then. I shall inform my father of your actions and leave the rest in your capable hands. She said, giving him a smirk. Thank you, princess, and please give your father my regards, Fona said before he summoned an ice mirror for her. Princess Mizuko nodded and made her exit, leaving them alone before the ice mirror faded. Does anyone else have anything to say? Ao added, making sure there was nothing else. Nobody spoke up and Ao was happy to bring the meeting to an official close. Very well, that concludes the end of this meeting. He then said for the official end time of the meeting to be noted. Fona thanked everyone for their time, knowing that not everyone was happy with his decision. He only hoped that it was his track record that kept their confidence in him, and not his power. Although needed, he didn't want to rule through fear like the other Mizu cage before him. Soon enough everyone left, leaving Ao and Mei alone with Fona. I'm glad that is over with. Fona said as he turned to Ao and Mei, breathing a sigh of relief. Mei suddenly walked up to Fona and pinched his ear, squeezing hard. What the hell Mei? He said as he felt the pain explode through his face. And when did you become all friendly with the princess? She said as she let go, placing her hands on her hips. Fona gave a nervous laugh as he tried to defend himself. Wait it's not like that Mei. He said waving his arms around. Ao could have slapped himself in the face as he watched the pair acting like children before him. If you two are done. He said as he cleared his throat, getting their attention. We should take the necessary steps to put this new agreement with the leaf in place. He then said. May nodded, turning professional once more as she turned to face him. Fona rubbed the back of his head laughing a little before he too got serious again. Yes Ao you're right. I'll leave that to you though. He then said, getting a surprised look from both of them. I have some things I need to keep an eye on at the moment. Can I leave the details for you to oversee? Fona asked as he turned to Mei and then Ao. Mei couldn't stay mad at him when he looked at her with his puppy dog baby blue eyes. What on earth could be more important? Mei asked, giving in to his request. That's a secret. Fona then said giving her a wink. Mei sighed as she gave in. Fine but at least go and see the babies before you disappear on another of your adventures. Fona laughed before he stepped closer to her, kissing her. Don't worry May, I'll stay out of trouble. He said holding her. May nodded back to him, smiling as she hugged him before she let him go. I hope so. She said before she watched him slip into an ice mirror. Ao remained silent with his arms crossed before he turned to May. We had better get started, this could pose quite a lot of paperwork for us. He then said, getting an angry vein to appear above Mai's head. That man. I swear I'll make him pay when he comes back. Thanks for listening.